Preface of Parochial and Plain Sermons, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Russ Hobbs. Parochial and Plain Sermons, Volume 1, by John Henry Newman. Preface. The sermons here be published were written and preached at various periods between the years 1825 and 1843. The first six volumes are reprinted from the six volumes of parochial sermons. The seventh and eighth formed the fifth volume of plain sermons by contributors to the tracts for the times, which was the contribution of its author to that series. All the sermons are reprinted from the last editions of the several volumes published from time to time by the Messrs. Rivington. They made in their day, partly through their publication, but yet more probably, through their living effect upon those who heard them, a deep and lasting impression for good on the communion for whose especial benefit they were designed. They exercised an extensive influence very far beyond it, and their republication will awaken in many minds vivid and grateful recollections of their first appearance. They met at that time very real and great moral, intellectual, and spiritual needs of man, in giving depth and precision and largeness to his belief and apprehension of the mysteries of God, and seriousness and accuracy to his study and knowledge of himself of his own nature, with its manifold powers, capacities, and responsibilities, and of his whole relation to the supernatural and unseen. They found a response in the hearts and minds and consciences of those to whom they were addressed, in marvelous proportion to the affectionate and stirring earnestness with which their author appealed to the conscience or dormant sense of their needs, and his zealous and energetic endeavors under God's blessing to show in every variety of light how the grand central verities of the Christian dispensation, entrusted as the good deposit to the church, were revealed and adapted to supply them. Many things indeed contained in these volumes have become, from the very readiness of their first acceptance, and from their gradual reception into the current of religious thought, so familiar that it requires some retrospect of the time previous to their appearance to appreciate the original freshness with which they brought out the fundamental articles of the Christian faith, and their bearing on the formation of the Christian character, and to understand the degree in which they have acted, like leaven, on the mind and language and literature of the Church in this country and have marked an era in her history. But besides their relation to the past, it will be seen in their republication how the spirit which dictated them pierced here and there through the cloud which hung over the future, and how the author warned us, with somewhat a prophetic forecast, of impending trials and conflicts and of perplexities and dangers then only dimly seen or unheeded, of which it has been reserved to the present generation to witness the nearer approach. It might seem to have been his calling at once to warn us of them, and to provide as best he might words of guidance and support and consolation and encouragement unto them, an anchor of the soul in the coming storm. They are republished in the fervent hope and belief that like good to that which by God's blessing they have done before, they may by his mercy, if we be not unworthy of it, do yet again under other circumstances. To many of this generation they will appear in much of their original freshness, and to all with the greater power and reality, from the saddening aspect of the times, and the appalling prospects before us, replete as they are with those many secrets of religion which are not perceived till they be felt, and are not felt but in the day of great calamity. In conclusion, it is right, 
though scarcely necessary to observe, that the republication of these sermons by the editor is not to be considered as equivalent to a reassertion by their author of all that they contain, inasmuch as, being printed entire and unaltered, except in the most insignificant particulars, they cannot be free from passages which he certainly now would wish were otherwise, or would, one may be sure, desire to see altered or omitted. But the alternative plainly lies between publishing all or nothing, and it appears more to the glory of God and for the cause of religion to publish all than to destroy the acceptableness of the volumes to those for whom they were written by any omissions and alterations. W. J. Copeland Farnham Rectory, Essex May fifteenth, 1868 End of Preface Sermon 1 of Parochial and Plain Sermons, Volume 1, by John Henry Newman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Sermon 1. Holiness Necessary for Future Blessedness Holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Hebrews 12.14 In this text, it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit to convey a chief truth of religion in a few words. It is this circumstance which makes it especially impressive, for the truth itself is declared in one form or another in every part of Scripture. It is told us again and again that to make sinful creatures holy was the great end which our Lord had in view in taking upon him our nature, and thus none but the holy will be accepted for his sake at the last day. The whole history of redemption, the covenant of mercy in all its parts and provisions, attests the necessity of holiness in order to salvation, as indeed even our natural conscience bears witness also. But in the text, what is elsewhere implied in history and enjoined by precept, is stated doctrinally as a momentous and necessary fact, the result of some awful, irreversible law in the nature of things, and the inscrutable determination of the divine will. Now some one may ask, why is it that holiness is a necessary qualification for our being received into heaven? Why is it that the Bible enjoins upon us so strictly to love fear and obey God, to be just, honest, meek, pure in heart, forgiving, heavenly-minded, self-denying, humble, and resigned. Man is confessedly weak and corrupt. Why then is he enjoined to be so religious, so unearthly? Why is he required, in the strong language of Scripture, to become a new creature? Since he is by nature what he is, would it not be an act of greater mercy in God to save him altogether without this holiness, which it is so difficult, yet, as it appears so necessary, for him to possess? Now we have no right to ask this question. Surely it is quite enough for a sinner to know that a way has been opened through God's grace for his salvation without being informed why that way, and not another way, was chosen by divine wisdom. Eternal life is the gift of God. Undoubtedly, he may prescribe the terms on which he will give it, and if he has determined holiness to be the way of life, it is enough. It is not for us to inquire why he has so determined. Yet the question may be asked reverently, and with a view to enlarge our insight into our own condition and prospects. And in that case, the attempt to answer it will be profitable, if it be made soberly. I proceed, therefore, to state one of the reasons assigned in Scripture why present holiness is necessary, as the text declares to us, for future happiness. To be holy is, in our Church's words, to have the true circumcision of the Spirit, that is, 
to be separate from sin, to hate the works of the world, the flesh, and the devil, to take pleasure in keeping God's commandments, to do things as he would have us do them, to live habitually, as in the sight of the world to come, as if we had broken the ties with this life, and were dead already. Why cannot we be saved without possessing such a frame and temper of mind? I answer as follows, that even supposing a man of unholy life were suffered to enter heaven, he would not be happy there, so that it would be no mercy to permit him to enter. We are apt to deceive ourselves and to consider heaven a place like this earth, I mean a place where everyone may choose and take his own pleasure. We see that in this world active men have their own enjoyments, and domestic men have theirs. Men of literature, of science, of political talent have their respective pursuits and pleasures. Hence we are led to act as if it will be the same in another world. The only difference we put between this world and the next is that here, as we well know, men are not always sure, but there we suppose they will always be sure of obtaining what they seek after. And accordingly we conclude that any man, whatever his habits, tastes, or manner of life, if once admitted into heaven, would be happy there. Not that we altogether deny that some preparation is necessary for the next world, but we do not estimate its real extent and importance. We think we can reconcile ourselves to God when we will, as if nothing were required in the case of men in general, but some temporary attention, more than ordinary to our religious duties, some strictness during our last sickness, in the services of the church, as men of business arrange their letters and papers on taking a journey or balancing an account. But an opinion like this, though commonly acted on, is refuted as soon as put into words. For heaven, it is plain from Scripture, is not a place where many different and discordant pursuits can be carried on at once, as is the case in this world. Here every man can do his own pleasure, but there he must do God's pleasure. It would be presumption to attempt to determine the employments of that eternal life which good men are to pass in God's presence, or to deny that that state which I hath not seen, nor ear heard, nor mind conceived, may comprise an infinite variety of pursuits and occupations. Still, so far we are distinctly told that that life will be spent in God's presence, in a sense which does not apply to our present life, so that it may be best described as an endless and uninterrupted worship of the Eternal Father, Son, and Spirit. They serve him day and night in his temple, and he that sitteth on the throne shall dwell among them. The Lamb which is in the midst of the throne shall feed them, and shall lead them into living fountains of waters. Again, the city had no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. These passages from St. John are sufficient to remind us of many others. Heaven, then, is not like this world. I will say what it is much more like a church. For in a place of public worship no language of this world is heard. There are no schemes brought forward for temporal objects, great or small. No information how to strengthen our worldly interests extend our influence, or establish our credit. These things indeed may be right in their way, so that we do not set our hearts upon them. Still, I repeat, it is certain that we hear nothing of them in a church. Here we hear solely and entirely of God. 
We praise him, worship him, sing to him, thank him, confess to him, give ourselves up to him, and ask his blessing. And therefore, a church is like heaven. That is, because both in the one and the other, there is one single sovereign subject, religion, brought before us. Supposing, then, instead of it being said that no irreligious man could serve and attend on God in heaven, or see him, as the text expresses it, we were told that no irreligious man could worship or spiritually see him in church. Should we not at once perceive the meaning of the doctrine? That is, that were a man to come hither, who had suffered his mind to grow up in its own way, as nature or chance determined, without any deliberate habitual effort after truth and purity, he would find no real pleasure here, but would soon get weary of the place, because in this house of God he would hear only of that one subject, which he cared little or nothing about, and nothing at all of those things which excited his hopes and fears, his sympathies and energies. If then a man without religion, supposing it possible, were admitted into heaven, doubtless he would sustain a great disappointment. Before, indeed, he fancied that he could be happy there, but when he arrived there he would find no discourse but that which he had shunned on earth, no pursuits but those he had disliked or despised, nothing which bound him to aught else in the universe and made him feel at home, nothing which he could enter into and rest upon. He would perceive himself to be an isolated being, cut away by supreme power from those objects which were still entwined around his heart. Nay, he would be in the presence of that supreme power, whom he never on earth could bring himself steadily to think upon, and whom now he regarded as only the destroyer of all that was precious and dear to him. Ah, he could not bear the face of the living God. The holy God would be no object of joy to him. Let us alone. What are we to do with thee? Is the sole thought and desire of unclean souls, even while they acknowledge his majesty. None but the holy can look upon the holy one. Without holiness, no man can endure to see the Lord. When then we think to take part in the joys of heaven without holiness, we are as inconsiderate as if we supposed we could take an interest in the worship of Christians here below without possessing it in our measure. A careless, a sensual, and unbelieving mind a mind destitute of the love and fear of God with narrow views and earthly aims, a low standard of duty and a benighted conscience, a mind contented with itself and unresigned to God's will, would feel as little pleasure at the last day at the words, Enter into the joy of thy Lord, as it does now at the words, Let us pray nay, much less, because while we are in a church, we may turn our thoughts to other subjects and contrive to forget that God is looking on us, but that will not be possible in heaven. We see, then, that holiness, or inward separation from the world, is necessary to our admission into heaven, because heaven is not heaven, is not a place of happiness, except to the holy. There are bodily indispositions which affect the taste, so that the sweetest flavors become ungrateful to the palate, and indispositions which impair the sight, tinging the fair face of nature with some sickly hue. In like manner, there is a moral malady which disorders the inward sight and taste, and no man laboring under it is in a condition to enjoy what Scripture calls the fullness of joy in God's presence and pleasures at his right hand forevermore. Nay, I will venture to say more than this. 
it is fearful, but it is right to say it, that if we wished to imagine a punishment for an unholy reprobate soul, we perhaps could not fancy a greater than to summon it to heaven. Heaven would be hell to an irreligious man. We know how unhappy we are apt to feel at present when alone in the midst of strangers, or of men of different tastes and habits from ourselves. How miserable, for example, would it be to have to live in a foreign land, among a people whose faces we never saw before, and whose language we could not learn. And this is but a faint illustration of the loneliness of a man of earthly dispositions and tastes, thrust into the society of saints and angels. How forlorn would he wander through the courts of heaven! He would find no one like himself. He would see in every direction the marks of God's holiness, and these would make him shudder. He would feel himself always in his presence. He could no longer turn his thoughts another way, as he does now, when conscience reproaches him. He would know that the eternal eye was ever upon him, and that eye of holiness, which is joy and life to holy creatures, would seem to him an eye of wrath and punishment. God cannot change his nature. Holy he must ever be. But while he is holy, no unholy soul can be happy in heaven. Fire does not inflame iron, but it inflames straw. It would cease to be fire if it did not. And so heaven itself would be fire to those who would fain escape across the great gulf from the torments of hell. The finger of Lazarus would but increase their thirst. The very heaven that is over their head will be brass to them. And now I have partly explained why it is that holiness is prescribed to us as the condition of our part for our admission into heaven. It seems to be necessary from the very nature of things. We do not see how it could be otherwise. Now then I will mention two important truths which seem to follow from what has been said. 1. If a certain character of mind, a certain state of the heart and affections, be necessary for entering heaven, our actions will avail for our salvation, chiefly as they tend to produce or evidence this frame of mind. Good works, as they are called, are required not as if they had anything of merit in them, not as if they could themselves turn away God's anger for our sins or purchase heaven for us, but because they are the means under God's grace of strengthening and showing forth that holy principle which God implants in the heart, and without which, as the text tells us, we cannot see him. The more numerous are our acts of charity, self-denial and forbearance, of course the more will our minds be schooled into a charitable, self-denying and forbearing temper. The more frequent are our prayers, the more humble, patient and religious are our daily deeds. This communion with God, these holy works, will be the means of making our hearts holy and of preparing us for the future presence of God. Outward acts done on principle create inward habits. I repeat, the separate acts of obedience to the will of God, good works as they are called, are of service to us, as gradually severing us from this world of sins and impressing our hearts with a heavenly character. It is plain, then, that works are not of service to our salvation, all those which either have no effect upon the heart to change it, or which have a bad effect. What then must be said of those who think it an easy thing to please God, and to recommend themselves to Him, who do a few scanty services, call these the walk of faith, and are satisfied with them? 
such men it is too evident instead of being themselves profited by their acts such as they are of benevolence honesty or justice may be i might even say injured by them for these very acts even though good in themselves are made to foster in these persons a bad spirit a corrupt state of heart that is self-love self-conceit self-reliance instead of tending to turn them from this world to the father of spirits in like manner the mere outward acts of coming to church and saying prayers which are of course duties imperative upon all of us are really serviceable to those only who do them in a heavenward spirit because such men only use these good deeds to the improvement of the heart whereas even the most exact outward devotion avails not a man if it does not improve it two but observe what follows from this if holiness be not merely the doing of a certain number of good actions but is an inward character which follows under god's grace from doing them how far distant from that holiness are the multitude of men they are not yet even obedient in outward deeds which is the first step towards possessing it they have even to learn to practice good works as the means of changing their hearts which is the end it follows at once even though scripture did not plainly tell us so that no one is able to prepare himself for heaven that is make himself holy in a short time at least we do not see how it is possible and this viewed merely as a deduction of the reason is a serious thought yet alas as there are persons who think to be saved by a few scanty performances so there are others who suppose they may be saved all at once by a sudden and easily acquired faith most men who are living in neglect of god silence their consciences when troublesome with the promise of repenting some future day how often are they thus led on till death surprises them but we will suppose they do begin to repent when that future day comes nay we will even suppose that almighty god were to forgive them and to admit them into his holy heaven well but is nothing more requisite are they in a fit state to do him service in heaven is not this the very point i have been so insisting on that they are not in a fit state has it not been shown that even if admitted there without a change of heart they would find no pleasure in heaven and is a change of heart wrought in a day which of our tastes or likings can we change at our will in a moment not the most superficial can we then at a word change the whole frame and character of our minds is not holiness the result of many patient repeated efforts after obedience gradually working on us and first modifying and then changing our hearts we dare not of course set bounds to god's mercy and power in cases of repentance late in life even where he has revealed to us the general rule of his moral governance yet surely it is our duty ever to keep steadily before us and to act upon those general truths which his holy word has declared his holy word in various ways warns us that as no one will find happiness in heaven who is not holy so no one can learn to be so in a short time and when he will it implies it in the text which names a qualification which we know in matter of fact does ordinarily take time to gain it propounds it clearly though in figure in the parable of the wedding garment in which inward sanctification is made a condition distinct from our acceptance of the proffer of mercy and not negligently to be passed over in our thoughts as if a necessary consequence of it 
and in that of the ten virgins, which shows us that we must meet the bridegroom with the oil of holiness, and that it takes time to procure it. And it solemnly assures us in St. Paul's epistles that it is possible so to presume on divine grace as to let slip the accepted time and be sealed even before the end of life to a reprobate mind. I wish to speak to you, my brethren, not as if aliens from God's mercies, but as partakers of his gracious covenant in Christ, and for this reason in a special peril, since those only can incur the sin of making void his covenant, who have the privilege of it. Yet neither, on the other hand, do I speak to you as willful and obstinate sinners, exposed to the immediate risk of forfeiting, or the chance of having forfeited, your hope of heaven. But I fear there are those who, if they dealt faithfully with their consciences, would be obliged to own that they had not made the service of God their first and great concern, that their obedience, so to call it, has been a matter of course, in which the heart has had no part, that they have acted uprightly in worldly matters chiefly for the sake of their worldly interest. I fear there are those who, whatever their sense of religion, still have such misgivings about themselves as lead them to make resolve to obey God more exactly some future day, such misgivings as convict them of sin, though not enough to bring home to them its heinousness or its peril. Such men are trifling with the appointed season of mercy. To obtain the gift of holiness is the work of a life. No man will ever be perfect here, so sinful is our nature. Thus in putting off the day of repentance these men are reserving for a few chance years, when strength and vigor are gone, that work for which a whole life would not be enough. That work is great and arduous beyond expression. There is much of sin remaining even in the best of men, and if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Their doom may be fixed any moment, and though this thought should not make a man despair today, yet it should ever make him tremble for tomorrow. Perhaps, however, others may say, We know something of the power of religion. We love it in a measure. We have many right thoughts. We come to church to pray. This is a proof that we are prepared for heaven. We are safe, and what has been said does not apply to us. But be not you, my brethren, in the number of these. One principal test of our being true servants of God is our wishing to serve him better. And be quite sure that a man who is contented with his own proficiency in Christian holiness is at best in a dark state, or rather in great peril. If we are really imbued with the grace of holiness, we shall abhor sin as something base, irrational, and polluting. Many men, it is true, are contented with partial and indistinct views of religion and mixed motives. Be you content with nothing short of perfection. Exert yourselves day by day to grow in knowledge and grace, that, if so be, you may at length attain to the presence of Almighty God. Lastly, while we thus labor to mold our hearts after the pattern of the holiness of our Heavenly Father, it is our comfort to know, what I have already implied, that we are not left to ourselves, but that the Holy Ghost is graciously present with us, and enables us to triumph over and to change our own minds. It is a comfort and encouragement, while it is an anxious and awful thing to know that God works in and through us. We are the instruments, but we are only the instruments of our own salvation. Let no one say that I discourage him and propose to him a task beyond his strength, 
All of us have the gifts of grace pledged to us from our youth up. We know this well, but we do not use our privilege. We form mean ideas of the difficulty, and in consequence never enter into the greatness of the gifts given us to meet it. Then afterwards, if perchance we gain a deeper insight into the work we have to do, we think God a hard master who commands much from a sinful race. Narrow indeed is the way of life, but infinite is his love and power who is with the church in Christ's place to guide us along it. End of Sermon 1「Sermon Two of Parochial and Plain Sermons, Volume One, by John Henry Newman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Sermon Two: The Immortality of the Soul. What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Matthew sixteen twenty six. I suppose there is no tolerably informed Christian but considers he has a correct notion of the difference between our religion and the paganism which it supplanted. Everyone, if asked what it is we have gained by the gospel, will promptly answer that we have gained the knowledge of our immortality, of our having souls which will live forever, that the heathen did not know this, but that Christ taught it, and that his disciples know it. Everyone will say, and say truly, that this was the great and solemn doctrine which gave the gospel a claim to be heard when first preached, which arrested the thoughtless multitudes, who were busied in the pleasures and pursuits of this life, awed them with the vision of the life to come, and sobered them till they turned to God with a true heart. It will be said, and said truly, that this doctrine of a future life was the doctrine which broke the power and the fascination of paganism. The poor benighted heathen were engaged in all the frivolities and absurdities of a false ritual, which had obscured the light of nature. They knew God, but they forsook him for the inventions of men. They made protectors and guardians for themselves, and had God's many and Lord's many. They had their profane worship, their gaudy processions, their indulgent creed, their easy observances, their sensual festivities, their childish extravagances, such as might suitably be the religion of beings who were to live for seventy or eighty years, and then die once for all, never to live again. Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die, was their doctrine and their rule of life. Tomorrow we die. This the holy apostles admitted. They taught so far as the heathen, Tomorrow we die. But then they added, And after death the judgment. Judgment upon the eternal soul, which lives in spite of the death of the body. And this was the truth, which awakened men to the necessity of having a better and deeper religion than that which had spread over the earth. When Christ came, which so wrought upon them that they left that old false worship of theirs, and it fell. Yes, though throned in all the power of the world, a sight such as I had never before seen, though supported by the great and the many, the magnificence of kings and the stubbornness of people, it fell. Its ruins remain scattered over the face of the earth, the shattered works of its great upholder, that fierce enemy of God, the pagan Roman Empire. Those ruins are found even among themselves, and show how marvelously great was its power, and therefore how much more powerful was that which broke its power. And this was the doctrine of the immortality of the soul. So entire is the revolution which is produced among men whenever this high truth is really received. I have said that every one of us is able fluently to speak of this doctrine, and is aware that the knowledge of it forms the fundamental difference between our state and that of the heathen. 
And yet, in spite of our being able to speak about it, and our form of knowledge, as St. Paul terms it, there seems scarcely room to doubt that the greater number of those who are called Christians in no true sense realize it in their own minds at all. Indeed, it is a very difficult thing to bring home to us, and to feel that we have souls, and there cannot be a more fatal mistake than to suppose we see what the doctrine means as soon as we can use the words which signify it. So great a thing is it to understand that we have souls, that the knowing it, taken in connection with its results, is all one with being serious, that is, truly religious. To discern our immortality is necessarily connected with fear and trembling and repentance in the case of every Christian. Who is there but would be sobered by the actual sight of the flames of hell-fire, and the souls therein hopelessly enclosed? Would not all his thoughts be drawn to that awful sight, so that he would stand still gazing fixedly upon it, and forgetting everything else, seeing nothing else, hearing nothing, engrossed with the contemplation of it? And when the sight was withdrawn, still having it fixed in his memory, so that he would be henceforth dead to the pleasures and employments of this world, considered in themselves, thinking of them only in their reference to that fearful vision. This would be the overpowering effect of such a disclosure, whether it actually led a man to repentance or not. And thus absorbed in the thought of the life to come are they who really and heartily receive the words of Christ and his apostles. Yet to this state of mind, and therefore to this true knowledge, the multitude of men called Christians are certainly strangers. A thick veil is drawn over their eyes, and in spite of their being able to talk of the doctrine, they are as if they never had heard of it. They go on just as the heathen did of old. They eat, they drink, or they amuse themselves in vanities, and live in the world without fear and without sorrow, just as if God had not declared that their conduct in this life would decide their destiny in the next, just as if they either had no souls, or had nothing or little to do with the saving of them, which was the creed of the heathen. Now let us consider what it is to bring home to ourselves that we have souls, and in what the especial difficulty of it lies. For this may be of use to us in our attempt to realize that awful truth. We are from our birth apparently dependent on things about us. We see and feel that we could not live or go forward without the aid of man. To a child this world is everything. He seems to himself a part of this world, a part of this world in the same sense in which a branch is part of a tree. He has little notion of his own separate and independent existence. That is, he has no just idea. He has a soul. And if he goes through life with his notions unchanged, he has no just notion, even to the end of life, that he has a soul. He views himself merely in his connection with this world, which is his all. He looks to this world for his good as to an idol, and when he tries to look beyond this life, he is able to discern nothing in prospect, because he has no idea of anything, nor can fancy anything but this life. And if he is obliged to fancy something, he fancies this life over again, just as the heathen when they reflected on those traditions of another life which were floating among them, could but fancy the happiness of the blessed to consist in the enjoyment of the sun and the sky and the earth as before, only as if these were to be more splendid than they are now. To understand that we have souls is to feel our separation from things visible, our independence of them, our distinct existence in ourselves, our individuality, 
our power of acting for ourselves this way or that way, our accountableness for what we do. These are the great truths which lie wrapped up indeed even in a child's mind, and which God's grace can unfold there in spite of the influence of the external world. But at first this outward world prevails. We look off from self to the things around us and forget ourselves in them. Such is our state, a depending for support on the reeds which are no stay, and overlooking our real strength, at the time when God begins his process of reclaiming us to a truer view of our place in his great system of providence. And when he visits us, then in a little while there is a stirring within us. The unprofitableness and feebleness of the things of this world are forced upon our minds. They promise, but cannot perform. They disappoint us. Or, if they do perform what they promise, still, so it is, they do not satisfy us. We still crave for something. We do not well know what. But we are sure it is something which the world has not given us. And then its changes are so many, so sudden, so silent, so continual, it never leaves changing, it goes on to change, till we are quite sick at heart. Then it is that our reliance on it is broken. It is plain we cannot continue to depend upon it unless we keep pace with it, and go on changing too, but this we cannot do. We feel that while it changes, we are one and the same, and thus, under God's blessing, we come to have some glimpse of the meaning of our independence of things temporal and our immortality. And should it so happen that misfortunes come upon us, as they often do, then still more are we led to understand the nothingness of this world. Then still more are we led to distrust it, and are weaned from the love of it, till at length it floats before our eyes merely as some idle veil, which, notwithstanding its many tints, cannot hide the view of what is beyond it. And we begin by degrees to perceive that there are but two beings in the whole universe, our own soul and the God who made it. Sublime, unlooked-for doctrine, yet most true, to every one of us there are but two beings in the whole world, himself and God. For as to this outward scene, its pleasures and pursuits, its honors and cares, its contrivances, its personages, its kingdoms, its multitude of busy slaves, what are they to us? Nothing, no more than a show. The world passeth away, and the lust thereof. And as to those others nearer to us who are not to be classed with the vain world, I mean our friends and relations, whom we are right in loving, these too, after all, are nothing to us here. They cannot really help or profit us. We see them, and they act upon us only, as it were, at a distance, through the medium of sense. They cannot get at our souls, they cannot enter into our thoughts, or really be companions to us. In the next world it will, through God's mercy, be otherwise. But here we enjoy not their presence, but the anticipation of what one day shall be, so that, after all, they vanish before the clear vision we have, first, of our own existence, next, of the presence of the great God in us and over us, as our governor and judge, who dwells in us by our conscience, which is his representative. And now consider what a revolution will take place in the mind that is not utterly reprobate, in proportion as it realizes this relation between itself and the Most High God. We never in this life can fully understand what is meant by our living forever, but we can understand what is meant by this world's not living forever, by its dying never to rise again. And learning this, 
we learn that we owe it no service, no allegiance. It has no claim over us and can do us no material good nor harm. On the other hand, the law of God written on our hearts bids us serve him and partly tells us how to serve him, and Scripture completes the precepts which nature began. And both Scripture and conscience tell us we are answerable for what we do, and that God is a righteous judge, and above all our Savior, as our visible Lord God, takes the place of the world as the only begotten of the Father, having shown himself openly, that we may not say that God is hidden. And thus a man is drawn forward by all manner of powerful influences to turn from things temporal to things eternal, to deny himself, to take up his cross and follow Christ. For there are Christ's awful threats and warnings to make him serious, his precepts to attract and elevate him his promises to cheer him, his gracious deeds and sufferings to humble him to the dust, and to bind his heart once and for ever in gratitude to him who is so surpassing in mercy. All these things act upon him, and as truly as St. Matthew rose from the receipt of custom when Christ called, heedless what bystanders would say of him, so they who, through grace, obey the secret voice of God, move onward contrary to the world's way, and careless what mankind may say of them, as understanding that they have souls, which is the one thing they have to care about. I am well aware that there are indiscreet teachers gone forth into the world who use language such as I have used, but mean something very different. Such are they who deny the grace of baptism, and think that a man is converted to God all at once. But I have no need now to mention the difference between their teaching and that of Scripture. Whatever their peculiar errors are, so far as they say that we are by nature blind and sinful, and must through God's grace and our own endeavors learn that we have souls and rise to a new life, severing ourselves from the world that is, and walking by faith in what is unseen and future, so far they say true, for they speak the words of Scripture, which says, Awake, thou that sleepest, and arise from the dead, and Christ shall give thee light. See then that ye walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil, Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. Let us, then, seriously question ourselves, and beg of God graced to do so honestly, whether we are loosened from the world, or whether, living as dependent on it, and not on the eternal author of our being, we are in fact taking our portion with this perishing outward scene, and ignorant of our having souls. I know very well that such thoughts are distasteful to the minds of men in general. Doubtless many a one there is who, on hearing doctrines such as I have been insisting on, says in his heart that religion is thus made gloomy and repulsive, that he would attend to a teacher who spoke in a less severe way, and that, in fact, Christianity was not intended to be a dark, burdensome law, but a religion of cheerfulness and joy. This is what young people think, though they do not express it in this argumentative form. They view a strict life as something offensive and hateful. They turn from the notion of it. And then, as they get older and see more of the world, they learn to defend their opinion and express it more or less in the way in which I have just put it. They hate and oppose the truth, as it were, upon principle, and the more they are told that they have souls, the more resolved they are to live as if they had not souls. But let us take it as a clear point from the first, 
and not to be disputed, that religion must ever be difficult to those who neglect it. All things that we have to learn are difficult at first, and our duties to God and to man for his sake are peculiarly difficult, because they call upon us to take up a new life and quit the love of this world for the next. It cannot be avoided. They must fear and be in sorrow before they can rejoice. The gospel must be a burden before it comforts and brings us peace. No one can have his heart cut away from the natural objects of its love without pain during the process and throbbings afterwards. This is plain from the nature of the case, and, however true it be, that this or that teacher may be harsh and repulsive, yet he cannot materially alter things. Religion is in itself at first a weariness to the worldly mind, and it requires an effort and a self-denial in every one who honestly determines to be religious. But there are other persons who are far more hopeful than those I have been speaking of, who, when they hear repentance and newness of life urged on them, are frightened at the thought of the greatness of the work. They are disheartened at being told to do so much. Now let it be well understood that to realize our own individual accountableness and immortality, of which I have been speaking, is not required of them all at once. I never said a person was not in a hopeful way who did not thus fully discern the world's vanity and the worth of his soul. But a man is truly in a very desperate way who does not wish, who does not try to discern and feel all this. I want a man on the one hand to confess his immortality with his lips, and on the other to live as if he tried to understand his own words, and then he is in the way of salvation. He is in the way towards heaven, even though he has not yet fully emancipated himself from the fetters of this world. Indeed, none of us, of course, are entirely loosened from this world. We all use words in speaking of our duties higher and fuller than we really understand. No one entirely realizes what is meant by his having a soul. Even the best of men is but in a state of progress towards the simple truth, and the most weak and ignorant of those who seek after it cannot but be in progress. And therefore no one need be alarmed at hearing that he has much to do before he arrives at a right view of his own condition in God's sight, that is, at faith. For we all have much to do, and the great point is, are we willing to do it? Oh, that there were such an heart in us to put aside this visible world, to desire to look at it as a mere screen between us and God, and to think of him who has entered in beyond the veil, and who is watching us, trying us, yes, and blessing and influencing and encouraging us towards good day by day. Yet, alas, how do we suffer the mere varying circumstances of every day to sway us? How difficult it is to remain firm and in one mind under the seductions or terrors of the world. We feel variously according to the place, time, and people we are with. We are serious on Sunday, and we sin deliberately on Monday. We rise in the morning with remorse in our offenses and resolutions of amendment, yet before night we have transgressed again. The mere change of society puts us into a new frame of mind, nor do we sufficiently understand this great weakness of ours, or seek for strength where alone it can be found in the unchangeable God. What will be our thoughts in that day, when at length this outward world drops away altogether, and we find ourselves where we ever have been, in his presence, with Christ standing 
at his right hand. On the contrary, what a blessed discovery is it to those who make it that this world is but vanity and without substance, and that really they are ever in their Saviour's presence. This is a thought which it is scarcely right to enlarge upon in a mixed congregation where there may be some who have not given their hearts to God. For why should the privileges of the true Christian be disclosed to mankind at large, and sacred subjects, which are his peculiar treasure, be made common to the careless liver? He knows his blessedness, and needs not another to tell it him. He knows in whom he has believed, and in the hour of danger or trouble he knows what is meant by that peace which Christ did not explain when he gave it to his apostles, but merely said it was not as the world could give. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. Trust ye in the Lord for ever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. End of Sermon 2《ซ e r m o n Three of Parochial and Plain Sermons, Volume One, by John Henry Newman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.《ซ e r m o n Three, Knowledge of God's Will Without Obedience. If ye know these things, happy are ye if ye do them. John thirteen seventeen. There never was a people or an age to which these words could be more suitably addressed than to this country at this time. Because we know more of the way to serve God, of our duties, our privileges, and our reward, than any other people hitherto, as far as we have means of judging. To us, then, especially, our Saviour says, If ye know these things, happy are ye if ye do them. Now, doubtless, many of us think we know this very well. It seems a very trite thing to say that it is nothing to know what is right unless we do it, an old subject about which nothing new can be said. When we read such passages in Scripture, we pass over them as admitting them without dispute, and thus we contrive practically to forget them. Knowledge is nothing compared with doing, but the knowing that knowledge is nothing. We make to be something. We make it count, and thus we cheat ourselves. This we do in parallel cases also. Many a man, instead of learning humility in practice, confesses himself a poor sinner, and next prides himself upon the confession. He ascribes the glory of his redemption to God, and then becomes in a manner proud that he is redeemed. He is proud of his so-called humility. Doubtless Christ spoke no words in vain. The eternal wisdom of God did not utter his voice that we might at once catch up his words in an irreverent manner, think we understand them at a glance, and pass them over. But his word endureth forever. It has a depth of meaning suited to all times and places, and hardly and painfully to be understood in any. They who think they enter into it easily may be quite sure they do not enter into it at all. Now then, let us try, by his grace, to make the text a living word to the benefit of our souls. Our Lord says, if ye know, happy are ye, if ye do. Let us consider how we commonly read Scripture. We read a passage in the Gospels, for instance, a parable, perhaps, or the account of a miracle, or we read a chapter in the Prophets or a Psalm. Who is not struck with the beauty of what he reads? I do not wish to speak of those who read the Bible only now and then, and who will, in consequence, generally find its sacred pages dull, 
and uninteresting, but of those who study it. Who of such persons does not see the beauty of it? For instance, take the passage which introduces the text. Christ had been washing his disciples' feet. He did so at a season of great mental suffering. It was just before he was seized by his enemies to be put to death. The traitor, his familiar friend, was in the room. All of his disciples, even the most devoted of them, loved him much less than they thought they did. In a little while they were all to forsake him and flee. This he foresaw, yet he calmly washed their feet, and then he told them, that he did so by way of an example, that they should be full of lowly services one to the other, as he to them, that he among them was in fact the highest who put himself the lowest. This he had said before, and his disciples must have recollected it. Perhaps they might wonder in their secret hearts why he repeated the lesson. They might say to themselves, We have heard this before. They might be surprised that his significant action, his washing their feet, issued in nothing else but a precept already delivered, the command to be humble. At the same time, they would not be able to deny, or rather, they would deeply feel the beauty of his action. Nay, as loving him, after all, above all things, and reverencing him as their lord and teacher, they would feel an admiration and awe of him. But their minds would not rest sufficiently on the practical direction of the instruction vouchsafed to them. They knew the truth, and they admired it. They did not observe what it was they lacked. Such may be considered their frame of mind, and hence the force of the text delivered primarily against Judas Iscariot, who knew and sinned deliberately against the truth, secondarily referring to all the apostles, and St. Peter chiefly, who promised to be faithful but failed under the trial, lastly to us all, all of us here assembled, who hear the word of life continually, know it, admire it, do all but obey it. Is it not so? Is not Scripture altogether pleasant except in its strictness? Do not we try to persuade ourselves that to feel religiously, to confess our love of religion, and to be able to talk of religion will stand in the place of careful obedience, of that self-denial which is the very substance of true practical religion? Alas! That religion, which is so delightful in a vision, should be so distasteful as a reality. Yet so it is, whether we are aware of the fact or not. 1. The multitude of men, even who profess religion, are in this state of mind. We will take the case of those who are in better circumstances than the mass of the community. They are well educated and taught. They have few distresses in life, or are able to get over them by the variety of their occupations, by the spirits which attend good health, or at least by the lapse of time. They go on respectably and happily, with the same general tastes and habits which they would have had if the gospel had not been given them. They have an eye to what the world thinks of them, are charitable when it is expected, they are polished in their manners, kind from natural disposition or a feeling of propriety. Thus their religion is based upon self and the world, a mere civilization. The same, I say, as it would have been in the main, taking the state of society as they find it, even supposing Christianity were not the religion of the land. But it is, and let us go on to ask, how do they, in consequence, feel towards it? They accept it. They add it to what they are. They engraft it upon the selfish and worldly habits 
of an unrenewed heart. They have been taught to revere it, and to believe it to come from God, so they admire it and accept it as a rule of life, so far forth as it agrees with the carnal principles which govern them. So far as it does not agree, they are blind to its excellence and its claims. They overlook or explain away its precepts. They in no sense obey because it commands. They do right when they would have done right had it not commanded. However, they speak well of it and think they understand it. Sometimes, if I may continue the description, they adopt it into a certain refined elegance of sentiments and manners, and then the irreligion is all that is graceful, fastidious, and luxurious. They love religious poetry and eloquent preaching. They desire to have their feelings roused and soothed, and to secure a variety and relief in that eternal subject which is unchangeable. They tire of its simplicity, and perhaps seek to keep up their interest in it by means of religious narratives, fictitious or embellished, or of news from foreign countries, or of the history of the prospects or successes of the gospel, thus perverting what is in itself good and innocent. This is their state of mind at best, for more commonly they think it enough merely to show some slight regard for the subject of religion, to attend its services on the Lord's Day, and then only once, and coldly to express an approbation of it. But of course every description of such persons can be but general, for the shades of character are so varied and blended in individuals as to make it impossible to give an accurate picture, and often very estimable persons and truly good Christians are partly infected with this bad and earthly spirit. 2. Take again another description of them. They have perhaps turned their attention to the means of promoting the happiness of their fellow creatures, and have formed a system of morality and religion of their own. Then they come to Scripture. They are much struck with the high tone of its precepts, and the beauty of its teaching. It is true they find many things in it which they do not understand or do not approve, many things they would not have said themselves. But they pass these by. They fancy that these do not apply to the present day, which is an easy way of removing anything we do not like. And, on the whole, they receive the Bible, and they think it highly serviceable for the lower classes. Therefore they recommend it and support the institutions which are the channels of teaching it. But as to their own case, it never comes into their minds to apply its precepts seriously to themselves. They know them already, they consider. They know them, and that is enough. But as for doing them, by which I mean going forward to obey them, with an unaffected earnestness, and an honest faith acting upon them, receiving them as they are and not as their own previously formed opinions would have them be, they have nothing of this right spirit. They do not contemplate such a mode of acting, to recommend and effect a moral and decent conduct, on whatever principle, seems to them to be enough. The spread of knowledge bringing in its train a selfish temperance, a selfish peaceableness, a selfish benevolence, the morality of expedience, this satisfies them. They care for none of the truths of Scripture on the ground of their being in Scripture. These scarcely become more valuable in their eyes for being there written. They do not obey because they are told to obey on faith and the need of this divine principle of conduct they do not comprehend. Why will it not answer, they seem to say, to make men good in one way as well as another? Abana and Farpar rivers of Damascus, are they not better than all the waters of Israel? As if, 
all the knowledge and the training that books ever gave had power to unloose one sinner from the bonds of Satan, or to effect more than an outward reformation, an appearance of obedience, as if it were not a far different principle, a principle independent of knowledge, above it and before it, which leads to real obedience, that principle of divine faith, given from above, which has life in itself, and has power really to use knowledge to the soul's welfare, in the hand of which knowledge is, as it were, the torch lighting us on our way, but not teaching or strengthening us to walk. 3. Or take another view of the subject. Is it not one of the most common excuses made by the poor for being irreligious, that they have had no education? as if to know much was a necessary step for right practice. Again, they are apt to think it enough to know and to talk of religion to make a man religious. Why have you come hither today, my brethren? Not as a matter of course, I will hope. Not merely because friends or superiors told you to come. I will suppose you have come to church as a religious act. But beware of supposing that all is done and over by the act of coming. It is not enough to be present here, though many men act as if they forgot they must attend to what is going on as well as come. It is not enough to listen to what is preached, though many think they have gone a great way when they do this. You must pray. Now this is very hard in itself to any one who tries, and this is the reason why so many men prefer the sermon to the prayers, because the former is merely the getting knowledge, and the latter is to do a deed of obedience. You must pray, and this, I say, is very difficult, because our thoughts are so apt to wander. But even this is not all. You must, as you pray, really intend to try to practice what you pray for. When you say, Lead us not into temptation, you must in good earnest mean to avoid in your daily conduct those temptations which you have already suffered from. When you say, Deliver us from evil, you must mean to struggle against that evil in your hearts, which you are conscious of and which you pray to be forgiven. This is difficult. Still more is behind. You must actually carry your good intentions into effect during the week, and in truth and reality war against the world, the flesh, and the devil. And anyone here present who falls short of this, that is, who thinks it enough to come to church to learn God's will, but does not bear in mind to do it in his daily conduct, be he high or be he low, know he mysteries and all knowledge, or be he unlettered and busily occupied in active life, he is a fool in his sight who maketh the wisdom of this world foolishness. Surely he is but a trifler, as substituting a formal outward service for the religion of the heart. And he reverses our Lord's words in the text, Because he knows these things, most unhappy is he, because he does them not. 4. But some one may say, It is so very difficult to serve God. It is so much against my own mind, such an effort such a strain upon my strength to bear Christ's yoke, I must give it over, or I must delay it at least. Can nothing be taken instead? I acknowledge his law to be most holy and true, and the accounts I read about good men are most delightful. I wish I were like them with all my heart, and for a little while I feel in a mind to set about imitating them. I have begun several times, I have had seasons of repentance and set rules to myself, but for some reason or other I fell back after a while, and was even worse than before. I know, but I cannot do. O oh, wretched man that I am! 
Now to such an one I say, You are in a much more promising state than if you were contented with yourself, and thought that knowledge was everything, which is the grievous blindness which I have hitherto been speaking of. That is, you are in a better state, if you do not feel too much comfort or confidence in your confession. For this is the fault of many men. They make such an acknowledgment as I have described a substitute for real repentance, or allow themselves after making it to put off repentance, as if they could be suffered to give a word of promise which did not become due, so to say, for many days. You are, I admit, in a better state than if you were satisfied with yourself, but you are not in a safe state. If you were now to die, you would have no hope of salvation. No hope, that is, if your own showing be true, for I am taking your own words. Go before God's judgment seat and there plead that you know the truth and have not done it. This is what you frankly own. How will it there be taken? Out of thine own mouth will I judge thee, says our judge himself, and who shall reverse his judgment? Therefore such an one must make the confession with great and real terror and shame, if it is to be considered a promising sign for him, else it is mere hardness of heart. For instance, I have heard persons say lightly, every one must have heard them, that they own it would be a wretched thing indeed for them or their companions to be taken off suddenly. The young are especially apt to say this, that is, before they have come to an age to be callous, or have formed excuses to overcome the natural true sense of their conscience. They say they hope some day to repent. This is their own witness against themselves, like that bad prophet at Bethel, who was constrained with his own mouth to utter God's judgments while he sat at his sinful meat. But let not such an one think that he will receive anything of the Lord. He does not speak in faith. When then a man complains of his hardness of heart or weakness of purpose, let him see to it whether this complaint is more than a mere pretense to quiet his conscience, which is frightened at his putting off repentance, or again, more than a mere idle word, said half in jest and half in compunction. But should he be earnest in his complaint, then let him consider he has no need to complain. Everything is plain and easy to the earnest. It is the double-minded who find difficulties. If you hate your own corruption in sincerity and truth, if you are really pierced to the heart that you do not do what you know you should do, if you would love God, if you could, then the gospel speaks to you words of peace and hope. It is a very different thing indolently to say, I would if I were a different man, and to close with God's offer to make you different when it is put before you. Here is the test between earnestness and insincerity. You say you wish to be a different man. Christ takes you at your word, so to speak. He offers to make you different. He says, I will take away from you the heart of stone, the love of this world, and its pleasures, if you will submit to my discipline. Here a man draws back. No, he cannot bear to lose the love of the world, to part with his present desires and tastes. He cannot consent to be changed. After all, he is well satisfied at the bottom of his heart to remain as he is, only he wants his conscience taken out of the way. Did Christ offer to do this for him? If he would but make bitter sweet and sweet bitter, darkness light and light darkness, then he would hail the glad tidings of peace. Till then, he needs him not. But if a man is in earnest in wishing to get at the depths of his own heart, to expel the evil, 
to purify the good and to gain power over himself so as to do as well as to know the truth. What is the difficulty? A matter of time indeed, but not of uncertainty is the recovery of such a man. So simple is the rule which he must follow, and so trite, that at first he will be surprised to hear it. God does great things by plain methods, and men start from them through pride because they are plain. This was the conduct of Naaman the Syrian. Christ says, Watch and pray. Herein lies our cure. To watch and to pray are surely in our power, and by these means we are certain of getting strength. You feel your weakness. You fear to be overcome by temptation. Then keep out of the way of it. This is watching. Avoid society which is likely to mislead you. Flee from the very shadow of evil. You cannot be too careful. Better be a little too strict than a little too easy. It is the safer side. Abstain from reading books which are dangerous to you. Turn from bad thoughts when they arise. Set about some business. Begin conversing with some friend. Or say to yourself the Lord's Prayer reverently. When you are urged by temptation, whether it be by the threats of the world, false shame, self-interest, provoking conduct on the part of another, or the world's sinful pleasures, urged to be cowardly, or covetous, or unforgiving, or sensual, shut your eyes, and think of Christ's precious blood-shedding. Do not dare to say you cannot help sinning. A little attention to these points will go far, through God's grace, to keep you in the right way. And again, pray as well as watch. You must know that you can do nothing of yourself. Your past experience has taught you this. Therefore, look to God for the will and the power. Ask Him earnestly in His Son's name. Seek His holy ordinances. Is not this in your power? Have you not power at least over the limbs of your body so as to attend the means of grace constantly? Have you literally not the power to come hither, to observe the fasts and festivals of the church, to come to his holy altar and receive the bread of life? Get yourself at least to do this, to put out the hand, to take his gracious body and blood. This is no arduous work. And you say you really wish to gain the blessings he offers? What would you have more than a free gift, vouchsafed without money and without price? So make no more excuses. Murmur not about your own bad heart, your knowing and resolving, and not doing. Here is your remedy. Well were it if men could be persuaded to be in earnest, but few are thus minded. The many go on with a double aim, trying to serve both God and mammon. Few can get themselves to do what is right because God tells them. They have another aim. They desire to please self or men. When they can obey God without offending the bad master that rules them, then and then only they obey. Thus religion, instead of being the first thing in their estimation, is but the second. They differ indeed, one from another, what to put foremost. One man loves to be at ease, another to be busy, another to enjoy domestic comfort. But they agree in converting the truth of God, which they know to be truth, into a mere instrument of secular aims, not discarding the truth, but degrading it. When he, the Lord of hosts, comes to shake terribly the earth, what number will he find of the remnant of the true Israel? We live in an educated age. The false gloss of a mere worldly refinement makes us decent and amiable. We all know and profess. We think ourselves wise. We flatter each other, 
We make excuses for ourselves when we are conscious of sin, and thus we gradually lose the consciousness that we are sinning. We think our own times superior to all others. Thou blind Pharisee! This was the fatal charge brought by our blessed Lord against the falsely enlightened teachers of his own day. As then we desire to enter into life, let us come to Christ continually for the two foundations of true Christian faith, humbleness of mind and earnestness. End of Sermon 3《ซ e r m o n 4 of Parochial and Plain Sermons, Volume 1, by John Henry Newman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.《ซ e r m o n 4 Secret Faults Who can understand his errors? Cleanse thou me from secret faults. Psalm 19.12 Strange as it may seem, multitudes called Christians go through life with no effort to obtain a correct knowledge of themselves. They are contented with general and vague impressions concerning their real state, and if they have more than this, it is merely such accidental information about themselves as the events of life force upon them. But exact, systematic knowledge they have none, and do not aim at it. When I say this is strange, I do not mean to imply that to know ourselves is easy. It is very difficult to know ourselves even in part, and so far ignorance of ourselves is not a strange thing. But its strangeness consists in this, that is, that men should profess to receive and act upon the great Christian doctrines, while they are thus ignorant of themselves considering that self-knowledge is a necessary condition for understanding them. Thus, it is not too much to say that all those who neglect the duty of habitual self-examination are using words without meaning. The doctrines of the forgiveness of sins and of the new birth from sin cannot be understood without some right knowledge of the nature of sin, that is, of our own heart. We may indeed assent to a form of words which declares those doctrines, but if such a mere assent, however sincere, is the same as real holding of them and belief in them, then it is equally possible to believe in a proposition the terms of which belong to some foreign language, which is obviously absurd. Yet nothing is more common than for men to think that because they are familiar with words, they understand the ideas they stand for. Educated persons despise this fault in illiterate men who use hard words as if they comprehended them. Yet they themselves, as well as others, fall into the same error in a more subtle form. When they think they understand terms used in morals and religion, because such are common words, and have been used by them all their lives. Now, I repeat, unless we have some just idea of our hearts and of sin, we can have no right idea of a moral governor, a savior, or a sanctifier, that is, in professing to believe in them, we shall be using words without attaching distinct meaning to them. Thus self-knowledge is at the root of all real religious knowledge, and it is in vain, worse than vain, it is a deceit and a mischief, to think to understand the Christian doctrines as a matter of course, merely by being taught by books or by attending sermons, or by any outward means, however excellent, taken by themselves. For it is in proportion, as we search our hearts, and understand our own nature, that we understand what is meant by an infinite governor and judge. 
in proportion as we comprehend the nature of disobedience and our actual sinfulness that we feel what is the blessing of the removal of sin redemption pardon sanctification which otherwise are mere words god speaks to us primarily in our hearts self-knowledge is the key to the precepts and doctrines of scripture the very utmost any outward notices of religion can do is to startle us and make us turn inward and search our hearts and then when we have experienced what it is to read ourselves we shall profit by the doctrines of the church and the bible of course self-knowledge admits of degrees no one perhaps is entirely ignorant of himself and even the most advanced christian knows himself only in part however most men are contented with a slight acquaintance with their hearts and therefore a superficial faith this is the point which it is my purpose to insist upon men are satisfied to have numberless secret faults they do not think about them either as sins or as obstacles to strength of faith and live on as if they had nothing to learn now let us consider attentively the strong presumption that exists that we all have serious secret faults a fact which i believe all are ready to confess in general terms though few like calmly and practically to dwell upon it as i now wish to do one now the most ready method of convincing ourselves of the existence in us of faults unknown to ourselves is to consider how plainly we see the secret faults of others at first sight there is of course no reason for supposing that we differ materially from those around us and if we see sins in them which they do not see it is a presumption that they have their own discoveries about ourselves which it would surprise us to hear for instance how apt is an angry man to fancy that he has the command of himself the very charge of being angry if brought against him will anger him more and in the height of his discomposure he will profess himself able to reason and judge with clearness and impartiality now it may be his turn another day for what we know to witness the same failing in us or if we are not naturally inclined to violent passion still at least we may be subject to other sins equally unknown to ourselves and equally known to him as his anger was to us for example there are persons who act mainly from self-interest at times when they conceive they are doing generous or virtuous actions they give freely or put themselves to trouble and are praised by the world and by themselves as if acting on high principle whereas close observers can detect desire of gain love of applause shame or the mere satisfaction of being busy and active as the principal cause of their good deeds this may be our condition as well as that of others or if it be not still a parallel infirmity the bondage of some other sin or sins which others see and we do not but say there is no human being sees sin in us of which we are not aware ourselves though this is a bold supposition to make yet why should man's accidental knowledge of us limit the extent of our imperfections should all the world speak well of us and good men heal us as brothers after all there is a judge who trieth the hearts and the reins he knows our real state have we earnestly besought him to teach us the knowledge of our own hearts if we have not that very omission is a presumption against us though our praise were throughout the church we may be sure he sees sins without number in us sins deep and heinous of which we have no idea 
If man sees so much evil in human nature, what must God see? If our heart condemn us, God is greater than our heart and knoweth all things. Not acts alone of sin does he set down against us daily, of which we know nothing, but the thoughts of the heart too, the stirrings of pride, vanity, covetousness, impurity, discontent, resentment, these succeed each other through the day in momentary emotions and are known to him. We know them not, but how much does it concern us to know them? 2. This consideration is suggested by the first view of the subject. Now reflect upon the actual disclosures of our hidden weakness, which accidents occasion. Peter followed Christ boldly, and suspected not his own heart, till it betrayed him in the hour of temptation, and led him to deny his Lord. David lived years of happy obedience, while he was in private life. What calm, clear-sighted faith is manifested in his answer to Saul about Goliath, The Lord that delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. Nay, not only in retired life, in severe trial, under ill usage from Saul, he continued faithful to his God. Years and years did he go on fortifying his heart and learning the fear of the Lord. Yet power and wealth weakened his faith, and for a season overcame him. There was a time when a prophet could retort upon him, Thou art the man whom thou condemnest. He had kept his principles in words, but lost them in his heart. Hezekiah is another instance of a religious man bearing trouble well, but for a season falling back under the temptation of prosperity, and that after extraordinary mercies had been vouchsafed to him. And if these things be so in the case of the favored saints of God, what may we suppose is our own real spiritual state in his sight? It is a serious thought. The warning to be deduced from it is this, never to think we have a due knowledge of ourselves till we have been exposed to various kinds of temptations and tried on every side. Integrity on one side of our character is no voucher for integrity on another. We cannot tell how we should act if brought under temptations different from those which we have hitherto experienced. This thought should keep us humble. We are sinners, but we do not know how great. He alone knows who died for our sins. 3. Thus much we cannot but allow that we do not know ourselves in those respects in which we have not been tried. But farther than this, what if we do not know ourselves even where we have been tried and found faithful? It is a remarkable circumstance which has been often observed that if we look to some of the most eminent saints of Scripture, we shall find their recorded errors to have occurred in those parts of their duty in which each had had most trial, and generally showed obedience most perfect. Faithful Abraham, through want of faith, denied his wife. Moses, the meekest of men, was excluded from the land of promise for a passionate word. The wisdom of Solomon was seduced to bow down to idols. Barnabas again, the son of consolation, had a sharp contention with St. Paul. If then men who knew themselves better than we doubtless know ourselves had so much of hidden infirmity about them, even in those parts of their character which were most free from blame. What are we to think of ourselves? And if our very virtues be so defiled with imperfection, what must be the unknown multiplied circumstances of evil which aggravate the guilt of our sins? This is a third presumption against us. 4. Think of this, too. 
No one begins to examine himself and to pray to know himself with David in the text. But he finds within him an abundance of faults, which before were either entirely or almost entirely unknown to him. That this is so we learn from the written lives of good men and our own experience of others. And hence it is that the best men are ever the most humble, for having a higher standard of excellence in their minds than others have, and knowing themselves better, they see somewhat of the breadth and depth of their own sinful nature, and are shocked and frightened at themselves. The generality of men cannot understand this, and if at times the habitual self-condemnation of religious men breaks out into words, they think it arises from affectation, or from a strange distempered state of mind, or from accidental melancholy and disquiet. Whereas the confession of a good man against himself is really a witness against all thoughtless persons who hear it, and a call on them to examine their own hearts. Doubtless, the more we examine ourselves, the more imperfect and ignorant we shall find ourselves to be. 5. But let a man persevere in prayer and watchfulness to the day of his death. He will never get to the bottom of his heart. Though he know more and more of himself as he becomes more conscientious and earnest, still the full manifestation of the secrets there lodged is reserved for another world. And at the last day, who can tell the affright and horror of a man who lived to himself on earth, indulging his own evil will, following his own chance notions of truth and falsehood, shunning the cross and the reproach of Christ, when his eyes are at length opened before the throne of God, and all his innumerable sins, his habitual neglect of God, his abuse of his talents, his misapplication and waste of time, and the original unexplored sinfulness of his nature are brought clearly and fully to his view. Nay, even to the true servants of Christ, the prospect is awful. The righteous, we are told, will scarcely be saved. Then will the good man undergo the full sight of his sins which on earth he was laboring to obtain, and partly succeeded in obtaining, though life was not long enough to learn and subdue them all. Doubtless we must all endure that fierce and terrifying vision of our real selves, that last fiery trial of the soul, before its acceptance, a spiritual agony and second death to all who are not then supported by the strength of him who died to bring them safe through it, and in whom on earth they have believed. My brethren, I appeal to your reason whether these presumptions are not in their substance fair and just. And if so, next I appeal to your consciences, whether they are new to you. For if you have not even thought about your real estate, nor even know how little you know of yourselves, how can you in good earnest be purifying yourselves for the next world? or be walking in the narrow way. And yet how many are the chances that a number of those who now hear me have no sufficient knowledge of themselves, or sense of their ignorance, and are in peril of their souls? Christ's ministers cannot tell who are and who are not the true elect. But when the difficulties in the way of knowing yourselves aright are considered, it becomes a most serious and immediate question for each of you to entertain, whether or not he is living a life of self-deceit, and thinking far more comfortably of his spiritual state than he has any right to do. For call to mind the impediments that are in the way of your knowing yourselves, or feeling your ignorance, and then judge. 1. 
First of all, self-knowledge does not come as a matter of course. It implies an effort and a work. As well may we suppose that the knowledge of the languages comes by nature, as that acquaintance with our own heart is natural. Now the very effort of steadily reflecting is itself painful to many men, not to speak of the difficulty of reflecting correctly. To ask ourselves why we do this or that, to take account of the principles which govern us, and see whether we act for conscience' sake or from some lower inducement, is painful. We are busy in the world, and what leisure time we have we readily devote to a less severe and wearisome employment. 2. And then comes in our self-love. We hope the best. This saves us the trouble of examining. Self-love answers for our safety. We think it sufficient caution to allow for certain possible unknown faults at the utmost, and to take them into the reckoning when we balance our account with our conscience. Whereas if the truth were known to us, we should find we had nothing but debts, and those greater than we can conceive, and ever increasing. 3. And this favorable judgment of ourselves will especially prevail, if we have the misfortune to have uninterrupted health, and high spirits, and domestic comfort. Health of body and mind is a great blessing, if we can bear it. But unless chastened by watchings and fastings, it will commonly seduce a man into the notion that he is much better than he really is. Resistance to our acting rightly, whether it proceed from within or without, tries our principle. But when things go smoothly, and we have but to wish, and we can perform, we cannot tell how far we do or do not act from a sense of duty. When a man's spirits are high, he is pleased with everything and with himself especially. He can act with vigor and promptness, and he mistakes this mere constitutional energy for strength of faith. He is cheerful and contented, and he mistakes this for Christian peace. And if happy in his family, he mistakes mere natural affection for Christian benevolence, and the confirmed temper of Christian love. In short, he is in a dream from which nothing could have saved him except deep humility, and nothing will ordinarily rescue him except sharp affliction. Other accidental circumstances are frequently causes of a similar self-deceit. While we remain in retirement from the world, we do not know ourselves. Or, after any great mercy or trial, which has affected us much, and given a temporary strong impulse to our obedience, or when we are in keen pursuit of some good object, which excites the mind, and for a time deadens it to temptation, under such circumstances we are ready to think far too well of ourselves. The world is away, or at least we are insensible to its seductions, and we mistake our merely temporary tranquility or our overwrought fervor of mind on the one hand for Christian peace, on the other for Christian zeal. 4. Next we must consider the force of habit. Conscience at first warns us against sin, but if we disregard it, it soon ceases to upbraid us, and thus sins once known in time become secret sins. It seems then, and it is a startling reflection, that the more guilty we are, the less we know it, for the oftener we sin, the less we are distressed at it. I think many of us may on reflection recollect instances in our experience of ourselves of our gradually forgetting things to be wrong which once shocked us. Such is the force of habit. By it, for instance, men contrive to allow themselves in various kinds of dishonesty. They bring themselves to affirm what is untrue, 
or what they are not sure is true in the course of business. They overreach and cheat, and still more are they likely to fall into low and selfish ways without their observing it, and all the while to continue careful in their attendance on the Christian ordinances and bear about them a form of religion. Or again, they will live in self-indulgent habits, eat and drink more than is right, display a needless pomp and splendor in their domestic arrangements without any misgiving, much less do they think of simplicity, of manners and abstinence as Christian duties. Now we cannot suppose they always thought their present mode of living to be justifiable, for others are still struck with its impropriety, and what others now feel, doubtless they once felt themselves. But such is the force of habit. So again, to take as a third instance, the duty of stated private prayer. At first it is omitted with compunction, but soon with indifference. But it is not the less a sin because we do not feel it to be such. Habit has made it a secret sin. 5. To the force of habit must be added that of custom. Every age has its own wrong ways, and these have such influence that even good men from living in the world are unconsciously misled by them. At one time a fierce persecuting hatred of those who erred in Christian doctrine has prevailed. At another, an odious overestimation of wealth and the means of wealth. At another, an irreligious veneration of the mere intellectual powers. At another, a laxity of morals. At another, disregard of the forms and discipline of the church. The most religious men, unless they are especially watchful, will feel the sway of the fashion of their age and suffer from it as lot in wicked Sodom, though unconsciously. Yet their ignorance of the mischief does not change the nature of their sin. Sin it still is. Only custom makes it secret sin. 6. Now what is our chief guide amid the evil and seducing customs of the world? Obviously, the Bible. The world passes away, but the word of God endureth forever. How much extended, then, and strengthened, necessarily must be the secret dominion of sin over us, when we consider how little we read Scripture. Our conscience gets corrupted, true, but the words of truth, though effaced from our minds, remain in Scripture bright in their eternal youth and purity. Yet we do not study Scripture to stir up and refresh our minds. Ask yourselves, my brethren, what do you know of the Bible? Is there any one part of it you have read carefully and as a whole? One of the Gospels, for instance. Do you know very much more of your Savior's works and words than you have heard read in church? Have you compared his precepts, or St. Paul's, or any other apostles, with your own daily conduct and prayed, and endeavored to act upon them? If you have, so far is well. Go on to do so. If you have not, it is plain you do not possess, for you have not sought to possess, an adequate notion of that perfect Christian character which it is your duty to aim at, nor an adequate notion of your actual sinful state. You are in the number of those who come not to the light, lest their deeds should be reproved. These remarks may serve to impress upon us the difficulty of knowing ourselves aright, and the consequent danger to which we are exposed of speaking peace to our souls when there is no peace. Many things are against us, this is plain, yet is not our future prize worth a struggle? Is it not worth present discomfort and pain to accomplish an escape from the fire that never shall be quenched? Can we endure the thought of going down to the grave with a load of sins on our head unknown and unrepented of? 
Can we content ourselves with such an unreal faith in Christ as in no sufficient measure includes self-abasement or thankfulness or the desire or effort to be holy? For how can we feel our need of his help or our dependence on him or our debt to him or the nature of his gift to us unless we know ourselves? How can we in any sense be said to have that mind of Christ to which the Apostle exhorts us if we cannot follow him to the height above or the depth beneath, if we do not in some measure discern the cause and meaning of his sorrows, but regard the world and man and the system of providence in a light different from that which his words and acts supply? If you receive revealed truth merely through the eyes and ears, you believe words, not things. You deceive yourselves. You may conceive yourselves sound in faith, but you know nothing in any true way. Obedience to God's commandments, which implies knowledge of sin and of holiness, and the desire and endeavor to please Him, this is the only practical interpreter of scripture doctrine without self-knowledge you have no root in yourselves personally you may endure for a time but under affliction or persecution your faith will not last this is why many in this age and in every age become infidels heretics schismatics disloyal despisers of the church they cast off the form of truth because it never has been to them more than a form. They endure not, because they never have tasted that the Lord is gracious, and they never have had experience of his power and love, because they have never known their own weakness and need. This may be the future condition of some of us, if we harden our hearts today. Apostasy. Some day, even in this world we may be found openly among the enemies of God and of his church. But even should we be spared this present shame, what will it ultimately profit a man to profess without understanding, to say he has faith when he has not works? In that case we shall remain in the heavenly vineyard stunted plants, without the principle of growth in us, barren. And in the end, we shall be put to shame before Christ and his holy angels, as trees of withering fruits, twice dead, plucked up by the roots, even though we die in outward communion with the church. To think of these things and to be alarmed is the first step towards acceptable obedience. To be at ease is to be unsafe. We must know what the evil of sin is hereafter if we do not learn it here. God give us all grace to choose the pain of present repentance before the wrath to come. End of Sermon 4「Sermon 5 of Parochial and Plain Sermons, Volume 1, by John Henry Newman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Sermon 5. Self-Denial, the Test of Religious Earnestness. Now it is high time to awake out of sleep. Romans 13.11 By sleep, in this passage, St. Paul means a state of insensibility to things as they really are in God's sight. When we are asleep, we are absent from this world's action, as if we were no longer concerned in it. It goes on without us, or, if our rest be broken and we have some slight notion of people and occurrences about us, if we hear a voice or a sentence and see a face, Yet we are unable to catch these external objects justly and truly. We make them part of our dreams, and pervert them till they have scarcely a resemblance to what they really are. 
and such is the state of men as regards religious truth. God is ever almighty and all-knowing. He is on his throne in heaven, trying the reins and the hearts. And Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, is on his right hand. And ten thousand angels and saints are ministering to him, wrapped in the contemplation of him, or by their errands of mercy connecting this lower world with his courts above. They go to and fro, as though upon the ladder which Jacob saw. And the disclosure of this glorious invisible world is made to us principally by means of the Bible, partly by the course of nature, partly by the floating opinions of mankind, partly by the suggestions of the heart and conscience. And all these means of information concerning it are collected and combined by the Holy Church, which heralds the news forth to the whole earth, and applies it with power to individual minds, partly by direct instruction, partly by her very form and fashion, which witnesses to them, so that the truths of religion circulate through the world almost as the light of day, every corner and recess having some portion of its blessed rays. Such is the state of a Christian country. Meanwhile, how is it with those who dwell in it? The words of the text remind us of their condition. They are asleep. While the ministers of Christ are using the armor of light, and all things speak of him, they walk not becomingly as in the day. Many live altogether as though the day shone not on them, but the shadows still endured, and far the greater part of them are but very faintly sensible of the great truths preached around them. They see and hear as people in a dream. They mix up the holy word of God with their own idle imaginings. If startled for a moment, still they soon relapse into slumber. They refuse to be awakened, and think their happiness consists in continuing as they are. Now I do not for an instant suspect, my brethren, that you are in the sound slumber of sin. This is a miserable state which I should hope was, on the whole, the condition of few men, at least in a place like this. But allowing this, yet there is great reason for fearing that very many of you are not wide awake, that though your dreams are disturbed, yet dreams they are, and that the view of religion which you think to be a true one is not that vision of the truth which you would see were your eyes open but such a vague, defective, extravagant picture of it as a man sees when he is asleep. At all events, however this may be, it will be useful, please God, if you ask yourselves one by one the question, How do I know I am in the right way? How do I know that I have real faith and am not in a dream? The circumstances of these times render it very difficult to answer this question. When the world was against Christianity, it was comparatively easy, but in one sense the world is now for it. I do not mean there are not turbulent, lawless men who would bring all things into confusion, if they could, who hate religion and would overturn every established institution which proceeds from or is connected with it. Doubtless there are very many such, but from such men religion has nothing to fear. The truth has ever flourished and strengthened under persecution. But what we have to fear is the opposite fact, that all the rank and the station and the intelligence and the opulence of the country is professedly with religion. We have cause to fear from the very circumstance that the institutions of the country are based upon the acknowledgment of religion as true. Worthy of all honor are they who so based them. Miserable is the guilt which lies upon those who have attempted and partly succeeded in shaking that holy foundation. 
but it often happens that our most bitter are not our most dangerous enemies. On the other hand, greatest blessings are the most serious temptations to the unwary. And our danger at present is this, that a man's having a general character for religion, reverencing the gospel and professing it, and to a certain point obeying it, so fully promotes his temporal interest that it is difficult for him to make out for himself whether he really acts on faith or from a desire of this world's advantages. It is difficult to find tests which may bring home the truth to his mind and probe his heart after the manner of him who from his throne above tries it with an almighty wisdom. It can scarcely be denied that attention to their religious duties is becoming a fashion among large portions of the community, so large that to many individuals these portions are in fact the world. We are every now and then surprised to find persons to be in the observance of family prayer, of reading scripture, or of holy communion, of whom we should not have expected beforehand such a profession of faith or we hear them avowing the high evangelical truths of the new testament and countenancing those who maintain them all this brings it about that it is our interest in this world to profess to be christ's disciples and further than this it is necessary to remark that in spite of this general profession of zeal for the gospel among all respectable persons at this day, nevertheless there is reason for fearing that it is not altogether the real gospel that they are zealous for. Doubtless we have cause to be thankful whenever we see persons earnest in the various ways I have mentioned. Yet somehow, after all, there is reason for being dissatisfied with the character of the religion of the day, dissatisfied first because oftentimes these same persons are very inconsistent often for instance talk irreverently and profanely ridicule or slight things sacred speak against the holy church or against the blessed saints of early times or even against the favored servants of god set before us in scripture or act with the world and the worst sort of men even when they do not speak like them attend to them more than to the ministers of god or are very lukewarm lax and unscrupulous in matters of conduct so much so that they seem hardly to go by principle but by what is merely expedient and convenient and then again putting aside our judgment of these men as individuals and thinking of them as well as we can which of course it is our duty to do yet after all taking merely the multitude of them as a symptom of a state of things i own i am suspicious of any religion that is a people's religion or an age's religion our saviour says narrow is the way this of course must not be interpreted without great caution yet surely the whole tenor of the inspired volume leads us to believe that his truth will not be heartily received by the many that it is against the current of human feeling and opinion and the course of the world and so far forth as it is received by a man will be opposed by himself that is, by his old nature, which remains about him, next by all others, so far forth as they have not received it. The light shining in darkness is the token of true religion. And though doubtless there are seasons when a sudden enthusiasm arises in favor of the truth, as in the history of St. John the Baptist, in whose light the Jews were willing for a season to rejoice so as even to be baptized of him confessing their sins yet such a popularity of the truth is but sudden comes at once and goes at once 
has no regular growth, no abiding stay. It is error alone which grows and is received heartily on a large scale. St. Paul has set up his warning against our supposing truth will ever be heartily accepted. Whatever show there may be of a general profession of it, in his last epistle, where he tells Timothy, among other sad prophecies, that evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse. Truth indeed has that power in it that it forces men to profess it in words. But when they go on to act, instead of obeying it, they substitute some idol in the place of it. On these accounts, when there is much talk of religion in a country and much congratulation that there is a general concern for it, a cautious mind will feel anxious, lest some counterfeit be, in fact, honored instead of it, lest it be the dream of man rather than the verities of God's word, which has become popular, and lest the received form have no more truth in it than is just necessary to recommend it to the reason and conscience, lest, in short, it be Satan transformed into an angel of light, rather than the light itself which is attracting followers. If then this be a time, which I suppose it is, when a general profession of religion is thought respectable and right in the virtuous and orderly classes of the community, this circumstance should not diminish your anxiety about your own state before God, but rather, I may say, increase it, for two reasons. First, because you are in danger of doing right from motives of this world. Next, because you may perchance be cheated of the truth by some ingenuity which the world puts like counterfeit coin in the place of the truth. Some indeed of those who now hear me are in situations where they are almost shielded from the world's influence, whatever it is. There are persons so happily placed as to have religious superiors who direct them to what is good only, and who are kind to them, as well as pious towards God. This is their happiness, and they must thank God for the gift, but it is their temptation too. At least they are under one of the two temptations just mentioned. Good behavior is, in their case, not only a matter of duty, but of interest. If they obey God, they gain praise from men as well as from Him, so that it is very difficult for them to know whether they do right for conscience' sake or for the world's sake. Thus, whether in private families or in the world, in all the ranks of middle life, men lie under a considerable danger at this day, a more than ordinary danger of self-deception, of being asleep while they think themselves awake. How then shall we try ourselves? Can any tests be named which will bring certainty to our minds on the subject? No indisputable tests can be given. We cannot know for certain. We must beware of an impatience about knowing what our real state is. St. Paul himself did not know till the last days of his life, as far as we know, that he was one of God's elect who shall never perish. He said, I know nothing by myself, yet am I not hereby justified. That is, though I am not conscious to myself of neglect of duty, Yet am I not therefore confident of my acceptance? Judge nothing before the time. Accordingly, he says in another place, I keep under my body, and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. And yet, though this absolute certainty of our relation unto glory be unattainable, and the desire to obtain it an impatience which ill befits sinners, nevertheless a comfortable hope, a sober and subdued belief that God has pardoned 
and justified us for Christ's sake, blessed be his name, is attainable, according to St. John's words, If our heart condemn us not, then we have confidence toward God. And the question is, how are we to attain to this, under the circumstances in which we are placed? In what does it consist? Were we in a heathen land, as I said just now, it were easy to answer. The very profession of the gospel would almost bring evidence of true faith as far as we could have evidence. For such profession among pagans is almost sure to involve persecution. Hence it is that the epistles are so full of expressions of joy in the Lord Jesus and in the exulting hope of salvation. Well might they be confident, who had suffered for Christ. Tribulation worketh patience, and patience experience, and experience hope. Henceforth let no man trouble me, for I bear in my body the marks of the Lord Jesus. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. Our hope of you is steadfast knowing that as ye are partakers of the suffering, so shall ye be also of the consolation. These and such like texts belong to those only who have witnessed for the truth like the early Christians. They are beyond us. This is certain, yet since the nature of Christian obedience is the same in every age, it still brings with it as it did then an evidence of God's favor. We cannot indeed make ourselves as sure of our being in the number of God's true servants as the early Christians were, yet we may possess our degree of certainty, and by the same kind of evidence, the evidence of self-denial. This was the great evidence which the first disciples gave, and which we can still give, Reflect upon our Saviour's plain declarations. Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross, and follow me. If any man come to me, and hate not his father, and mother, and wife, and children, and brethren, and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever doth not bear his cross, and come after me, he cannot be my disciple. If thy hand offend thee, cut it off. If thy foot offend thee, cut it off. If thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed, halt, with one eye, than to be cast into hell. Now, without attempting to explain perfectly such passages as these, which doubtless cannot be understood without a fullness of grace, which is possessed by a very few men, yet at least we learn thus much from them, that a rigorous self-denial is a chief duty, nay, that it may be considered the test whether we are Christ's disciples, whether we are living in a mere dream, which we mistake for Christian faith and obedience, or are really and truly awake, alive, living in the day, on our road heavenwards. The early Christians went through self-denials in their very profession of the gospel. What are our self-denials, now that the profession of the gospel is not a self-denial? In what sense do we fulfill the words of Christ? Have we any distinct notion what is meant by the words taking up our cross? In what way are we acting, in which we should not act, supposing the Bible and the Church were unknown to this country and religion as existing among us, was merely a fashion of this world? What are we doing which we have reason to trust is done for Christ's sake, who bought us? You know well enough that works are said to be the fruits and evidence of faith, that faith is said to be dead which has them not. 
Now what works have we to show of such a kind as to give us confidence, so that we may not be ashamed before him at his coming? In answering this question I observe first of all that according to the scripture the self-denial which is the test of our faith must be daily. If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. It is thus St. Luke records our Savior's words. Accordingly, it seems that Christian obedience does not consist merely in a few occasional efforts, a few accidental good deeds or certain seasons of repentance, prayer, and activity, a mistake which minds of certain class are very apt to fall into. This is the kind of obedience which constitutes what the world calls a great man, that is, a man who has some noble points and every now and then acts heroically so as to astonish and subdue the minds of beholders, but who in private life has no abiding personal religion, who does not regulate his thoughts, words, and deeds according to the law of God, again the word daily implies that the self-denial which is pleasing to Christ consists in little things. This is plain, for opportunity for great self-denials does not come every day. Thus to take up the cross of Christ is no great action done once for all. It consists in the continual practice of small duties which are distasteful to us. If then a person asks how he is to know whether he is dreaming on in the world's slumber or is really awake and alive unto God, let him first fix his mind upon some one or other of his besetting infirmities. Every one who is at all in the habit of examining himself must be conscious of such within him. Many men have more than one. All of us have some one or other, and in resisting and overcoming such, self-denial has its first employment. One man is indolent and fond of amusement. Another man is passionate or ill-tempered. Another is vain. Another has little control over his tongue. Others are weak and cannot resist the ridicule of thoughtless companions. Others are tormented with bad passions, of which they are ashamed, yet are overcome. Now let everyone consider what his weak point is, and that is his trial. His trial is not in those things which are easy to him, but in that one thing, in those several things, whatever they are, in which to do his duty is against his nature. Never think yourself safe because you do your duty in ninety-nine points. It is the hundredth which is to be the ground of your self-denial, which must evidence, or rather instance, and realize your faith. It is in reference to this you must watch and pray. Pray continually for God's grace to help you, and watch with fear and trembling lest you fall. Other men may not know what these weak points of your character are. They may mistake them, but you may know them. You may know them by their guesses and hints, and your own observation, and the light of the Spirit of God. And oh, that you may have strength to wrestle with them, and overcome them. Oh, that you may have the wisdom to care little for the world's religion, or the praise you get from the world, and your agreement with what clever men or powerful men or many men make the standard of religion compared with the secret consciousness that you are obeying God in little things as well as great, in the hundredth duty as well as in the ninety-nine. Oh, that you may, as it were, sweep the house diligently to discover what you lack of the full measure of obedience. For be quite sure that this apparently small defect will influence your whole spirit and judgment in all things. 
be quite sure that your judgment of persons and of events and of actions and of doctrines and your spirit towards god and man your faith in the high truths of the gospel and your knowledge of your duty all depend in a strange way on this strict endeavor to observe the whole law on this self-denial in those little things in which obedience is a self-denial be not content with the warmth of faith carrying you over many obstacles even in your obedience forcing you past the fear of men and the usages of society and the persuasions of interest exult not in your experience of god's past mercies and your assurance of what he has already done for your soul if you are conscious you have neglected the one thing needful the one thing which thou lackest daily self-denial but besides this there are other modes of self-denial to try your faith and sincerity which it may be right just to mention it may so happen that the sin you are most liable to is not called forth every day for instance anger and passion are irresistible perhaps when they come upon you but it is only at times that you are provoked and then you are off your guard so that the occasion is over and you have failed before you were well aware of its coming it is right then almost to find out for yourself daily self-denials and this because our lord bids you take up your cross daily and because it proves your earnestness and because by doing so you strengthen your general power of self-mastery and come to have such an habitual command of yourself as will be a defense ready prepared when the season of temptation comes rise up then in the morning with the purpose that please god the day shall not pass without its self-denial with a self-denial in innocent pleasures and tastes if none occurs to mortify sin let your very rising from your bed be a self-denial let your meals be self-denials determined to yield to others in things indifferent to go out of your way in small matters to inconvenience yourself so that no direct duty suffers by it rather than you should not meet with your daily discipline this was the psalmist method who was as it were punished all day long and chastened every morning it was saint paul's method who kept under or bruised his body and brought it into subjection this is one great end of fasting a man says to himself how am i to know i am in earnest i would suggest to him make some sacrifice do some distasteful thing which you are not actually obliged to do so that it be lawful to bring home to your mind that in fact you do love your saviour that you do hate sin that you do hate your sinful nature that you have put aside the present world thus you will have an evidence to a certain point that you are not using mere words it is easy to make professions easy to say fine things in speech or in writing easy to astonish men with truths which they do not know and sentiments which rise above human nature but thou o servant of god flee these things and follow after righteousness godliness faith love patience meekness let not your words run on force every one of them into action as it goes and thus cleansing yourself from all pollution of the flesh and spirit perfect holiness in the fear of god in dreams we sometimes move our arms to see if we are awake or not and so we are awakened this is the way to keep your heart awake also try yourself daily in little deeds to prove that your faith is more than a deceit i am aware all this is a hard doctrine hard to those even who assent to it and can describe it most accurately 
there are such imperfections such inconsistencies in the heart and life of even the better sort of men that continual repentance must ever go hand in hand with our endeavors to obey much we need the grace of christ's blood to wash us from the guilt we daily incur much we need the aid of his promised spirit and surely he will grant all the riches of his mercy to his true servants but as surely he will vouchsafe to none of us the power to believe in him and the blessedness of being one with him who are not as earnest in obeying him as if salvation depended on themselves in the sermon five Sermon 6 of Parochial and Plain Sermons, Volume 1, by John Henry Newman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Sermon 6, The Spiritual Mind, The Kingdom of God is Not in Word, but in Power. 1 Corinthians 4.20 How are we the better for being members of the Christian Church? This is a question which has ever claims on our attention, but it is right from time to time to examine our hearts with more than usual care, to try them by the standard of that divinely enlightened temper in the church and in the saints, the work of the Holy Ghost, called by St. Paul, the Spirit. I ask then, how are we the better for being Christ's disciples? What reason have we for thinking that our lives are very different from what they would have been if we had been heathens have we in the words of the text received the kingdom of god in word or in power i will make some remarks in explanation of this question which may through god's grace assist you my brethren in answering it one now first if we would form a just notion of how far we are influenced by the power of the gospel we must evidently put aside everything which we do merely in imitation of others, and not from religious principle. Not that we can actually separate our good words and works into two classes, and say what is done from faith and what is done only by accident, and in a random way, but without being able to draw the line it is quite evident that so very much of our apparent obedience to God arises from mere obedience to the world and its fashions, or rather, that it is so difficult to say what is done in the spirit of faith as to lead us, on reflection, to be very much dissatisfied with ourselves, and quite out of conceit with our past lives. Let a person merely reflect on the number and variety of bad or foolish thoughts which he suffers and dwells on in private, which he would be ashamed to put into words, and he will at once see how very poor a test his outward demeanor in life is of his real holiness in the sight of God. Or again, let him consider the number of times he has attended public worship as a matter of course, because others do, and without seriousness of mind, or the number of times he has found himself unequal to temptations when they came, which beforehand he and others made light of in conversation, blaming those perhaps who had been overcome by them. And he must own that his outward conduct shapes itself unconsciously by the manners of those with whom he lives, being acted upon by external impulses, apart from any right influence proceeding from the heart. Now when I say this, am I condemning all that we do without thinking expressly of the duty of obedience at the very time we are doing it? Far from it. A religious man, in proportion as obedience becomes more and more easy to him, will doubtless do his duty unconsciously. It will be natural to him to obey, and therefore he will do it naturally, that is, without effort or deliberation. It is difficult things which we are obliged to think about before doing them. When we have mastered our hearts in any matter, it is true, 
we no more think of the duty while we obey than we think of how to walk when we walk or by what rules to exercise any art which we have thoroughly acquired separate acts of faith aid us only while we are unstable as we get strength but one extended act of faith so to call it influences us all through the day and our whole day is but one act of obedience also then there is no minute distribution of our faith among our particular deeds our will runs parallel to god's will this is the very privilege of confirmed christians and it is comparatively but a sordid way of serving god to be thinking when we do a deed if i do not do this i shall risk my salvation or if i do it i have a chance of being saved comparatively a groveling way for it is the best the only way for sinners such as we are to begin to serve god in still as we grow in grace we throw away childish things then we are able to stand upright like grown men without the props and the aids which our infancy required this is the noble manner of serving god to do good without thinking about it without any calculation or reasoning from love of the good and hatred of the evil though cautiously and with prayer and watching yet so generously that if we were suddenly asked why we so act we could only reply because it is our way or because christ so acted so spontaneously as not to know so much that we are doing right as that we are not doing wrong i mean with more of instinctive fear of sinning than of minute and careful appreciation of the degrees of our obedience hence it is that the best men are ever the most humble as for other reasons so especially because they are accustomed to be religious they surprise others but not themselves they surprise others at their very calmness and freedom from thought about themselves this is to have a great mind to have within us that princely heart of innocence of which david speaks common men see god at a distance in their attempts to be religious they feebly guide themselves as by a distant light and are obliged to calculate and search about for the path but the long-practised christian who through god's mercy has brought god's presence near to him the elect of god in whom the blessed spirit dwells he does not look out of doors for the traces of god he is moved by god dwelling in him and needs not but act on instinct i do not say that there is any man altogether such for this is an angelic life but it is the state of mind to which vigorous prayer and watching tend how different is this high obedience from that random unawares way of doing right which to so many men seems to constitute a religious life the excellent obedience i have been describing is obedience on habit now the obedience i condemn as untrue may be called obedience on custom the one is of the heart the other of the lips the one is in power the other in word the one cannot be acquired without much and constant vigilance generally not without much pain and trouble the other is the result of a mere passive imitation of those whom we fall in with why need i describe what every man's experience bears witness to why do children learn their mother tongue and not a foreign language do they think about it are they better or worse for acquiring one language and not another their character of course is just what it would have been otherwise how then are we better or worse if we have but in the same passive way admitted into our minds certain religious opinions 
and have but accustom ourselves to the words and actions of the world around us. Supposing we had never heard of the gospel, should we not do just what we do, even in a heathen country, were the manners of the place, from one cause or another, as decent and outwardly religious? This is the question we have to ask ourselves. And if we are conscious to ourselves that we are not greatly concerned about the question itself, and have no fears worth mentioning of being in the wrong, and no anxiety to find what is right, is it not evident that we are living to the world, not to God, and that whatever virtue we may actually have, still the gospel of Christ has come to us not in power, but in word only? I have now suggested one subject for consideration concerning our reception of the kingdom of God, that is, to inquire whether we have received it more than externally. But, two, I will go on to affirm that we may have received it in a higher sense than in word merely, and yet in no real sense in power. In other words, that our obedience may be in some sort religious, and yet hardly deserve the title of Christian. This may be at first sight a startling assertion. It may seem to some of us that if there were no difference between being religious and being Christian, that to insist on a difference is to perplex people. But listen to me. Do you not think it possible for men to do their duty, that is, be religious, in a heathen country? Doubtless it is. St. Peter says that in every nation he that feareth God and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. Now, are such persons therefore Christians? Certainly not. It would seem, then, it is possible to fear God and work righteousness, yet without being Christians. For if we would know the truth of it, to be a Christian is to do this, and to do much more than this. Here, then, is a fresh subject for self-examination. Is it not the way of men to dwell with satisfaction on their good deeds, particularly when, for some reason or other, their conscience smites them? Or when they are led to the consideration of death, then they begin to turn in their minds how they shall acquit themselves before the judgment seat. And then it is they feel a relief in being able to detect in their past lives any deeds which may be regarded in any sense religious. You may hear some persons comforting themselves that they never harmed anyone, and that they have not given in to an openly profligate and riotous life. Others are able to say more. They can speak of their honesty, their industry, or their general conscientiousness. We will say they have taken good care of their families, they have never defrauded or deceived anyone, and they have a good name in the world. Nay, they have in one sense lived in the fear of God. I will grant them this and more, yet possibly they are not altogether Christians in their obedience. I will grant that these virtuous and religious deeds are really fruits of faith, not external merely done without thought, but proceeding from the heart. I will grant that they are really praiseworthy, and when a man from want of opportunity knows no more, really acceptable to God. Yet they determine nothing about his having received the gospel of Christ in power. Why? For the simple reason that they are not enough. A Christian's faith and obedience is built on all this, but it is only built on it. It is not the same as it. To be Christian, surely it is not enough to be that which we are enjoined to be, and must be, even without Christ. Not enough to be no better than good heathens. Not enough to be, in some slight measure, just, honest, temperate, and religious. We must indeed be just, honest, temperate, and religious before we can rise to Christian graces, and to be practiced in justice and the like virtues is the way, the ordinary way, 
in which we receive the fullness of the kingdom of God. And doubtless any man who despises those who try to practice them, I mean conscientious men, who, notwithstanding, have not yet clearly seen and welcomed the gospel system, and slightingly calls them mere moral men in disparagement, such a man knows not what spirit he is of, and had best take heed how he speaks against the workings of the inscrutable spirit of God. I am not wishing to frighten these imperfect Christians, but to lead them on, to open their minds to the greatness of the work before them, to dissipate the meager and carnal views in which the gospel has come to them, to warn them that they must never be contented with themselves, or stand still and relax their efforts, but must go on unto perfection, that till they are much more than they are at present, they have received the kingdom of God in word, not in power, that they are not spiritual men, and can have no comfortable sense of God's presence in their souls, for to whom much is given, of him much is required. What is it then that they lack? I will read several passages of Scripture which will make it plain. St. Paul says, If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. Again, The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. The love of Christ constraineth us. Put on, therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long-suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another, as any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things put on charity, which is the bond of perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. God hath sent forth the Spirit of his Son into your hearts. Lastly, our Saviour's own memorable words, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross daily, and follow me. Now it is plain that this is a very different mode of obedience from any which natural reason and conscience tell us of. Different not in its nature, but in its excellence and peculiarity. It is much more than honesty, justice, and temperance, and this is to be a Christian. Observe in what respect it is different from that lower degree of religion which we may possess without entering into the mind of the gospel. First of all, in its faith, which is placed not simply in God, but in God as manifested in Christ. According to his own words, Ye believe in God, believe also in me. Next, we must adore Christ as Lord and Master and love him as our most gracious Redeemer. We must have a deep sense of our guilt and of the difficulty of securing heaven. We must live as in his presence daily pleading his cross and passion, thinking of his holy commandments, imitating his sinless pattern, that we may really and truly be servants of Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, in whose name we were baptized. Further, we must, for his sake, aim at a noble and unusual strictness of life, perfecting holiness in his fear, destroying our sins, mastering our whole soul, and bringing it into captivity to his law, denying ourselves lawful things in order to do him service, exercising a profound humility and an unbounded, never-failing love, 
given away much of our substance in religious and charitable works, and discountenancing and shunning irreligious men. This is to be a Christian, a gift easily described, and in a few words, but attainable only with fear and much trembling, promised, indeed, and in a measure accorded at once to every one who asks for it, but not secured till after many years, and never in this life fully realized. But be sure of this, that every one of us, who has had the opportunities of instruction and sufficient time, and yet does not in some good measure possess it, every one who, when death comes, has not gained his portion of that gift which it requires a course of years to gain, and which he might have gained, is in a peril so great and fearful that I do not like to speak about it. As to the notion of a partial and ordinary fulfillment of the duties of honesty, industry, sobriety, and kindness availing him, it has no scriptural encouragement. We must stand or fall by another and higher rule. We have become what St. Paul calls new creatures. That is, we must have lived and worshipped God as the redeemed of Jesus Christ, in all faith and humbleness of mind, in reverence towards his word and ordinances, in thankfulness, in resignation, in mercifulness, gentleness, purity, patience, and love. Not considering the obligation of obedience which lies upon us Christians, in these two respects, first, as contrasted with a mere outward and nominal profession, and next, contrasted with that more ordinary obedience which is required of those even who have not the gospel, how evident is it that we are far from the kingdom of God. Let each in his own conscience apply this to himself. I will grant that he has some real Christian principle in his heart, but I wish him to observe how little that is likely to be. Here is a thought not to keep us from rejoicing in the Lord Jesus, but to make us rejoice with trembling. Wait diligently on God. Pray Him earnestly to teach us more of our duty, and to impress the love of it on our hearts, to enable us to obey both in that free spirit, which can act right without reasoning and calculation, and yet with the caution of those who know their salvation depends on obedience in little things, from love of the truth as manifested in him who is the living truth come upon earth, the way, the truth, and the life. With others we have no concern. We do not know what their opportunities are. There may be thousands in this populous land who never had the means of hearing Christ's voice fully, and in whom virtues short of evangelical will hereafter be accepted as the fruit of faith. Nor can we know the hearts of any men, or tell what is the degree in which they have improved their talents. It is enough to keep to ourselves. We dwell in the full light of the gospel, and the full grace of the sacraments, we ought to have the holiness of apostles. There is no reason except our own willful corruption that we are not by this time walking in the steps of St. Paul or St. John and following them as they followed Christ. What a thought is this! Do not cast it from you, my brethren, but take it to your homes, and may God give you grace to profit by it. End of Sermon 6《ซ e r m o n Seven of Parochial and Plain Sermons, Volume One by John Henry Newman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.《ซ e r m o n Seven, Sins of Ignorance and Weakness. Let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience, and our bodies washed with pure water. Hebrews 10.22
Among the reasons which may be assigned for the observance of prayer at stated times, there is one which is very obvious, and yet perhaps is not so carefully remembered and acted upon as it should be. I mean the necessity of sinners cleansing themselves from time to time of the ever-accumulating guilt which loads their consciences. We are ever sinning, and though Christ has died once for all to release us from our penalty, yet we are not pardoned once for all, but according as and whenever each of us supplicates for the gift. By the prayer of faith we appropriate it, but only for the time, not for ever. Guilt is again contracted, and must be again repented of and washed away. We cannot by one act of faith establish ourselves for ever after in the favor of God. It is going beyond His will to be impatient for a final acquittal when we are bid ask only for our daily bread. We are still so far in the condition of the Israelites and though we do not offer sacrifice or observe the literal washings of the law, yet we still require the periodical renewal of those blessings which were formerly conveyed in their degree by the Mosaic rites. And though we gain far more excellent gifts from God than the Jews did, and by more spiritual ordinances, yet means of approaching Him we still need and continual means to keep us in the justification in which baptism first placed us. Of this the text reminds us. It is addressed to Christians, to the regenerate. Yet so far from their regeneration having cleansed them once for all, they are bid ever to sprinkle the blood of Christ upon their consciences, and renew, as it were, their baptism and so continually appear before the presence of Almighty God. Let us now endeavor to realize a truth which few of us will be disposed to dispute as far as words go. 1. First consider our present condition, as shown us in Scripture. Christ has not changed this, though he has died. It is as it was from the beginning, I mean our actual state as men. We have Adam's nature in the same sense as if redemption had not come to the world. It has come to all the world, but the world is not changed thereby as a whole. That change is not a work done and over in Christ. We are changed one by one. The race of man is what it ever was, guilty, what it was before Christ came with the same evil passions, the same slavish will. The history of redemption, if it is to be effectual, must begin from the beginning with every individual of us and be carried on through our own life. It is not a work done ages before we were born. We cannot profit by the work of a Savior, though he be the blessed Son of God, so as to be saved thereby without our own working, for we are moral agents, we have a will of our own, and Christ must be formed in us and turn us from darkness to light, if God's gracious purpose, fulfilled upon the cross, is to be in our case more than a name, an abused, wasted privilege. Thus the world, viewed as in God's sight, can never become wiser or more enlightened than it has been. We cannot mount upon the labors of our forefathers. We have the same nature that man ever had, and we must begin from the point man ever began from and work out our salvation in the same slow, persevering manner. When this is borne in mind, how important the Jewish law becomes to us Christians important in itself over and above all references contained in it to that gospel which it introduced. To this day it fulfills its original purpose of impressing upon man his great guilt and feebleness. Those legal sacrifices and purifications, which are now all done away, 
are still evidence to us of a fact which the gospel has not annulled our corruption let no one lightly pass over the book of leviticus and say it only contains the ceremonial of a national law let no one study it merely with a critic's eye satisfied with connecting it in a nicely arranged system with the gospel as though it contained prophecy only no it speaks to us are we better than the jews is our nature less unbelieving sensual or proud than theirs surely man is at all times the same being as even the philosophers tell us and if so that minute ceremonial of the law presents us with a picture of our daily life it impressively testifies to our continual sinning by suggesting that an expiation is needful in all the most trivial circumstances of our conduct and that it is at our peril if we go on carelessly and thoughtlessly trusting to our having been once accepted whether in baptism or as we think at a certain season of repentance or as we may fancy at the very time of the death of christ as if then the whole race of man were really and at once pardoned and exalted or still worse if we profanely doubt that man has ever fallen under a curse and trust idly in the mercy of god without a feeling of the true misery and infinite danger of sin consider the ceremony observed on the great day of atonement and you will see what was the sinfulness of the israelites and therefore of all mankind in god's sight the high priest was taken to represent the holiest person of the whole world the nation itself was holy above the rest of the world from it a holy tribe was selected from the holy tribe a holy family and from that family a holy person this was the high priest who was thus set apart as the choice specimen of the whole human race yet even he was not allowed under pain of death to approach even the mercy seat of god except once a year nor then in his splendid robes nor without sacrifices for sins of himself and the people the blood of which he carried with him into the holy place or consider the sacrifices necessary according to the law for sins of ignorance or again for the mere touching of anything which the law pronounced unclean or for bodily disease and hence learn how sinful our ordinary thoughts and deeds must be represented to us as they are by these outward ceremonial transgressions not even their thanksgiving might the israelites offer without an offering of blood to cleanse it for our corruption is not merely in this act or that but in our nature next to pass from the jewish law you will observe that god tells us expressly in the history of the fall of adam what the legal ceremonies implied that it is our very nature which is sinful herein is the importance of the doctrine of original sin it is very humbling and is such the only true introduction to the preaching of the gospel men can without trouble be brought to confess that they sin that is that they commit sins they know well enough they are not perfect that they do nothing in the best manner but they do not like to be told that the race from which they proceed is degenerate even the indolent have pride here they think they can do their duty only do not choose to do it they like to believe though strangely indeed for they condemn themselves while they believe it they like to believe that they do not want assistance a man must be far gone in degradation and has lost even that false independence of mind which is often a substitute for real religion in leading to exertion who while living in sin steadily and contentedly holds the opinion that he is born for sin and much more do the industrious and active dislike to have it forced upon their minds 
that do what they will they have the taint of corruption about all their doings and imaginings we know how ashamed men are of being low-born or discreditably connected this is the sort of shame forced upon every son of adam thy first father hath sinned this is the legend on our forehead which even the sign of the cross does no more than blot out leaving the mark of it this is our shame but i notice it here not so much as a humbling thought as with the view of pressing upon your consciences the necessity of appearing before god at stated seasons in order to put aside the continually renewed guilt of your nature who will dare go on day after day in neglect of earnest prayer and the holy communion while each day brings its own fearful burden coming as if spontaneously springing from our very nature but not got rid of without deliberate and direct acts of faith in the great sacrifice which has been set forth for its removal further look into your own souls my brethren and see if you cannot discern some part of the truth of the scripture statement which i have been trying to set before you recollect the bad thoughts of various kinds which come into your minds like darts for these will be some evidence to you of the pollution and odiousness of your nature true they proceed from your adversary the devil and the very circumstance of your experience them is in itself no proof of your being sinful for even the son of god your saviour suffered from the temptation of them but you will scarcely deny that they are received by you so freely and heartily as to show that satan tempts you through your nature not against it again let them be ever so external in their first coming do you not make them your own do you not detain them or do you impatiently and indignantly shake them off even if you reject them still do they not answer satan's purpose in inflaming your mind at the instant and so evidence that the matter of which it is composed is corruptible do you not for instance dwell on the thought of wealth and splendor till you covet these temporal blessings or do you not suffer yourselves though for a while to be envious or discontented or angry or vain or impure or proud ah who can estimate the pollution hence of one single day the pollution of touching merely that dead body of sin which we put off indeed at our baptism but which is tied about us while we live here and is the means of our enemies assaults upon us the taint of death is upon us and surely we shall be stifled by the encompassing plague unless god from day to day vouchsafes to make us clean two again reflect on the habits of sin which we superadded to our evil nature before we turned to god here is another source of continual defilement instead of checking the bad elements within us perhaps we indulged them for years and they truly had their fruit unto death then adam's sin increased and multiplied itself within us there was a change but it was for the worse not for the better and the new nature we gained far from being spiritual was twofold more the child of hell than that with which we were born so when at length we turned back into a better course what a complicated work lay before us to unmake ourselves and however long we have labored at it still how much unconscious unavoidable sin the result of past transgression is thrown out from our hearts day by day in the energy of our thinking and acting thus through the sins of our youth the power of the flesh is exerted against us as a second creative principle of evil aiding the malice of the devil satan from without and our hearts from within not passive merely and kindled by temptation but devising evil and speaking hard things against god with articulate voice 
whether we will or not. Thus do years rise up against us in present offenses. Gross inconsistencies show themselves in our character, and much need have we continually to implore God to forgive us our past transgressions, which still live in spite of our repentance, and act of themselves vigorously against our better mind, feebly influenced by that younger principle of faith by which we fight against them. 3. Further, consider how many sins are involved in our obedience, I may say, from the mere necessity of the case, that is, from not having that more vigorous and clear-sighted faith which would enable us accurately to discern and closely to follow the way of life. The case of the Jews will exemplify what I mean. There were points of God's perfect law which were not urged upon their acceptance, because it was foreseen that they would not be able to receive them as they really should be received, or to bring them home practically to their minds and obey them simply and truly. We Christians with the same evil hearts as the Jews had, and most of us as unformed in holy practice, have nevertheless a perfect law. We are bound to take and use all the precepts of the New Testament, though it stands to reason that many of them are, in matter of fact, quite above the comprehension of most of us. I am speaking of the actual state of the case, and will not go aside to ask why, or under what circumstances God was pleased to change his mode of dealing with man. But so it is. The minister of Christ has to teach his sinful people a perfect obedience, and does not know how to set about it, or how to insist on any precept so as to secure it from being misunderstood and misapplied. He sees men are acting upon low motives and views, and finds it impossible to raise their minds all at once, however clear his statements of the truth. He feels that their good deeds might be done in a much better manner. There are numberless small circumstances about their mode of doing things which offend him as implying poverty of faith, superstition, and contracted carnal notions. He is obliged to leave them to themselves with the hope that they may improve generally and outgrow their present feebleness, and is often perplexed whether to praise or blame them. So is it with all of us, ministers as well as people. It is so with the most advanced of Christians while in the body, and God sees it. What a source of continual defilement is here, not an omission merely of what might be added to our obedience, but a cause of positive offense in the eyes of eternal purity. Who is not displeased when a man attempts some great work which is above his powers? And is it an excuse for his miserable performance that the work is above him? Now this is our case. We are bound to serve God with a perfect heart, an exalted work, a work for which our sins disable us. And when we attempt it, necessary as is our endeavor, how miserable must it appear in the eyes of the angels, how pitiful our exhibition of ourselves, and withal how sinful, since did we love God more from the heart, and had we served him from our youth up, it would not have been with us as it is. Thus our very calling as creatures, and again as elect children of God and free men in the gospel, is by our sinfulness made our shame. For it puts us upon duties, and again upon the use of privileges which are above us. We attempt great things with the certainty of failing, and yet the necessity of attempting. And so while we attempt, need continual forgiveness for the failure of the attempt. We stand before God as the Israelites at the Passover of Hezekiah, who desired to serve God according to the law, 
but could not do so accurately from lack of knowledge. And we can but offer, through our great high priest, our sincerity and earnestness, instead of exact obedience, as Hezekiah did for them. The good Lord pardon every one that prepareth his heart to seek God, the Lord God of his fathers, though he be not cleansed according to the purification of the sanctuary, not performing, that is, the full duties of his calling. And if such be the deficiencies even of the established Christian in his ordinary state, how great must be those of the penitent who has but lately begun the service of God, or of the young who are still within the influence of some unbridled imagination or some domineering passion, or of the heavily depressed spirit whom Satan binds with the bonds of bodily ailment or tosses to and fro in the tumult of doubt and indecision. Alas, how is their conscience defiled with the thoughts, nay, the words of every hour, and how inexpressibly needful for them to relieve themselves of the evil that weighs upon their heart by drawing near to God in full assurance of faith and washing away their guilt in the expiation which he has appointed. What I have said is a call upon you, my brethren, in the first place, to daily private prayer. Next, it is a call upon you to join the public services of the church, not only once a week, but whenever you have the opportunity, knowing well that your Redeemer is especially present where two or three are gathered together. And further, it is an especial call upon you to attend upon the celebration of the Lord's Supper, in which blessed ordinance we really and truly gain that spiritual life which is the object of our daily prayers. The body and blood of Christ give power and efficacy to our daily faith and repentance. Take this view of the Lord's Supper as the appointed means of obtaining the great blessings you need. The daily prayers of the Christian do but spring from and are referred back to his attendance on it. Christ died once, long since, by communicating in his sacrament, you renew the Lord's death. You bring into the midst of you that sacrifice which took away the sins of the world. You appropriate the benefit of it while you eat it under the elements of bread and wine. These outward signs are simply the means of an hidden grace. You do not expect to sustain your animal life without food, be but as rational in spiritual concerns as you are in temporal. Look upon the consecrated elements as necessary under God's blessing to your continual sanctification. Approach them as the salvation of your souls. Why is it more strange that God should work through means for the health of the soul than that he should ordain them for the preservation of bodily life? as he certainly has done. It is unbelief to think it matters not to your spiritual welfare whether you communicate or not. And it is worse than unbelief. It is utter insensibility and obduracy, not to discern the state of death and corruption into which, when left to yourselves, you are continually falling back. Rather thank God that whereas you are sinners, Instead of his leaving you, the mere general promise of life through his Son, which is addressed to all men, he has allowed you to take that promise to yourselves one by one, and thus gives you a humble hope that he has chosen you out of the world unto salvation. Lastly, I have all along spoken as addressing true Christians, who are walking in the narrow way, and have hope of heaven. But these are the few. Are there none here present of the many who walk in the broad way, and have upon their heads all their sins, from their baptism upwards? Rather is it not probable that there are persons in this congregation 
who though mixed with the people of God are really unforgiven, and if they died now, would die in their sins? First, let those who neglect the Holy Communion ask themselves whether this is not their condition. Let them reflect whether among the signs by which it is given us to ascertain our state, there can be to a man's own conscience a more fearful one than this, that he is omitting what is appointed as the ordinary means of his salvation. This is a plain test about which no one can deceive himself. But next, let him have recourse to a more accurate search into his conscience, and ask himself whether, in the words of the text, he draws near to God with a true heart. That is, whether in spite of his prayers and religious services, there be not some secret, unresisted lusts within him which make his devotion a mockery in the sight of God and leave him in his sins, whether he be not in truth thoughtless and religious only as far as his friends make him seem so, or light-minded and shallow in his religion, being ignorant of the depths of his guilt and resting presumptuously on his own innocence as he thinks it, and God's mercy. Whether he be not set upon gain, obeying God only as far as his service does not interfere with the service of mammon, whether he be not harsh, evil-tempered, unforgiving, unpitiful, or high-minded, self-confident and secure, or whether he be not fond of the fashions of this world, which pass away, desirous of the friendship of the great and of sharing in the refinements of society, or whether he be not given up to some engrossing pursuit which indisposes him to the thought of his God and Saviour. Any one deliberate habit of sin incapacitates a man for receiving the gifts of the gospel. All such states of mind as these are fearful symptoms of the existence of some such willful sin in our hearts, and in proportion as we trace these symptoms in our conduct, so much we dread, lest we be reprobate. Let us then approach God, all of us, confessing that we do not know ourselves, that we are more guilty than we can possibly understand, and can but timidly hope, not confidently determine that we have true faith. Let us take comfort in our being still in a state of grace, though we have no certain pledge of salvation. Let us beg him to enlighten us and comfort us, to forgive us all our sins, teaching us those we do not see, and enabling us to overcome them. End of Sermon 7 Sermon 8 of Parochial and Plain Sermons, Volume 1, by John Henry Newman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Sermon 8. God's Commandments Not Grievous. This is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not grievous. 1 John 5.3. It must ever be borne in mind that it is a very great and arduous thing to attain to heaven. Many are called, few are chosen. Straight is the gate, and narrow is the way. Many will seek to enter in, and shall not be able. If any man come to me, and hate not his father, and mother, and wife, and children, and brethren, and sisters, Yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. On the other hand, it is evident to anyone who reads the New Testament with attention that Christ and his apostles speak of a religious life as something easy, pleasant, and comfortable. Thus, in the words I have taken for my text, This is the love of God, that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. In like manner, our Saviour says, 
Come unto me, and I will give you rest. My yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Solomon also, in the Old Testament, speaks in the same way of true wisdom. Her ways are ways of pleasantness, and all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to them that lay hold upon her, and happy is every one that retaineth her. When thou liest down, thou shalt not be afraid. Yea, thou shalt lie down, and thy sleep shall be sweet. Again we read in the prophet Micah, What doth the Lord require of thee, but to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God? As if it were a little and an easy thing so to do. Now I will attempt to show how it is that these apparently opposite declarations of Christ and his prophets and apostles are fulfilled to us. For it may be objected by inconsiderate persons that we are, if I may so express it, hardly treated, invited to come to Christ and receive his light yoke, promised an easy and happy life, the joy of a good conscience, the assurance of pardon, and the hope of heaven, and then, on the other hand, when we actually come, as it were, rudely repulsed, frightened, reduced to despair by severe requisitions and evil forebodings. Such is the objection, not which any Christian would bring forward, for we, my brethren, know too much of the love of our Master and only Saviour in dying for us, seriously to entertain for an instant any such complaint, we have at least faith enough for this, and it does not require a great deal, that is, to believe that the Son of God, Jesus Christ, is not yea and nay, but in him is yea, for all the promises of God in him are yea, and in him, amen, unto the glory of God by us. It is for the very reason that none of us can seriously put the objection that I allow myself to state it strongly, to urge it being in a Christian's judgment absurd, even more than it would be wicked. But though none of us really feel as an objection to the gospel this difference of view under which the gospel is presented to us, or even as a difficulty, still it may be right, in order to our edification, that we should see how these two views of it are reconciled. We must understand how it is both severe and indulgent in its commands, and both arduous and easy in its obedience, in order that we may understand it at all. His commandments are not grievous, says the text. How is this? I will give one answer out of several which might be given. Now it must be admitted, first of all, as matter of fact, that they are grievous to the great mass of Christians. I have no wish to disguise the, a fact which we do not need the Bible to inform us of, but which common experience attests. Doubtless, even those common elementary duties of which the prophet speaks, doing justly, loving mercy, and walking humbly with our God, are to most men grievous. Accordingly, men of worldly minds, finding the true way of life unpleasant to walk in, have attempted to find out other and easier roads, and have been accustomed to argue that there must be another way which suits them better than that which religious men walk in, for the very reason that Scripture declares that Christ's commandments are not grievous. I mean, you will meet with persons who say, After all, it is not to be supposed that a strict religious life is so necessary as is told us in church, else how should any one be saved? Nay, and Christ assures us his yoke is easy. Doubtless we shall fare well enough though we are not so earnest in the observance of our duties as we might be, though we are not regular in our attendance at public worship, 
Though we do not honor Christ's ministers and reverence his church as much as some men do, though we do not labor to know God's will, to deny ourselves, and to live to his glory as entirely as the strict letter of Scripture enjoins, some men have gone so far as boldly to say, God will not condemn a man merely for taking a little pleasure, by which they mean leading an irreligious and profligate life. And many there are who virtually maintain that we may live to the world so that we do so decently, and yet live to God, arguing that this world's blessings are given us by God and therefore may lawfully be used, that to use lawfully is to use moderately and thankfully, that it is wrong to take gloomy views and right to be innocently cheerful, and so on which is all very true thus stated, did they not apply it unfairly, and call that use of the world moderate and innocent, which the apostles would call being conformed to the world, and serving mammon instead of God, and thus before showing you what is meant by Christ's commandments not being grievous, I have said what is not meant by it. It is not meant that Christ dispenses with strict religious obedience. The whole language of Scripture is against such a notion. Whosoever shall break one of these least commandments, and shall teach men so, he should be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever shall keep the whole law, and yet offend in one point, he is guilty of all. Whatever is meant by Christ's yoke being easy, Christ does not encourage sin. And again, whatever is meant, still I repeat, as a matter of fact, most men find it not easy. So far must not be disputed. Now then, let us proceed, in spite of this admission, to consider how he fulfills his engagements to us, that his ways are ways of pleasantness. 1. Now supposing some superior promised you any gift in a particular way, and you did not follow his directions, would he have broken his promise, or you have voluntarily excluded yourselves from the advantage? Evidently you would have brought about your own loss. You might indeed think his offer not worth accepting, burdened as it was with a condition annexed to it, still you could not in any propriety say that he failed in his engagement. Now when Scripture promises us that its commandments shall be easy, it couples the promise with the injunction that we should seek God early. I love them that love me, and those that seek me early shall find me. Again, Remember now thy Creator in the days of thy youth. These are Solomon's words, and if you require our Lord's own authority, attend to his direction about the children. Suffer the little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. Youth is the time of his covenant with us, when he first gives us his Spirit, first giving then that we may then forthwith begin our return of obedience to him, not then giving it that we may delay our thank-offering for twenty, thirty, or fifty years. Now it is obvious that obedience to God's commandments is ever easy, and almost without effort to those who begin to serve him from the beginning of their days, whereas those who wait a while find it grievous in proportion to their delay. For consider how gently God leads us on in our early years, and how very gradually he opens upon us the complicated duties of life. A child at first has hardly anything to do but to obey his parents. Of God he knows just as much as they are able to tell him, and he is not equal to many thoughts either about him or about the world. He is almost passive in their hands who gave him life. And though he has those latent instincts about good and evil, truth and falsehood, 
which all men have, he does not know enough. He has not had experience enough from the contact of external objects to elicit into form and action those innate principles of conscience, or to make himself conscious of the existence of them. And while, on the one hand, his range of duty is very confined, observed how he is assisted in performing it. First, he has no bad habits to hinder the suggestions of his conscience. Indolence, pride, ill-temper do not then act as they afterwards act, when the mind has accustomed itself to disobedience, as stubborn, deep-seated impediments in the way of duty. To obey requires an effort, of course, but an effort like the bodily effort of the child rising from the ground when he has fallen on it, not the effort of shaking off drowsy sleep, not the effort, far less, of violent bodily exertion in a time of sickness and long weakness. And the first effort made, obedience on a second trial, will be easier than before, till at length it will be easier to obey than not to obey. A good habit will be formed, where otherwise a bad habit would have been formed. Thus the child we are supposing would begin to have a character, no longer influenced by every temptation to anger, discontent, fear, and obstinacy, in the same way as before, but with something of firm principle in his heart, to repel them in a defensive way as a shield repels darts. In the meantime the circle of his duties would enlarge, and though for a time the issue of his trial would be doubtful to those who, as the angels could see it, yet should he, as a child, consistently pursue this easy course for a few years, it may be his ultimate salvation would be actually secured and might be predicted by those who could see his heart, though he would not know it himself. Doubtless new trials would come on him, bad passions which he had not formed a conception of would assail him, but a soul thus born of God, in St. John's words, sinneth not but he that is begotten of God keepeth himself, and that wicked one toucheth him not. His seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin, because he is born of God. And so he would grow up to man's estate, his duties at length attaining their full range, and his soul being completed in all its parts for the due performance of them. This might be the blessed condition of every one of us, did we but follow from infancy what we know to be right, and in Christ's early life, if we may dare to speak of him in connection with ourselves, it was fulfilled, while he increased day by day sinlessly in wisdom as in stature, and in favor with God and man. But my present object of speaking of this gradual growth of holiness in the soul is not to show what we might be had we the heart to obey God, but to show how easy obedience would in that case be to us, consisting, as it would, in no irksome ceremonies, no painful bodily discipline, but in the free will offerings of the heart of the heart which had been gradually and by very slight occasional efforts trained to love what God and our conscience approve. Thus Christ's commandments, viewed as he enjoins them on us, are not grievous. They would be grievous if put upon us all at once, but they are not heaped on us, according to his order of dispensing them, which goes upon an harmonious and considerate plan, by little and little, first one duty, then another, then both, and so on. Moreover, they come upon us, while the safeguard of virtuous principle is forming naturally and gradually in our minds by our very deeds of obedience, and is following them as their reward. Now, if men will not take their duties in Christ's order, but are determined to delay obedience, 
with the intention of setting about their duty some day or other, and then making up for past time. Is it wonderful that they find it grievous and difficult to perform, that they are overwhelmed with the arrears of their great work, that they are entangled and stumble amid the intricacies of the divine system which has progressively enlarged upon them? And is Christ under obligation to stop that system, to recast his providence, to take these men out of their due place in the church, to save them from the wheels that are crushing them, and to put them back again into some simple and more childish state of trial, where, though they cannot have less to unlearn, they at least may for a time have less to do? 2. All this being granted, it still may be objected since, as I have allowed, the commandments of God are grievous to the generality of men, where is the use of saying what men ought to be, when we know what they are? And how is it fulfilling a promise that his commandments shall not be grievous, by informing us that they ought not to be? It is one thing to say that the law is in itself holy, just, and good, and quite a different thing to declare that it is not grievous to sinful man. In answering this question, I fully admit that our Saviour spoke of man as he is, as a sinner, when he said his yoke should be easy to him. Certainly he came not to call righteous men, but sinners. Doubtless we are in a very different state from that of Adam before his fall, and doubtless in spite of this St. John says that even to fallen man his commandments are not grievous. On the other hand, I grant that if man cannot obey God, obedience must be grievous, and I grant too, of course, that man by nature cannot obey God. But observe nothing has here been said, nor by St. John in the text, of man as by nature born in sin, but of man as a child of grace, as Christ's purchased possession who goes before us with his mercy, puts the blessing first and then adds the command, regenerates us, and then bids us obey. Christ bids us do nothing that we cannot do. He repairs the fault of our nature even before it manifests itself in the act. He cleanses us from original sin and rescues us from the wrath of God by the sacrament of baptism. He gives us the gift of his Spirit, and then he says, What doth the Lord require of thee but to do justly, and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with thy God? And is this grievous? When then men allege their bad nature as an excuse for their dislike of God's commandments, if, indeed, they are heathens, let them be heard and an answer may be given to them even as such. But with heathens we are not now concerned. These men make their complaint as Christians, and as Christians they are most unreasonable in making it, God having provided a remedy for their natural incapacity in the gift of his Spirit. Hear St. Paul's words. If through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man Jesus Christ, hath abounded unto many. Where sin abounded, grace did much more abound, that as sin hath reigned unto death, even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. And there are persons, let it never be forgotten, who have so followed God's leading providence from their youth up, that to them his commandments are not only not grievous, but never have been. And that there are such is the condemnation of all who are not such. They have been brought up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, and they now live in the love and the peace of God which passeth all understanding. Such are they whom our Saviour speaks of as just persons 
which need no repentance. Not that they will give that account of themselves, for they are full well conscious in their own hearts of sin's innumerable and habitual infirmity. Still, in spite of stumblings and falls in their spiritual course, they have on the whole persevered. As children they served God on the whole. They disobeyed, but they recovered their lost ground. They sought God and were accepted. Perhaps their young faith gave way for a time altogether, but even then they contrived with keen repentance and strong disgust at sin and earnest prayers to make up for lost time and to keep pace with the course of God's providence. Thus they have walked with God, not indeed step by step with Him, never before Him, often loitering, stumbling, falling to sleep, yet in turn starting and making haste to keep His commandments, running and prolonging not the time. Thus they proceed, not, however, of themselves, but as upheld by his right hand, guiding their steps by his word. And though they have nothing to boast of, and know their own unworthiness, still they are witnesses of Christ to all men, as showing what man can become, and what all Christians ought to be. And at the last day, being found meet for the inheritance of the saints in light, they condemn the world, as Noah did, and become heirs of the righteousness which is by faith, according to the saying, This is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. And now, to what do the remarks I have been making tend but to this? To humble every one of us. For however faithfully we have obeyed God, and however early we began to do so, Surely we might have begun sooner than we did, and might have served him more heartily. We cannot be but conscious of this. Individuals among us may be more or less guilty, as the case may be, but the best and worst among us here assembled may well unite themselves together so far as this, to confess they have erred and strayed from God's ways like lost sheep have followed too much the devices and desires of their own hearts, have no health in themselves as being miserable offenders. Some of us may be nearer heaven, some further from it, some may have a good hope of salvation, and others, God forbid, but it may be, others no present hope. Still, let us unite now as one body in confessing, to the better part of us such confession will be the more welcome, and to the worst it is the more needful, in confessing ourselves sinners, deserving God's anger, and having no hope except according to his promises declared unto mankind in Christ Jesus our Lord. He who first regenerated us, and then gave his commandments, and then was so ungratefully deserted by us, he again it is that must pardon and quicken us after our accumulated guilt, if we are to be pardoned. Let us then trace back in memory, as far as we can, our early years, what we were when five years old, when ten, when fifteen, when twenty, what our state would have been as far as we can guess it, had God taken us to our account at any age before the present. I will not ask how it would go with us were we now taken. We will suppose the best. Let each of us, I say, reflect upon his own most gross and persevering neglect of God at various seasons of his past life. How considerate he has been to us! How did he shield us from temptation? How did he open his will gradually upon us, as we might be able to bear it? How has he done all things well, so that the spiritual work might go on calmly, safely, surely? How did he lead us on, duty by duty, as if step by step upwards, by the easy rounds of that ladder, 
whose top reaches to heaven. Yet how did we thrust ourselves into temptation? How did we refuse to come to him that we might have life? How did we daringly sin against light? And what was the consequence? That our work grew beyond our strength. Or rather, that our strength grew less as our duties increased, till at length we gave up obedience in despair. And yet then he still tarried and was merciful unto us. He turned and looked upon us to bring us into repentance, and we for a while were moved. Yet even then our wayward hearts could not keep up to their own resolves, letting go again the heat which Christ gave them, as if made of stone and not of living flesh. What could have been done more to his vineyard that he hath not done in it? O my people, he seems to say to us, what have I done unto thee? And wherein have I wearied thee? Testify against me. I brought thee up out of the land of Egypt, and redeemed thee out of the house of servants. What doth the Lord require of thee but justice, mercy, and humbleness of mind? He hath showed us what is good. He hath borne and carried us in his bosom, lest at any time we should dash our foot against a stone. He shed his Holy Spirit upon us, that we might love him. And this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. Why then have they been grievous to us? Why have we erred from his ways, and hardened our hearts from his fear? Why do we this day stand ashamed, yea, even confounded, because we bear the reproach of our youth? Let us then turn to the Lord while yet we may. Difficult it will be in proportion to the distance we have departed from him, since every one might have done more than he has done. Every one has suffered losses he can never make up. We have made his commands grievous to us. We must bear it. Let us not attempt to explain them away because they are grievous. We never can wash out the stains of sin. God may forgive, but the sin has had its work, and its memento is set up in the soul. God sees it there. Earnest obedience and prayer will gradually remove it. Still, what miserable loss of time is it in our brief life? to be merely undoing, as has become necessary, the evil which we have done, instead of going on to perfection. If by God's grace we shall be able, in a measure, to sanctify ourselves in spite of our former sins, yet how much more should we have attained, had we always been engaged in his service? These are bitter and humbling thoughts, but they are good thoughts, if they lead us to repentance. And this leads me to one more observation with which I conclude. If anyone who hears me is at present moved by what I have said, and feels the remorse and shame of a bad conscience, and forms any sudden good resolution, let him take heed to follow it up at once by acting upon it, I earnestly beseech him so to do, for this reason, because if he does not, he is beginning a habit of inattention and insensibility. God moves us in order to make the beginning of duty easy. If we do not attend, he ceases to move us. Any of you, my brethren, who will not take advantage of this considerate providence, if you will not turn to God now with a warm heart, you will hereafter be obliged to do so, if you do so at all, with a cold heart, which is much harder. God keep you from this. End of Sermon 8「Sermon 9 of Parochial and Plain Sermons, Volume 1 by John Henry Newman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Sermon 9. 
The Religious Use of Excited Feelings The man out of whom the devils were departed besought him that he might be with him. But Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to thine own house, and show how great things God hath done unto thee. Luke 8, 38 and 39 it was very natural in the man whom our Lord had set free from this dreadful visitation to wish to continue with him. Doubtless his mind was transported with joy and gratitude. Whatever consciousness he might possess of his real wretchedness while the devils tormented him, now at least, on recovering his reason, he would understand that he had been in a very miserable state and he would feel all the lightness of spirits and activity of mind which attend any release from suffering or constraint. Under these circumstances, he would imagine himself to be in a new world. He had found deliverance, and what was more, a deliverer too, who stood before him. And whether from a wish to be ever in his divine presence, ministering to him, or from a fear lest Satan would return, nay, with sevenfold power, did he lose sight of Christ, or from an undefined notion that all his duties and hopes were now changed, that his former pursuits were unworthy of him, and that he must follow up some great undertakings with the new ardor he felt glowing within him, from one or another, or all of these feelings combined, he besought our Lord that he might be with him. Christ imposed this attendance as a command on others. He bade, for instance, the young ruler follow him. But he gives opposite commands according to our tempers and likings. He thwarts us that he may try our faith. In the case before us he suffered not what at other times he had bidden. Return to thine own house, he said or, as it is in St. Mark's Gospel, Go home to thy friends, and tell them how great things the Lord hath done for thee, and hath had compassion on thee. He directed the current of his newly awakened feelings into another channel, as if he said, Lovest thou me? This do. Return home to your old occupations and pursuits. You did them ill before. You lived in the world. Do them well now, live to me. Do your duties, little as well as great, heartily for my sake. Go among your friends, show them what God hath done for thee. Be an example to them, and teach them. And further, as he said on another occasion, show thyself to the priest, and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. Show forth that greater light and truer love which you now possess in a conscientious, consistent obedience to all the ordinances and rites of your religion. Now from this account of the restored demoniac, his request and our Lord's denial of it, a lesson may be drawn for the use of those who, having neglected religion in early youth, at length begin to have serious thoughts try to repent and wish to serve God better than hitherto, though they do not know how to set about it. We know that God's commandments are pleasant, and rejoice the heart if we accept them in the order and manner in which he puts them upon us. That Christ's yoke, as he has promised, is on the whole very easy, if we submit to it betimes that the practice of religion is full of comfort to those who, being first baptized with the Spirit of grace, receive thankfully his influences as their minds open, inasmuch as they are gradually and almost without sensible effort on their part, imbued in all their heart, soul, and strength with that true heavenly life which will last forever. But here the question meets us. But what are those to do who have neglected to remember their Creator in the days of their youth, and so have lost all claim on Christ's promise, that his yoke shall be easy and his commandments not grievous? 
I answer that of course they must not be surprised if obedience is with them a laborious uphill work all their days. Nay, as having been once enlightened and partaken of the Holy Ghost in baptism, they would have no right to complain even though it were impossible for them to renew themselves again unto repentance. But God is more merciful than this just severity, merciful not only above our deservings, but even above his own promises. Even for those who have neglected him when young, he has found, if they will avail themselves of it, some sort of remedy of the difficulties in the way of obedience which they have brought upon themselves by sinning. And what this remedy is and how it is to be used, I proceed to describe in connection with the account in the text. The help I speak of is the excited feeling with which repentance is at first attached. True it is that all the passionate emotion or fine sensibility which ever man displayed will never by itself make us change our ways and do our duty. Impassioned thoughts, high aspirations, sublime imaginings have no strength in them. They can no more make a man obey consistently than they can move mountains. If any man truly repent, it must be in consequence not of these, but of a settled conviction of his guilt and a deliberate resolution to leave his sins and serve God. Conscience and reason in subjection to conscience, these are those powerful instruments under grace which change a man. But you will observe that though conscience and reason lead us to resolve on and to attempt a new life, they cannot at once make us love it. It is long practice and habit which makes us love religion, and in the beginning obedience doubtless is very grievous to habitual sinners. Here, then, is the use of those earnest, ardent feelings of which I just now spoke, and which attend on the first exercise of conscience and reason, to take away from the beginnings of obedience its grievousness to give us an impulse which may carry us over the first obstacles and send us on our way rejoicing. Not as if all this excitement of mind were to last, which cannot be, but it will do its office in thus setting us off, and then will leave us to the more sober and higher comfort resulting from that real love for religion at which obedience itself will have by that time begun to form in us, and will gradually go on to perfect. Now it is well to understand this fully, for it is often mistaken. When sinners at length are led to think seriously, strong feelings generally proceed or attend their reflections about themselves. Some book they have read, some conversation of a friend, some remarks they have heard made in church, or some occurrence or misfortune rouses them. Or, on the other hand, if in any more calm and deliberate manner they have commenced their self-examination, yet in a little time the very view of their manifold sins, of their guilt and of their heinous ingratitude to their God and Savior, breaking upon them and being new to them, strikes and astonishes and then agitates them. Here, then, let them know the intention of all this excitement of mind in the order of divine providence. It will not continue. It rises from the novelty of the view presented to them. As they become accustomed to religious contemplations, it will wear away. It is not religion itself, though it is accidentally connected with it and may be made a means of leading them into a sound religious course of life. It is graciously intended to be a set-off in their case against the first distastefulness and pain of doing their duty. It must be used as such, or it will be of no use at all, or worse than useless. 
my brethren, bear this in mind, and I say this generally, not confining myself to the excitement which attends repentance, of all that natural emotion prompting us to do good, which we involuntarily feel on various occasions. It is given you in order that you may find it easy to obey at starting. Therefore, obey promptly. Make use of it while it lasts. It waits for no man. Do you feel natural pity towards some case which reasonably demands your charity, or the impulse of generosity in a case where you are called to act a manly self-denying part? Whatever the emotion may be, whether these or any other, do not imagine you will always feel it. Whether you avail yourselves of it or not, still, anyhow, you will feel it less and less, and, as life goes on, at last you will not feel such sudden vehement excitement at all. But this is the difference between seizing or letting slip these opportunities. If you avail yourselves of them for acting, and yield to the impulse, so far as conscience tells you to do, you have made a leap, so to say, across a gulf, to which your ordinary strength is not equal. You will have secured the beginning of obedience, and the further steps in the course are, generally speaking, far easier than those which first determine its direction. And so, to return to the case of those who feel any accidental remorse for their sins violently exerting themselves in their hearts, I say to them, do not loiter. Go home to your friends and repent in deeds of righteousness and love. Hasten to commit yourselves to certain definite acts of obedience. Doing is at a far greater distance from intending to do than you at first sight imagine. Join them together while you can. You will be depositing your good feelings into your heart itself by thus making them influence your conduct, and they will spring up into fruit. This was the conduct of the conscience-stricken Corinthians, as described by St. Paul, who rejoiced not that they were made sorry, not that their feelings merely were moved, but that they sorrowed to change of mind. For godly sorrow, he continues, worketh repentance to salvation not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. But now let us ask, how do men usually conduct themselves in matter of fact when under visitings of conscience for their past sinful lives. They are far from thus acting. They look upon the turbid zeal and feverish devotion which attend their repentance, not as in part the corrupt offspring of their own previously corrupt state of mind, and partly a gracious natural provision, only temporary, to encourage them to set about their reformation, but as the substance and real excellence of religion. They think that to be thus agitated is to be religious. They indulge themselves in these warm feelings for their own sake, resting in them as if they were then engaged in a religious exercise, and boasting of them as if they were an evidence of their own exalted spiritual state, not using them, the one only thing they ought to do, using them as an incitement to deeds of love, mercy, truth, meekness, holiness. After they have indulged this luxury of feeling for some time, the excitement, of course, ceases. They do not feel as they did before. This, I have said, might have been anticipated, but they do not understand it so. See, then, their unsatisfactory state. They have lost an opportunity of overcoming the first difficulties of active obedience, and so of fixing their conduct and character which may never occur again. This is one great misfortune. But more than this, what a perplexity they have involved themselves in. Their warmth of feeling is gradually dying away. Now they think that in it true religion consists 
Therefore they believe that they are losing their faith and falling into sin again. And this, alas, is too often the case. They do fall away, for they have no root in themselves. Having neglected to turn their feelings into principles by acting upon them, they have no inward strength to overcome the temptation to live as the world, which continually assails them. Their minds have been acted upon as water by the wind, which raises waves for a time, then ceasing, leaves the water to subside into its former stagnant state. The precious opportunity of improvement has been lost, and the latter end is worse with them than the beginning. But let us suppose that when they first detect this declension, as they consider it, they are alarmed and look around for a means of recovering themselves. What do they do? Do they at once begin those practices of lowly obedience, which alone can prove them to be Christ's at the last day, such as the government of their tempers, the regulation of their time, self-denying charity, truth-telling sobriety? Far from it. They despise this plain obedience to God as a mere unenlightened morality, as they call it, and they seek for potent stimulants to sustain their minds in that state of excitement which they have been taught to consider the essence of a religious life, and which they cannot produce by means which before excited them. They have recourse to new doctrines, or follow strange teachers, in order that they may dream on in this their artificial devotion, and may avoid that conviction which is likely sooner or later to burst upon them, that emotion and passion are in our power indeed to repress, but not to excite, that there is a limit to the tumults and swellings of the heart, foster them as we will, and when that time comes the poor misused soul is left exhausted and resourceless. Instances are not rare in the world of that fearful ultimate state of hard-heartedness which then succeeds, when the miserable sinner believes indeed as the devils may, yet not even with the devils trembling, but sins on without fear. Others again there are, who, when their feelings fall off in strength and fervency, are led to despond, and so are brought down to fear and bondage, when they might have been rejoicing in cheerful obedience. These are the better sort who, having something of true religious principle in their hearts, still are misled in part, so far, that is, as to rest in their feelings as tests of holiness. Therefore they are distressed and alarmed at their own tranquillity, which they think a bad sign, and, being dispirited, lose time, others outstripping them in the race and others might be mentioned who are led by this same first eagerness and zeal into a different error. The restored sufferer in the text wished to be with Christ. Now it is plain, all those who indulge themselves in the false devotion I have been describing may be said to be desirous of thus keeping themselves in Christ's immediate sight, instead of returning to their own home, as he would have them, that is, to the common duties of life. And they do this, some from weakness of faith, as if he could not bless them and keep them in the way of grace, though they pursued their worldly callings, others from an ill-directed love of him. But there are others, I say, who, when they are awakened to a sense of religion, forthwith despise their former condition altogether as beneath them, and think that they are now called to some high and singular office in the church. These mistake their duty, as those already described, neglect it. They do not waste their time in mere good thoughts and good words, as the others, but they are impetuously led on to wrong acts, and that from the influence of those same strong emotions which they have not learned to use aright 
or direct to their proper end but to speak of these now at any length would be beside my subject to conclude let me repeat and urge upon you my brethren the lesson which i have deduced from the narrative of which the text forms part your saviour calls you from infancy to serve him and has arranged all things well so that his service shall be perfect freedom blessed above all men are they who heard his call then and served him day by day as their strength to obey increased but further are you conscious that you have more or less neglected this gracious opportunity and suffered yourselves to be tormented by satan see he calls you a second time he calls you by your roused affections once and again ere he leave you finally he brings you back for the time as it were to a second youth by the urgent persuasions of excited fear gratitude love and hope he again places you for an instant in that early unformed state of nature when habit and character were not he takes you out of yourselves robbing sin for a season of its indwelling hold upon you let not those visitings pass away as the morning cloud and the early dew surely you must still have occasional compunctions of conscience for your neglect of him your sin stares you in the face your ingratitude to god affects you follow on to know the lord and to secure his favor by acting upon these impulses by them he pleads with you as well as by your conscience they are the instruments of his spirit stirring you up to seek your true peace nor be surprised though you obey them that they die away they have done their office and if they die it is but a blossom changes into the fruit which is far better they must die perhaps you will have to labor in darkness afterwards out of your saviour's sight in the home of your own thoughts surrounded by sights of this world and showing forth his praise among those who are cold-hearted still be quite sure that resolute consistent obedience though unattended with high transport and warm emotion is far more acceptable to him than all those passionate longings to live in his sight which look more like religion to the uninstructed at the very best these latter are but the graceful beginnings of obedience graceful and becoming in children but in grown spiritual men in the chorus as the sports of boyhood would seem in advanced years learn to live by faith which is a calm deliberate rational principle full of peace and comfort and sees christ and rejoices in him though sent away from his presence to labor in the world you will have your reward he will see you again and your heart shall rejoice and your joy no man taketh from you end of sermon nine Sermon 10 of Parochial and Plain Sermons, Volume 1, by John Henry Newman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Sermon 10. Profession Without Practice. When there were gathered together an innumerable multitude of people, insomuch that they trod one upon another, he began to say unto his disciples, first of all, Beware ye of the leaven of the Pharisees which is hypocrisy. Luke 12, 1. Hypocrisy is a serious word. We are accustomed to consider the hypocrite as a hateful, despicable character and an uncommon one. How is it then that our blessed Lord, when surrounded by an innumerable multitude, began, first of all, to warn his disciples against hypocrisy, as though they were in a special danger of becoming like those base deceivers the pharisees thus an instructive subject is opened to our consideration which i will now pursue i say 
we are accustomed to consider the hypocrite as a character of excessive wickedness and a very rare occurrence that hypocrisy is a great wickedness need not be questioned but that it is an uncommon sin is not true as a little examination will show us for what is a hypocrite we are apt to understand by a hypocrite one who makes a profession of religion for secret ends without practicing what he professes who is malevolent covetous or profligate while he assumes an outward sanctity in his words and conduct and who does so deliberately and without remorse deceiving others and not at all self-deceived such a man truly would be a portent for he seems to disbelieve the existence of a god who sees the heart i will not deny that in some ages nay in all ages a few such men have existed but this is not what our saviour seems to have meant by a hypocrite nor were the pharisees such the pharisees it is true said one thing and did another but they were not aware that they were thus inconsistent they deceived themselves as well as others indeed it is not in human nature to deceive others for any long time without in a measure deceiving ourselves also and in most cases we contrive to deceive ourselves as much as we deceive others the pharisees boasting that they were abraham's children not at all understanding not knowing what was implied in the term they were not really included under the blessing given to abraham and they wished the world to believe they were but then they also themselves thought that they were or at least with whatever misgivings they were on the whole per persuaded of it they had deceived themselves as well as the world and therefore our lord sets before them the great and plain truth which simple as it was they had forgotten if ye were abraham's children ye would do the works of abraham this truth i say they had forgotten for doubtless they once knew it there was a time doubtless when in some measure they knew themselves and what they were doing when they began each of them in his turn to deceive the people they were not at the moment self-deceived but by degrees they forgot because they did not care to retain it in their knowledge they forgot that to be blessed like abraham they must be holy like abraham that outward ceremonies avail nothing without inward purity that their thoughts and motives must be heavenly part of their duty they altogether ceased to know another part they might still know indeed but did not value as they ought they became ignorant of their own spiritual condition it did not come home to them that they were supremely influenced by worldly objects that zeal for god's service was but a secondary principle in their conduct and that they loved the praise of men better than god's praise they went on merely talking of religion of heaven and hell the blessed and the reprobate till their discourses became but words of course in their mouths with no true meaning attached to them they either did not read holy scripture at all or read it without earnestness and watchfulness to get at its real sense accordingly they were scrupulously careful of paying tithe even in the least matters of mint anise and cumin while they omitted the weightier matters of the law judgment mercy and faith and on this account our lord calls them blind guides not bold impious deceivers who knew that they were false guides but blind again they were blind in thinking that had they lived in their father's days they would not have killed the prophets as their fathers did they did not know themselves they had unawares deceived themselves as well as the people ignorance of their own ignorance was their punishment and the evidence of their sin if ye were blind 
our Savior says to them, If you were simply blind, and conscious you were so, and distressed at it, ye should have no sin. But now ye say, We see. They did not even know their blindness. Therefore your sin remaineth. This, then, is hypocrisy. Not simply for a man to deceive others, knowing all the while that he is deceiving them, but to deceive himself and others at the same time, to aim at their praise by a religious profession, without perceiving that he loves their praise more than the praise of God, and that he is professing far more than he practices. And if this be the true scripture meaning of the word, we have some insight, as it appears, into the reasons which induced our divine teacher to warn his disciples in so marked a way against hypocrisy. An innumerable multitude was thronging him, and his disciples were around him. Twelve of them had been appointed to minister to him as his especial friends. Other seventy had been sent out from him with miraculous gifts, and on their return had with triumph told of their own wonderful doings. All of them had been addressed by him as the salt of the earth, the light of the world, the children of his kingdom. They were the mediators between him and the people at large, introducing to his notice the sick and heavy laden. And now they stood by him, partaking in his popularity, perhaps glorying in their connection with the Christ, and pleased to be gazed upon by the impatient crowd. Then it was that instead of addressing the multitude, he spoke first of all to his disciples, saying, Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. As if he had said, What is the chief sin of my enemies and persecutors? Not that they openly deny God, but that they love a profession of religion for the sake of the praise of men that follows it. They like to contrast themselves with other men. They pride themselves on being a little flock, to whom life is secured in the midst of reprobates. They like to stand and be admired amid their religious performances, and think to be saved, not by their own personal holiness, but by the faith of their father Abraham. All this delusion may come upon you also, if you forget that you are hereafter to be tried one by one at God's judgment seat according to your works. At present, indeed, you are invested in my greatness, and have the credit of my teaching in holiness. But there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither hid that shall not be known at the last day. This warning against hypocrisy becomes still more needful and impressive from the greatness of the Christian privileges as contrasted with the Jewish. The Pharisees boasted that they were Abraham's children. We have the infinitely higher blessing which fellowship with Christ imparts. In our infancy we have all been gifted with the most awful and glorious titles, as children of God, members of Christ, and heirs of the kingdom of heaven. We have been honored with the grant of spiritual influences which have overshadowed and rested upon us, making our very bodies temples of God. And when we came to years of discretion, we were admitted to the mystery of the heavenly communication of the body and blood of Christ. What is more likely, considering our perverse nature, than that we should neglect the duties while we wish to retain the privileges of our Christian profession? Our Lord has sorrowfully foretold in his parables what was to happen in his church, for instance, when he compared it to a net which gathered of every kind, but was not inspected till the end and then emptied of its various contents, good and bad. Till the day of visitation, the visible church will ever be full of such hypocrites as I have described, who live on under her shadow 
enjoying the name of Christian, and vainly fancying that they will partake its ultimate blessedness. Perhaps, however, it will be granted that there are vast numbers in the Christian world thus professing without adequately practicing, and yet denied that such a case is enough to constitute a hypocrite in the scripture sense of the word, as if a hypocrite were one who professes himself to be what he is not, with some bad motive. It may be urged that the Pharisees had an end in what they did, which careless and formal Christians have not. But consider for a moment, what was the motive which urged the Pharisees to their hypocrisy? Surely that they might be seen of men, have glory of men. This is our Lord's own account of them. Now who will say that the esteem and fear of the world's judgment and the expectation of worldly advantages do not at present most powerfully influence the generality of men in their profession of Christianity, so much so that it is a hard matter, and is thought a great and noble act for men who live in the public world to do what they believe to be their duty to God in a straightforward way, should the opinion of society about it happen to run counter to them. Indeed, there hardly has been a time since the Apostles' Day in which men were more likely than in this age to do their good deeds to be seen of men, to lay out for human praise, and therefore to shape their actions by the world's rule rather than God's will. We ought to be very suspicious, every one of us, of the soundness of our faith and virtue. Let us consider whether we should act as strictly as we now do, were the eyes of our acquaintance and neighbors withdrawn from us. Not that a regard to the opinion of others is a bad motive, in subordination to the fear of God's judgment. It is innocent and allowable and in many cases a duty to admit it, and the opportunity of doing so is a gracious gift given from God to lead us forward in the right way. But when we prefer man's fallible judgment to God's unerring command, then it is we are wrong, and in two ways, both because we prefer it, and because being fallible it will mislead us. And what I am asking you, my brethren, is not whether you merely regard man's opinion of you, which you ought to do, but whether you set it before God's judgment, which you assuredly should not do. And if you do, you are like the Pharisees, so far as to be hypocrites, though you may not go so far as they did in their hollow, self-deceiving ways. 1. That even decently conducted Christians are most extensively and fearfully ruled by the opinion of society about them, instead of living by faith in the unseen God, is proved to my mind by the following circumstance. That according as their rank in life makes men independent of the judgment of others, so the profession of regularity and strictness is given up. There are two classes of men who are withdrawn from the judgment of the community, those who are above it and those who are below it. The poorest class of all, which has no thought of maintaining itself by its own exertions and has lost shame, and what is called, to use a word of this world, high fashionable society, by which I mean not the rich necessarily, but those among the rich and noble who throw themselves out of the pale of the community, break the ties which attach themselves to others, whether above or below themselves, and then live to themselves in each other, their ordinary doings being unseen by the world at large. Now since it happens that these two ranks, the outlaws, as they may be called, of public opinion, are, to speak generally, the most openly and daringly profligate in their conduct, 
how much may be thence inferred about the influence of a mere love of reputation in keeping us all in the right way it is plain as a matter of fact that the great mass of men are protected from gross sin by the forms of society the received laws of propriety and decency the prospect of a loss of character stand as sentinels giving the alarm long before their christian principles have time to act but among the poorest and rudest class on the contrary such artificial safeguards against crime are unknown and observe i say it is among them and that other class i have mentioned that vice and crime are most frequent are we therefore better than they scarcely doubtless their temptations are greater which alone prevents our boasting over them but besides do we not rather gain from the sight of their more scandalous sins a grave lesson and an urgent warning for ourselves a call on us for honest self-examination for we are of the same nature with like passions with them we may be better than they but our mere seeming so is no proof that we are the question is whether in spite of our greater apparent virtue we should not fall like them if the restraint of society were withdrawn that is whether we are not in the main hypocrites like the pharisees professing to honor god while we honor him only so far as men require it of us two another test of being like or unlike the pharisees may be mentioned our lord warns us against hypocrisy in three respects in doing our alms in praying and in fasting when thou dost thine alms do not sound a trumpet before thee as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets that they may have glory of men when thou prayest thou shalt not be as the hypocrites are for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and in the corners of the streets that they may be seen of men when ye fast be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance for they disfigure their faces that they may appear unto men to fast here let us ask ourselves first about our alms whether we be not like the hypocrites doubtless some of our charity must be public for the very mentioning our name encourages others to follow our example still i ask is much of our charity also private is as much private as is public i will not ask whether much more is done in secret than is done before men though this if possible ought to be the case but at least if we think in the first place of our public charities and only in the second of the duty of private almsgiving are we not plainly like the hypocritical pharisees the manner of our prayers will supply us with a still stronger test we are here assembled in worship it is well have we really been praying as well as seeming to pray have our minds been actively employed in trying to form in us the difficult habit of prayer further are we as regular in praying in our closet to our father which is in secret as in public do we feel any great remorse in omitting our morning and evening prayers in saying them hastily and irreverently and yet should not we feel excessive pain and shame and rightly at the thought of having committed any open impropriety in church should we for instance be betrayed into laughter or other light conduct during the service should we not feel most acutely ashamed of ourselves and consider we had disgraced ourselves notwithstanding our habit of altogether forgetting the next moment any sinful carelessness at prayer in our closet is not this to be as the pharisees take again the case of fasting 
Alas, most of us, I fear, do not think at all of fasting. We do not even let it enter our thoughts, nor debate with ourselves whether or not it be needful or suitable for us to fast, or in any way mortify our flesh. Well, this is one neglect of Christ's words. But again, neither do we disfigure our outward appearance to seem to fast, which the Pharisees did. Here we seem to differ from the Pharisees. Yet in truth this very apparent difference is a singular confirmation of our real likeness to them. Austerity gained them credit. It would gain us none. It would gain us little more than mockery from the world. The age is changed. In Christ's time, the show of fasting made men appear saints in the eyes of the many. See then what we do. We keep up the outward show of almsgiving and public worship, observances which, it so happens, the world approves. We have dropped the show of fasting, which, it so happens, the world at the present day derides. Are we quite sure that if fasting were in honor, we should not begin to hold fasts as the Pharisees? Thus we seek the praise of men. But in all this, how are we in any good measure following God's guidance and promises? We see then how seasonable is our Lord's warning to us. His disciples, first of all, to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy, professing without practicing. He warns us against it as leaven, as a subtle, insinuating evil which will silently spread itself throughout the whole character if we suffer it. He warns us, his disciples, lovingly considerate for us, lest we make ourselves a scorn and derision to the profane multitude who throng around and gaze curiously, or malevolently or selfishly at his doings. They seek him, not as adoring him for his miracles' sake, but if so be that they can obtain anything from him, or can please their natural taste while they profess to honor him, and in time of trial they desert him. They make a gain of godliness or a fashion. So he speaks not to them, but to us, his little flock, his church, to whom it has been his Father's good pleasure to give the kingdom. And he bids us take heed of falling, as the Pharisees did before us, and like them coming short of our reward. He warns us that the pretense of religion never deceives beyond a little time, that sooner or later whatsoever we have spoken in darkness shall be heard in the light, and that which we have spoken in the ear in closets shall be proclaimed upon the housetops. Even in this world the discovery is often made. A man is brought into temptation of some sort or other, and having no root in himself falls away, and gives occasion to the enemies of the Lord to blaspheme. Nay, this will happen to him without himself being aware of it, for though a man begins to deceive others before he deceives himself, yet he does not deceive them so long as he deceives himself. Their eyes are at length open to him, while his own continue closed to himself. The world sees through him, detects and triumphs in detecting his low motives and secular plans and artifices, while he is but very faintly sensible of them himself, much less has a notion that others clearly see them. And thus he will go on professing the highest principles and feelings while bad men scorn him and insult true religion in his person. Do not think I am speaking of one or two men when I speak of the scandal which a Christian's inconsistency brings upon his cause. The Christian world, so called, what is it practically, but a witness for Satan rather than a witness for Christ? Rightly understood, doubtless, the very disobedience of Christians witnesses for him 
who will overcome whenever he is judged. But is there any antecedent prejudice against religion so great as that which is occasioned by the lives of its professors? Let us ever remember that all who follow God with but a half heart strengthen the hands of their enemies, give cause of exultation to wicked men, perplex inquirers after truth, and bring reproach upon their Saviour's name. It is a known fact that unbelievers triumphantly maintain that the greater part of the English people is on their side, that the disobedience of professing Christians is a proof that, whatever they say, yet in their hearts they are unbelievers too. This we ourselves perhaps have heard said, and said not in the heat of argument, or as a satire, but in sober earnestness from real and full persuasion that it is true. That is, the men who have cast off their Saviour console themselves with the idea that their neighbours, though too timid and too indolent openly to do so, yet in secret, or at least in their character, do the same. And witnessing this general inconsistency, they despise them as unmanly, cowardly, and slavish, and hate religion as the origin of this debasement of mind. The people who in this country call themselves Christians, says one of these men, with few exceptions are not believers. And every man of sense whose bigotry has not blinded him must see that persons who are evidently devoted to worldly gain or worldly vanities or luxurious enjoyments, though still preserving a little decency, while they pretend to believe the infinitely momentous doctrines of Christianity, are performers in a miserable farce which is beneath contempt. Such are the words of an open enemy of Christ, as though he felt he dared confess his unbelief and despise the mean hypocrisy of those around him. His argument indeed will not endure the trial of God's judgment at the last day, for no one is an unbeliever but by his own fault. But though no excuse for him it is their condemnation. What indeed will they plead before the throne of God when, on the revelation of all hidden deeds, this reviler of religion attributes his unbelief, in a measure, to the sight of their inconsistent conduct? When he mentions this action or that conversation, this violent or worldly conduct, that covetous or unjust transaction, or that self-indulgent life as partly the occasion of his falling away. Woe unto the world, it is written, because of scandals, for it must needs be that scandals come, but woe to the man by whom the scandal cometh. Woe unto the deceiver and self-deceived. His hope shall perish. His hope shall be cut off and his trust shall be a spider's web. He shall lean upon his house, but it shall not stand. He shall hold it fast, but it shall not endure. God give us grace to flee from this woe while we have time. Let us examine ourselves to see if there be any wicked way in us. Let us aim at obtaining some comfortable assurance that we are in the narrow way that leads to life. And let us pray God to enlighten us and to guide us and to give us the will to please him and the power. End of Sermon 10Sermon 11. Profession Without Hypocrisy. As many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Galatians 3.27. It is surely most necessary to beware 
as our Lord solemnly bids us, of the leaven of the Pharisees, which is hypocrisy. We may be infected with it, even though we are not conscious of our insincerity, for they did not know they were hypocrites. Nor need we have any definite bad object plainly before us, for they had none. Only the vague desire to be seen and honored by the world, such as may influence us. So it would seem that there are vast multitudes of pharisaical hypocrites among baptized Christians, that is, men professing without practicing. Nay, so far we may be called hypocritical one and all, for no Christian on earth altogether lives up to his profession. But here someone may ask whether in saying that hypocrisy is professing without practicing, I am not in fact overthrowing all external religion from the foundation, since all creeds and prayers and ordinances go beyond the real belief and frame of mind of even the best Christians. This is even the ground which some men actually take. They say that it is wrong to baptize and call Christians those who have not yet shown themselves to be really such. As many as are baptized into Christ put on Christ, so says the text, and these men argue from it, that till we have actually put on Christ, that is, till we have given our heart to Christ's service, and in our degree become holy as he is holy, it can do no good to be baptized into his name. Rather, it is a great evil, for it is to become hypocrites. Nay, really humble, well-intentioned men feel this about themselves. They shrink from retaining the blessed titles and privileges which Christ gave them in infancy as being unworthy of them, and they fear lest they are really hypocrites like the Pharisees after all their better thoughts and exertions. Now the obvious answer to this mistaken view of religion is to say that, on the showing of such reasoners, no one at all ought to be baptized in any case and called a Christian, for no one acts up to his baptismal profession. No one believes, worships, and obeys duly the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, whose servant he is made in baptism. And yet the Lord did say, Go baptize all nations clearly showing us that a man may be a fit subject for baptism, though he does not in fact practice everything that he professes. And therefore, that any fears we may have, lest men should be in some sense like the Pharisees, must not keep us from making them Christians. But I shall treat the subject more at length, in order that we may understand what kind of disobedience is really hypocrisy, and what is not, lest timid consciences should be frightened. Now men profess without feeling and doing, or are hypocrites, in nothing so much as in their prayers. This is plain. Prayer is the most directly religious of all our duties, and our falling short of our duty is then most clearly displayed. Therefore, I will enlarge upon the case of prayer to explain what I do not mean by hypocrisy. We then use the most solemn words, either without attending to what we are saying, or, even if we do attend, without worthily entering into its meaning. Thus we seem to resemble the Pharisees. A question in consequence arises whether this being the case we should go on repeating prayers which evidently do not suit us. The men I just now spoke of affirm that we ought to leave them off. Accordingly, such persons in their own case first must give up the church prayers and take to others which they think will suit them better. Next, when these disappoint them, they have recourse to what is called extempore prayer and afterwards, perhaps, discontented in turn with this mode of addressing Almighty God, 
and as unable to fix their thoughts as they were before, they come to the conclusion that they ought not to pray, except when specially moved to prayer by the influence of the Holy Spirit. Now, in answer to such a manner of reasoning and acting, I would maintain that no one is to be reckoned a Pharisee or a hypocrite in his prayers who tries not to be one, who aims at knowing and correcting himself, and who is accustomed to pray, though not perfectly, yet not indolently or in a self-satisfied way, however lamentable his actual wanderings of mind may be, or again, however poorly he enters into the meaning of his prayers, even when he attends to them. 1. First take the case of not being attentive to the prayers. Men, it seems, are tempted to leave off prayers because they cannot follow them, because they find their thoughts wander when they repeat them. I answer that to pray attentively is a habit. This must ever be kept in mind. No one begins with having his heart thoroughly in them, but by trying he is enabled to attend more and more, and at length, after many trials and a long schooling of himself, to fix his mind steadily on them. No one, I repeat, begins with being attentive. Novelty in prayers is the cause of persons being attentive in the outset, and novelty is out of the question in the church prayers, for we have heard them from childhood, and knew them by heart long before we could understand them. No one then, when he first turns his thoughts to religion, finds it easy to pray. He is irregular in his religious feelings, he prays more earnestly at some times than at others, his devotional seasons come by fits and starts. He cannot account for his state of mind or reckon upon himself. He frequently finds that he is more disposed for prayer at any time and place than those set apart for the purpose. All this is to be expected, for no habit is formed at once, and before the flame of religion in the heart is purified and strengthened, by long practice and experience, of course, it will be capricious in its motions. It will flare about, so to say, and flicker, and at times seem almost to go out. However, impatient men do not well consider this. They overlook or are offended at the necessity of humble, tedious practice to enable them to pray attentively and they account for their coldness and wanderings of thought in any way but the true one. Sometimes they attribute this inequality in their religious feelings to the arbitrary coming and going of God's Holy Spirit, a most irreverent and presumptuous judgment, which I should not mention, except that men do form it, and therefore it is necessary to state in order to condemn it. Again, sometimes they think that they shall make themselves attentive all at once by bringing before their minds the more sacred doctrines of the gospel, and thus rousing and constraining their souls. This does for a time. But when the novelty is over, they find themselves relapsing into their former inattention without apparently having made any advance and others again, when discontented with their wanderings during prayer, lay the fault on the prayers themselves as being too long. This is a common excuse, and I wish to call your attention to it. If anyone alleges the length of the church prayers as a reason for his not keeping his mind fixed upon them, I would beg him to ask his conscience whether he sincerely believes this to be, at bottom, the real reason of his inattention. Does he think he should attend better if the prayers were shorter? This is the question he has to consider. If he answers that he believes he should attend more closely in that case, then I go on to ask whether he attends more closely, as it is, to the first part of the service than to the last. 
whether his mind is his own, regularly fixed on what he is engaged in for any time in any part of the service. Now, if he is obliged to own that this is not the case, that his thoughts are wandering in all parts of the service, and that even during the confession or the Lord's Prayer, which come first, they are not his own, it is quite clear that it is not the length of the service which is the real cause of his inattention, but his being deficient in the habit of being attentive. If, on the other hand, he answers that he can fix his thoughts for a time and during the early part of the service, I would have him reflect that even this degree of attention was not always his own, that it has been the work of time and practice. And if by trying he has got so far, by trying, he may go on and learn to attend for a still longer time, till at length he is able to keep up his attention through the whole service. However, I wish chiefly to speak to such as are dissatisfied with themselves, and despair of attending properly. Let a man once set his heart upon learning to pray and strive to learn, and no failures he may continue to make in his manner of praying are sufficient to cast him from God's favor. Let him but persevere, not discouraged at his wanderings, not frightened into a notion that he is a hypocrite, not shrinking from the honorable titles which God puts on him. Doubtless, he should be humbled at his own weakness, indolence, and carelessness, and he should feel, he cannot feel too much, the guilt, alas, which he is ever contracting in his prayers by the irreverence of his inattention. Still, he must not leave off his prayers, but go on looking towards Christ his Savior. Let him but be in earnest, striving to master his thoughts, and to be serious, and all the guilt of his incidental failings will be washed away in his Lord's blood. Only let him not be contented with himself. Only let him not neglect to attempt to obey. What a simple rule it is to try to be attentive in order to be so, and yet it is continually overlooked. That is, we do not systematically try. We do not make a point of attempting and attempting over and over again in spite of bad success. We attempt only now and then, and our best devotion is merely when our hearts are excited by some accident which may or may not happen again. So much on inattention to our prayers, which I say should not surprise or frighten us, which does not prove us to be hypocrites unless we acquiesce in it, or oblige us to leave them off, but rather to learn to attend to them. 2. I proceed secondly to remark on the difficulty of entering into the meaning of them, when we do attend to them. Here a tender conscience will ask, How is it possible I can rightly use the solemn words which occur in the prayers? A tender conscience alone speaks thus. Those confident objectors whom I spoke of just now, who maintain that set prayer is necessarily a mere formal service in the generality of instances, a service in which the heart has no part, they are silent here. They do not feel this difficulty, which is the real one. They use the most serious and awful words lightly and without remorse, as if they really entered into the meaning of what is, in truth, beyond the intelligence of angels. But the humble and contrite believer, coming to Christ for pardon and help, perceives the great strait he is in, in having to address the God of heaven. This perplexity of mind it was which led convinced sinners in former times to seek refuge in beings short of God, not as denying God's supremacy or shunning Him, but discerning the vast distance between themselves and Him, 
and seeking some resting places by the way, some Zoar, some little city near to flee unto, because of the height of God's mountain, up which the way of escape lay. And then, gradually becoming devoted to those whom they trusted, saints, angels, or good men living and copying them, their faith had a fall, and their virtue trailed upon the ground for want of props to rear it heavenward. We Christians, sinners though we be like other men, are not allowed thus to debase our nature or to defraud ourselves of God's mercy. And though it be very terrible to speak to the living God, yet speak we must or die. Tell our sorrows we must or there is no hope. For created mediators and patrons are forbidden us, and to trust in an arm of flesh is made a sin. Therefore let a man reflect, whoever from tenderness of conscience shuns the church as above him, whether he shuns her services or her sacraments, that awful as it is to approach Christ, to speak to him, to eat his flesh and drink his blood, and to live in him, to whom shall he go? See what it comes to. Christ is the only way of salvation open to sinners. Truly we are children, and cannot suitably feel the words which the church teaches us, though we say them after her, nor feel duly reverent at God's presence. Yet let us but know our own ignorance and weakness, and we are safe. God accepts those who thus come in faith, bringing nothing as their offering, but a confession of sin, and this is the highest excellence to which we ordinarily attain, to understand our own hypocrisy, insincerity, and shallowness of mind, to own while we pray that we cannot pray aright, to repent of our repentings, and to submit ourselves wholly to his judgment, who could indeed be extreme with us, but has already shown his loving kindness in bidding us to pray. And while we thus conduct ourselves, we must learn to feel that God knows all this before we say it, and far better than we do. He does not need to be informed of our extreme worthlessness. We must pray in the spirit and the temper of the extremest abasement, but we need not search for adequate words to express this, for in truth no words are bad enough for our case. Some men are dissatisfied with the confessions of sin we make in church as not being strong enough, but none can be strong enough. Let us be satisfied with sober words which have been ever in use. It will be a great thing if we enter into them. No need of searching for impassioned words to express our repentance, when we do not rightly enter even into the most ordinary expressions. Therefore, when we pray, let us not be as the hypocrites making a show, nor use vain repetitions with the heathen. Let us compose ourselves, and kneel down quietly as to a work far above us, preparing our minds for our own imperfection in prayer, meekly repeating the wonderful words of the church our teacher, and desiring with the angels to look into them. When we call God our Father Almighty, or own ourselves miserable offenders, and beg him to spare us, let us recollect that though we are using a strange language, Yet Christ is pleading for us in the same words, with full understanding of them, and availing power, and that though we know not what we should pray for as we ought, yet the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with plaints unutterable. Thus feeling God to be around us and in us, and therefore keeping ourselves still and collected, we shall serve him acceptably, with reverence and godly fear, and we shall take back with us to our common employments the assurance 
that he is still gracious to us in spite of our sins not willing we should perish desirous of our perfection and ready to form us day by day after the fashion of that divine image which in baptism was outwardly stamped upon us i have spoken only of our prayers and but referred to our general profession of christianity it is plain however what has been said about praying may be applied to all we do and say as christians it is true that we profess to be saints to be guided by the highest principles and to be ruled by the spirit of god we have long ago promised to believe and obey it is also true that we cannot do these things aright nay even with god's help such is our sinful weakness still we fall short of our duty nevertheless we must not cease to profess we must not put off from us the wedding garment which christ gave us in baptism we may still rejoice in him without being hypocrites that is if we labor day by day to make that wedding garment our own to fix it on us and so incorporate it with our very selves that death which strips us of all things may be unable to tear it from us though as yet it be in great measure but an outward garb covering our own nakedness i conclude by reminding you how great god's mercy is in thus allowing us to clothe ourselves in the glory of christ from the first even before we are worthy of it i suppose there is nothing so distressing to a true christian as to have to prove himself such to others both as being conscious of his own numberless failings and from his dislike of display now christ has anticipated the difficulties of his modesty he does not allow such an one to speak for himself he speaks for him he introduces each of us to his brethren not as we are in ourselves fit to be despised and rejected on account of the temptations which are in our flesh but as messengers of god even as christ jesus it is our happiness that we need bring nothing in proof of our fellowship with christians besides our baptism this is what a great many persons do not understand they think that none are to be accounted fellow christians but those who evidence themselves to be such to their fallible understandings and hence they encourage others who wish for their praise to practice all kinds of display as a seal of their regeneration who can tell the harm this does to the true modesty of the christian spirit instead of using the words of the church and speaking to god men are led to use their own words and make man their judge and justifier they think it necessary to tell out their secret feelings and to enlarge on what god has done to their own souls in particular and thus making themselves really answerable for all the words they use which is altogether their own they do in this case become hypocrites they do say more than they can in reality feel of course a religious man will naturally and unawares out of the very fullness of his heart show his deep feeling and his conscientiousness to his near friends but when to do so is made a matter of necessity an object to be aimed at and is an intentional act then it is that hypocrisy must more or less sully our faith as many of you as have been baptized into christ have put on christ this is the apostle's decision there is neither jew nor greek there is neither bond nor free there is neither male nor female for ye are all one in christ jesus the church follows this rule and bidding us keep quiet speaks for us robes us from head to foot in the garments of righteousness and exhorts us to live henceforth to god but the disputer of this world reverses this procedure 
He strips off all our privileges, bids us renounce our dependence on the Mother of Saints, tells us we must each be a church to himself, and must show himself to the world to be by himself and in himself the elect of God, in order to prove his right to the privileges of a Christian. Far be it from us thus to fight against God's gracious purposes to man, and to make the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. Let us acknowledge all to be Christians who have not by open word or deed renounced their fellowship with us, and let us try to lead them on into all truth. And for ourselves, let us endeavor to enter more and more fully into the meaning of our prayers and professions. Let us humble ourselves for the very little we do and the poor advance we make. Let us avoid unnecessary display of religion. Let us do our duty in that state of life to which God has called us. Thus proceeding, we shall, through God's grace, form within us the glorious mind of Christ. Whether rich or poor, learned or unlearned, walking by this rule, we shall become at length true saints, sons of God. We shall be upright and perfect, lights in the world, the image of him who died, that we might be conformed to his likeness. End of Sermon 11《ซอร์มันทวีลเดอะพาร์โรคิโอแอนด์เพลนส์ซอร์มันส์วอลยูมวันบายจอห์นเฮนรีนูแมนนี่ลิเบอร์วักซ์รีคอร์ดิ้งอยู่ในสื่อสาธารณะทั่วโลกซอร์มันทวีลพระเฟชชั่นไม่ขัดอัสตินทัชชันยีอาร์ดิลไลท์ของโลกแห่งนี้ที่ถูกสร้างบนพื้นฐานไม่สามารถถูกปิดมาทิวส์5ข้อ14 Our Savior gives us a command in this passage of His Sermon on the Mount to manifest our religious profession before all men. Ye are the light of the world, He says to His disciples. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel, but on a candlestick, and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Let your light so shine before men, that they may see your good works, and glorify your Father which is in heaven. Yet presently he says, When thou doest alms, when thou prayest, when ye fast, appear not unto men, but unto thy Father which is in secret. How are these commands to be reconciled? How are we? At once to profess ourselves Christians, and yet hide our Christian words, deeds, and self-denials. I will now attempt to answer this question, that is, to explain how we may be witnesses to the world for God, and yet without pretension or affectation, or rude and indecent ostentation. One. Now. First, much might be said on that mode of witnessing Christ, which consists in conforming to His Church. He who simply did what the Church bids him do, if he did no more, would witness a good confession to the world, and one which cannot be hid, and at the same time with very little, if any, personal display. He does only what he is told to do. He takes no responsibility on himself. The apostles and martyrs who founded the church, the saints in all ages who have adorned it, the heads of it now alive, all these take from him the weight of his profession, and bear the blame, so to call it, of seeming ostentations. I do not say that irreligious men will not call such a one boastful, or austere. Or, a hypocrite. That is not the question. The question is whether, in God's judgment, he deserves the censure, whether he is not as Christ would have him, really and truly, whatever the world may say, 
joining humility to a bold outward profession, whether he is not, in thus acting, preaching Christ without hurting his own pureness, gentleness, and modesty of character. If indeed a man stands forth on his own ground, declaring himself as an individual, a witness for Christ, then indeed he is grieving and disturbing the calm spirit given us by God. But God's merciful providence has saved us this temptation and forbidden us to admit it. He bids us unite together in one and to shelter our personal profession under the authority of the general body. Thus, while we show ourselves as lights to the world, far more effectively than if we glimmered separately in the lone wilderness without communication with others. At the same time we do so with far greater secrecy and humility. Therefore it is that the Church does so many things for us, appoints fasts and feasts, times of public prayer, the order of the sacraments, the services of devotion at marriages and deaths, and all accompanied by a fixed form of sound words, in order, I say, to remove from us individually the burden of a high profession, of implying great things of ourselves by inventing for ourselves solemn prayers and praises, a task far above the generality of Christians, to say the least, a task which humble men will shrink from, lest they prove hypocrites, and which will hurt those who do undertake it by making them rude-spirited and profane. I am desirous of speaking on this subject as a matter of practice, for I am sure that if we wish really and, in fact, to spread the knowledge of the truth, we shall do so far more powerfully as well as purely by keeping together than by witnessing one by one. Men are to be seen adopting all kinds of strange ways of giving glory, as they think, to God. If they would but follow the church, come together in prayer on Sundays and saints' days, nay, every day, honor the rubric by keeping to it obediently, and conforming their families to the spirit of the prayer book, I say that on the whole they would practically do vastly more good than by trying new religious plans, founding new religious societies, or striking out new religious views. I put out of account the greater blessing they might expect to find in the way of duty, which is the first consideration. 2. One way of professing without display has been mentioned obeying the church. Now, in the next place, consider how great a profession, and yet a profession how unconscious and modest, arises from the mere ordinary manner in which any strict Christian lives. Let this thought be a satisfaction to uneasy minds, which fear lest they are not confessing Christ, yet dread to display. Your life displays Christ without your intending it. You cannot help it. Your words and deeds will show, on the long run, as it is said, where your treasure is and your heart. Out of the abundance of your heart your mouth speaketh words seasoned with salt. We sometimes find men who aim at doing their duty in the common course of life, surprised to hear that they are ridiculed and called hard names by careless or worldly persons. This is as it should be. It is as it should be that they are surprised at it. If a private Christian sets out with expecting to make a disturbance in the world, the fear is lest he be not so humble-minded as he should be. But those who go on quietly in the way of obedience and yet are detected by the keen eye of the jealous, self-condemning, yet proud world, and who, on discovering their situation, first shrink from it, 
and are distressed, then look to see if they have done aught wrongly, and after all are sorry for it, and but slowly and very timidly, if at all, learn to rejoice in it, these are Christ's flock. These are they who follow him who was meek and lowly of heart, his elect, in whom he sees his own image reflected. Consider how such men show forth their light in a wicked world, yet unconsciously. Moses came down from the mount, and wist not that the skin of his face shone, as one who had held intercourse with God. And, when Aaron and all the children of Israel saw Moses, behold, the skin of his face shone, and they were afraid to come nigh him. Who can estimate the power of our separate words spoken in season? How many of them are recollected and cherished by this person or that, which we have forgotten, and bear fruit? How do our good deeds excite others to rivalry in a good cause, as the angels perceive, though we do not? How are men thinking of us we never heard of, or saw but once, and in far countries unknown? Let us for a moment view this pleasing side of our doings, as well as the sad prospect of our evil communications. Doubtless our prayers and alms are rising as a sweet sacrifice, pleasing to God, and pleasing to Him not only as an office of devotion, but of charity towards all men. Our businesses and our amusements, our joys and our sorrows, our opinions, tastes, studies, views, and principles are drawn one way heavenward. Be we high or low, in our place we can serve, and in consequence glorify him who died for us. A little maid, who was brought away captive out of the land of Israel, and waited on Naaman's wife, pointed out to the great captain of the host of the king of Syria the means of recovery from his leprosy, and his servants spoke good words to him afterwards, and brought him back to his reason when he would have rejected the mode of cure which the prophet prescribed. This may quiet impatient minds, and console the overscrupulous conscience. Wait on God, and be doing good. And you must. You cannot but be showing your light before men as a city set on a hill. 3. Still it is quite true that there are circumstances under which a Christian is bound openly to express his opinion on religious subjects and matters. And this is the real difficulty, that is, how to do so without display. As a man's place in society is here or there, so it is more or less his duty to speak his mind freely. We must never countenance sin and error. Now the more obvious and modest way of discountenancing evil is by silence and by separating from it. For example, we are bound to keep aloof from deliberate and open sinners. St. Paul expressly tells us not to keep company if any man that is called a brother, that is a Christian, be a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner. With such an one, no, not to eat." and St. John gives us the like advice with respect to heretics. If there come any unto you, and bring not this doctrine, that is, the true doctrine of Christ, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God speed, for he that biddeth him God speed is partaker of his evil deeds. It is plain that such conduct on our part requires no great display, for it is but conforming to the rules of the church, though it is often difficult to know on what occasions we ought to adopt it, which is another question. 
A more difficult duty is that of passing judgment, as a Christian is often bound to do, on events of the day and public men. It becomes his duty, in proportion as he has station and influence in the community, in order that he may persuade others to think as he does. Above all, clergymen are bound to form and pronounce an opinion. It is sometimes said, in familiar language, that a clergyman should have nothing to do with politics. This is true, if it be meant that he should not aim at secular objects, should not side with a political party as such, should not be ambitious of popular applause or the favor of great men, should not take pleasure and lose time in business of this world, should not be covetous. But if it means that he should not express an opinion and exert an influence one way rather than another, it is plainly unscriptural. Did not the apostles, with all their reverence for the temporal power, whether Jewish or Roman, and all their separation from worldly ambitions, did they not still denounce their rulers as wicked men who had crucified and slain the Lord's Christ? And would they have been as a city on a hill if they had not done so? If, indeed, this world's concerns could be altogether disjoined from those of Christ's kingdom, then indeed all Christians, laymen as well as clergy, should abstain from the thought of temporal affairs and let the worthless world pass down the stream of events till it perishes. But if, as is the case, what happens in nations must affect the cause of religion in those nations, since the church may be seduced and corrupted by the world, and in the world there are myriads of souls to be converted and saved, and since a Christian nation is bound to become part of the church, Therefore it is our duty to stand as a beacon on a hill, to cry aloud and spare not, to lift up our voice like a trumpet and show the people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. And all this may be done without injury to our Christian gentleness and humbleness, though it is difficult to do it. We need not be angry nor use contentious words, and yet may firmly give our opinion, in proportion as we have the means of forming one, and be zealous towards God in all active good service, and scrupulously and pointedly keep aloof from the bad men whose evil arts we fear. Another and still more difficult duty is that of personally rebuking those we meet with in the intercourse of life, who sin in word or deed, and testifying before them in Christ's name. That is, it is difficult at once to be unassuming and zealous in such cases. We know it is a plain and repeated precept of Christ to tell others of their faults for charity's sake. But how is this to be done without seeming, nay, without being arrogant and severe? There are persons who are anxious to do their duty to the full, who fear that they are deficient in this particular branch of it, and deficient from a blamable backwardness and the dread of giving offense. Yet, on the other hand, they feel the painfulness of rebuking another, and, to use a common word, the awkwardness of it. Such persons must consider that though to rebuke is a duty, it is not a duty belonging at once to all men, and the perplexity which is felt about it often arises from the very impropriety of attempting it in the particular case. It is improper, as a general rule, in the young to witness before the old, otherwise than by their silence. Still more improper is it in inferiors to rebuke their superiors. For instance, a child his parent, of course, or a private person his natural and divinely appointed governor. When we assume a character not suited to us, of course we feel awkward, 
and although we may have done so in honesty and zeal, however ill-tutored, and so God may in mercy accept our service, still he, at the same time, rebukes us by our very feeling of perplexity and shame. As for such as rudely blame another, and that a superior, and feel no pain at doing so, I have nothing to say to such men except to express my earnest desire that they may be led into a more Christian frame of mind. They do not even feel the difficulty of witnessing for God without display. It is to be considered, too, that to do the part of a witness for the truth, to warn and rebuke, is not an elementary duty of a Christian. I mean that our duties come in a certain order, some before others, and that this is not one of the first of them. Our first duties are to repent and believe. It would be strange indeed for a man who had just begun to think of religion, to set up for some great one, to assume he was a saint and a witness, and to exhort others to turn to God. This is evident. But as time goes on and his religious character becomes formed, then while he goes on to perfection in all his duties, he takes upon him in the number of these to witness for God by word of mouth. It is difficult to say when a man has leave openly to rebuke others, certainly not before he has considerable humility, the test of which may be the absence of a feeling of triumph in doing so, a consciousness that he is no better by nature than the person he witnesses before, and that his actual sins are such as to deserve it a severe rebuke were they known to the world a love towards the person reproved, and a willingness to submit to deserved censure in his turn. In all this I am speaking of laymen. It is a clergyman's duty to rebuke by virtue of his office, and then, after all, supposing it to be clearly our duty to manifest our religious profession in this pointed way before another, in order to do so modestly, we must do so kindly and cheerfully, as gently as we can, doing it as little as we can help, not making matters worse than they are, or showing our whole Christian stature, or what we think to be such, when we need but put out a hand, so to say, or give a glance. And above all, as I have already said, acting as if we thought, nay, really thinking, that it may be the offender's turn some day to rebuke us, not putting ourselves above him, feeling our great imperfections, and desirous he should rebuke us, should occasion require it, and in prospect thanking him, acting, that is, in a spirit in which you warn a man in walking against rugged ground, which may cause him a fall thinking him bound by your friendly conduct to do the like favor to you. As to grave occasions of witnessing Christ, they will seldom occur except a man thrust himself into society where he never ought to have been by neglecting the rule, Come ye out and be separate. And then he has scarcely the right to rebuke, having committed the first fault himself. This is another cause of our perplexity in witnessing Christ before the world. We make friends of the sinful, and then they have the advantage over us. To conclude, the question is often raised whether a man can do his duty simply and quietly without being thought ostentatious by the world. It is no great matter to himself whether he is thought so or not, if he has not provoked the opinion. As a general rule, I would say the church itself is always hated and calumniated by the world as being in duty bound to make a bold profession. But whether individual members of the church are so treated depends on various circumstances in the case of each. There are persons who, though very strict and conscientious Christians, 
are yet praised by the world. These are such as, having great meekness and humility, are not so prominent in station or so practically connected with the world as to offend it. Men admire religion, while they can gaze on it as a picture. They think it lovely in books, and as long as they can look upon Christians at a distance, they speak well of them. The Jews in Christ's time built the sepulchres of the prophets whom their fathers killed, then they themselves killed the just one. They reverenced the Son of God before he came, but when their passions and interests were stirred by his coming, then they said, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him, and the inheritance shall be ours. Thus Christians in active life, thwarting, as they do, the pride and selfishness of the world, are disliked by the world, and have all manner of evil said against them falsely for Christ's sake. Still, even under these circumstances, though they must not shrink from the attack on a personal account, it is still their duty to shelter themselves as far as they can under the name and authority of the Holy Church, to keep to its ordinances and rules, and if they are called to suffer for the Church, rather to be drawn forward to the suffering in the common course of duty than boldly to take upon them the task of defending it. There is no cowardice in this. Some men are placed in posts of danger, and to these danger comes in the way of duty, but others must not intrude into their honorable office. Thus, in the first age of the gospel, our Lord told his followers to flee from city to city when persecuted, and even the heads of the church in the early persecutions, instead of exposing themselves to the fury of the heathen, did their utmost to avoid it. We are a suffering people from the first, but while, on the one hand, we do not defend ourselves illegally, we do not court suffering on the other. We must witness and glorify God as lights on a hill, through evil report and good report. But the evil and the good report is not so much of our own making as the natural consequence of our Christian profession. Who can tell God's will concerning this tumultuous world, or how he will dispose of it? He is tossing it hither and thither in his fury, and, in its agitation, he troubles his own people also. Only this we know for our comfort. Our light shall never go down. Christ set it up on a hill, and hell shall not prevail against it. The church will witness on to the last for the truth, chained indeed to this world, its evil partner, but ever foretelling its ruin, though not believed, and in the end promised a far different recompense. For in the end the Lord Omnipotent shall reign, when the marriage of the Lamb shall come at length, and his wife shall make herself ready and to her shall be granted fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. True and righteous are his judgments. He shall cast death and hell into the lake of fire, and avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him. Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. May all we be in the number, confessing Christ in this world, that he may confess us before his Father in the last day. End of Sermon 12「Sermon 13 of Parochial and Plain Sermons, Volume 1 by John Henry Newman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Sermon 13. Promising Without Doing A certain man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not. But afterward he repented, 
and went. And he came to the second and said likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir, and went not. Matthew twenty one twenty eight to 30 Our religious professions are at a far greater distance from our acting upon them than we ourselves are aware. We know generally that it is our duty to serve God, and we resolve we will do so faithfully. We are sincere in thus generally desiring and purposing to be obedient, and we think we are in earnest. Yet we go away, and presently, without any struggle of mind or apparent change of purpose, almost without knowing ourselves what we do, we go away and do the very contrary to the resolution we have expressed. This inconsistency is exposed by our blessed Lord in the second part of the parable which I have taken from my text. You will observe that in the case of the first son, who said he would not go work, and yet did go, it is said afterward he repented. He underwent a positive change of purpose. But in the case of the second, it is merely said he answered, I go, sir, and went not. For here there was no revolution of sentiment, nothing deliberate. He merely acted according to his habitual frame of mind. He did not go work, because it was contrary to his general character to work. Only he did not know this. He said, I go, sir, sincerely and from the feeling of the moment. But when the words were out of his mouth, then they were forgotten. It was like the wind blowing against a stream which seems for a moment to change its course in consequence, but in fact flows down as before. To this subject I shall now call your attention, as drawn from the latter part of this parable, passing over the case of the repentant son, which would form a distinct subject in itself. He answered and said, I go, sir, and went not. We promise to serve God, we do not perform, and that not from deliberate faithlessness in the particular case, but because it is our nature, our way, not to obey. And we do not know this. We do not know ourselves or what we are promising. I will give several instances of this kind of weakness. 1. For instance, that of mistaking good feelings for real religious principle. Consider how often this takes place. It is the case with the young necessarily, who have not been exposed to temptation. They have, we will say, been brought up religiously. They wish to be religious, and so are objects of our love and interest, but they think themselves far more religious than they really are. They suppose they hate sin, and understand the truth, and can resist the world, when they hardly know the meaning of the words they use. Again, how often is a man incited by circumstances to utter a virtuous wish or propose a generous or valiant deed, and perhaps applauds himself for his own good feeling, and has no suspicion that he is not able to act upon it. In truth, he does not understand where the real difficulty of his duty lies. He thinks that the characteristic of a religious man is his having correct notions. It escapes him that there is a great interval between feeling and acting. He takes it for granted he can do what he wishes. He knows he is a free agent, and can on the whole do what he will, but he is not conscious of the load of corrupt nature and sinful habits which hang upon his will, and clog it in each particular exercise of it. He has borne these so long that he is insensible to their existence, he knows that in little things where passion and inclination are excluded, he can perform as soon as he resolves. Should he meet in his walk two paths, to the right and left, he is sure he can take 
which he will at once, without any difficulty, and he fancies that obedience to God is not much more difficult than to turn to the right instead of the left. 2. One especial case of this self-deception is seen in delaying repentance. A man says to himself, Of course, if the worst comes to the worst, if illness comes, or at least old age, I can repent. I do not speak of the dreadful presumption of such a mode of quieting conscience, though many persons really use it who do not speak the words out or are aware that they act upon it, but merely of the ignorance it evidences concerning our moral condition and our power of willing and doing. If men can repent, why do they not do so at once? They answer that they intend to do so hereafter. That is, they do not repent because they can. Such is their argument. Whereas the very fact that they do not now should make them suspect that there is a greater difference between intending and doing than they know of. So very difficult is obedience. So hardly one is every step in our Christian course, so sluggish and inert our corrupt nature, that I would have a man disbelieve he can do one jot or tittle beyond what he has already done. Refrain from borrowing aught on the hope of the future, however good a security for it he seems to be able to show, and never take his good feelings and wishes in pledge for one single untried deed. Nothing but past acts are the vouchers for future. Past sacrifices, past labors, past victories over yourselves, these, my brethren, are the tokens of the like in store, and doubtless of greater in store. For the path of the just is as the shining growing light. But trust nothing short of these. Deeds, not words and wishes, this must be the watchword for your welfare and the ground of your assurance. But if you have done nothing firm and manly hitherto, if you are as yet the coward slave of Satan, and the poor creature of your lusts and passions, never suppose you will one day rouse yourselves from your indolence. Alas, there are men who walk the road to hell, always the while looking back at heaven, and trembling as they pace forwards towards their place of doom. They hasten on as under a spell, shrinking from the consequences of their own deliberate doings. Such was Balaam. What would he have given if words and feelings might have passed for deeds? See how religious he was so far as profession goes. How did he revere God in speech? How piously express a desire to die the death of the righteous? Yet he died in battle among God's enemies. Not suddenly overcome by temptation, only, on the other hand, not suddenly turned to God by his good thoughts and fair purposes. But in this respect the power of sin differs from any literal spell or fascination, that we are, after all, willing slaves of it, and shall answer for following it, if our iniquities, like the wind, take us away. Yet we can help this. Nor is it only among beginners in religious obedience that there is this great interval between promising and performing. We can never answer how we shall act under new circumstances. A very little knowledge of life and of our own hearts will teach us this. Men whom we meet in the world turn out in the course of their trial so differently from what their former conduct promised. They view things so differently before they were tempted and after that we who see and wonder at it have abundant cause to look to ourselves, not to be high-minded, but to fear. 
even the most matured saints, those who imbibed in largest measure the power and fullness of Christ's Spirit, and worked righteousness most diligently in their day, could they have been thoroughly scanned even by man, would, I am persuaded, have exhibited inconsistencies, such as to surprise and shock their most ardent disciples. After all, one good deed is scarcely the pledge of another, though I just now said it was. The best men are uncertain. They are great, and they are little again. They stand firm, and then fall. Such is human virtue, reminding us to call no one master on earth, but to look up to our sinless and perfect Lord, reminding us to humble ourselves, each within himself, and to reflect what we must appear to God, if even to ourselves and each other we seem so base and worthless, and showing clearly that all who are saved, even the least inconsistent of us, can be saved only by faith, not by works. 3. Here I am reminded of another plausible form of the same error. It is a mistake concerning what is meant by faith. We know Scripture tells us that God accepts those who have faith in Him. Now the question is, what is faith, and how can a man tell that he has faith? Some persons answer at once and without hesitation that to have faith is to feel oneself to be nothing and God everything. It is to be convinced of sin, to be conscious one cannot save oneself, and to wish to be saved by Christ our Lord, and that it is, moreover, to have the love of Him warm in one's heart, and to rejoice in Him, to desire His glory, and to resolve to live to Him and not to the world. But I will answer, with all due seriousness, as speaking on a serious subject, that this is not faith. Not that it is not necessary, it is very necessary, to be convinced that we are laden with infirmity and sin, and without health in us, and to look for salvation solely to Christ's blessed sacrifice on the cross. And we may well be thankful if we are thus minded, but that a man may feel all this that I have described vividly, and still not yet possess one particle of true religious faith. Why? Because there is an immeasurable distance between feeling right and doing right. A man may have all these good thoughts and emotions, yet, if he has not yet hazarded them to the experiment of practice, he cannot promise himself that he has any sound and permanent principle at all. If he has not yet acted upon them, we have no voucher, barely on account of them, to believe that they are anything but words. Though a man spoke like an angel, I would not believe him on the mere ground of his speaking. Nay, till he acts upon them, he has not even evidence to himself that he has true living faith. Dead faith, as St. James says, profits no man. Of course, the devils have it. What, on the other hand, is living faith? Do fervent thoughts make faith living? St. James tells us otherwise. He tells us works, deeds of obedience, are the life of faith. As the body without the spirit is dead, so faith without works is dead also. So that those who think they really believe because they have in word and thought surrendered themselves to God are much too hasty in their judgment. They have done something, indeed, but not at all the most difficult part of their duty, which is to surrender themselves to God, indeed, and act. They have as yet done nothing to show. They will not, after saying, I go, the next moment go not. Nothing to show they will not act the part of the self-deceiving disciple who said, Though I die with thee, I will not deny thee, yet straightway went and denied Christ thrice.
as far as we know anything of the matter, justifying faith has no existence independent of its particular definite acts. It may be described to be the temper under which men obey, the humble and earnest desire to please Christ which causes and attends on actual services, he who does one little deed of obedience, whether he denies himself some comfort to relieve the sick and needy, or curbs his temper, or forgives an enemy, or asks forgiveness for an offense committed by him, or resists the clamor or ridicule of the world, such an one, as far as we are given to judge, evinces more true faith than could be shown by the most fluent religious conversation, the most intimate knowledge of Scripture doctrine, or the most remarkable agitation and change of religious sentiments. Yet how many are there who sit still with folded hands, dreaming, doing nothing at all, thinking they have done everything or need do nothing, when they merely have had these good thoughts, which will save no one. My object has been, as far as a few words can do it, to lead you to some true notion of the depths and deceitfulness of the heart, which we do not really know. It is easy to speak of human nature as corrupt in the general, to admit it in the general, and then get quit of the subject, as if the doctrine being once admitted, there was nothing more to be done with it. But in truth, we can have no real apprehension of the doctrine of our corruption, till we view the structure of our minds part by part, and dwell upon and draw out the signs of our weakness, inconsistency, and ungodliness, which are such as can arise from nothing else than some strange original defect in our moral nature. 1. Now it will be well if such self-examination as I have suggested leads us to the habit of constant dependence upon the unseen God, in whom we live and move and have our being. We are in the dark about ourselves. When we act we are groping in the dark and may meet with a fall any moment. Here and there perhaps we see a little, or in our attempts to influence and move our minds, we are making experiments, as it were, with some delicate and dangerous instrument which works we do not know how and may produce unexpected and disastrous effects. The management of our hearts is quite above us. Under these circumstances, it becomes our comfort to look up to God. Thou, God, seest me. Such was the consolation of the forlorn Hagar in the wilderness. He knoweth whereof we are made, and he alone can uphold us. He sees with most appalling distinctness all our sins, all the windings and recesses of evil within us. Yet it is our only comfort to know this, and to trust him for help against ourselves. To those who have a right notion of their weakness, the thought of their almighty sanctifier and guide is continually present. They believe in the necessity of a spiritual influence to change and strengthen them, not as a mere abstract doctrine, but as a practical and most consolatory truth daily to be fulfilled in their warfare with sin and Satan. 2. And this conviction of our excessive weakness must further lead us to try ourselves continually in little things, in order to prove our own earnestness, ever to be suspicious of ourselves, and not only to refrain from promising much, but actually to put ourselves to the test in order to keep ourselves wakeful. A sober mind never enjoys God's blessings to the full. It draws back and refuses a portion to show its command over itself. It denies itself in trivial circumstances, even if nothing is gained by denying, but an evidence of its own sincerity. It makes trial of its own professions, and if it has been tempted to say anything noble and great, or to blame another for sloth or cowardice, 
it takes itself at its word and resolves to make some sacrifice, if possible, in little things, as a price for the indulgence of fine speaking, or as a penalty on its censoriousness. Much would be gained if we adopted this rule even in our professions of friendship and service one towards another, and never said a thing which we were not willing to do. There is only one place where the Christian allows himself to profess openly, and that is in church. Here, under the guidance of apostles and prophets, he says many things boldly, as speaking after them, and as before him who searcheth the reins. There can be no harm in professing much directly to God, because while we speak, we know he sees through our professions, and takes them for what they really are, prayers. How much, for instance, do we profess when we say the creed, and in the collects we put on the full character of a Christian? We desire and seek the best gifts and declare our strong purpose to serve God with our whole hearts. By doing this, we remind ourselves of our duty, and withal we humble ourselves by the taunt so to call it, of putting upon our dwindled and unhealthy forms those ample and glorious garments which befit the upright and full-grown believer. Lastly, we see from the parable what is the course and character of human obedience on the whole. There are two sides of it. I have taken the darker side, the case of profession without practice, of saying, I go, sir, and of not going. But what is the brighter side? Nothing better than to say, I go not, and to repent and go. The more common condition of men is not to know their inability to serve God, and readily to answer for themselves. And so they quietly pass through life as if they had nothing to fear. Their best estate, what is it, but to rise more or less in rebellion against God, to resist his commandments and ordinances, and then poorly to make up for the mischief they have done by repenting and obeying. Alas, to be alive as a Christian is nothing better than to struggle against sin, to disobey and repent. There has been but one amongst the sons of men, who has said and done consistently, who said, I come to do thy will, O God, and without delay or hindrance did it. He came to show us what human nature might become if carried on to its perfection. Thus he teaches us to think highly of our nature as viewed in him, not as some do, to speak evil of our nature and exalt ourselves personally, but while we acknowledge our own distance from heaven, to view our nature as renewed in him, as glorious and wonderful beyond our thoughts. Thus he teaches us to be hopeful and encourages us while conscience abases us. Angels seem little in honor and dignity compared with that nature which the eternal word has purified by his own union with it. Henceforth we dare aspire to enter into the heaven of heavens and to live forever in God's presence, because the first fruits of our race is already there in the person of his only begotten Son. End of Sermon 13《ซ e r m o n 14 of Parochial and Plain Sermons, Volume 1 by John Henry Newman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain.《 Sermon 14 Religious Emotion But he spake the more vehemently, If I should die with thee, I will not deny thee in any wise. Mark 14 31 
It is not my intention to make St. Peter's Fall the direct subject of our consideration today, though I have taken this text, but to suggest to you an important truth, which that fall, together with other events at the same season, especially enforces, that is, that violent impulse is not the same as firm determination, that men may have their religious feelings roused without being on that account at all the more likely to obey God in practice, rather, the less likely. This important truth is in various ways brought before our minds at the season sacred to the memory of Christ's betrayal and death. The contrast displayed in the Gospels between his behavior on the one hand, as the time of his crucifixion drew near, and that both of his disciples and of the Jewish populace on the other, is full of instruction, if we will receive it. He, steadily fixing his face to endure those sufferings which were the atonement for our sins, yet without aught of mental excitement or agitation, his disciples and the Jewish multitude, first protesting their devotion to him in vehement language, then the one deserting him, the other even clamoring for his crucifixion. He entered Jerusalem in triumph, the multitude cutting down branches of palm trees and strewing them in the way, as in honor of a king and conqueror. He had lately raised Lazarus from the dead, and so great a miracle had given him great temporary favor with the populace. Multitudes flocked to Bethany to see him and Lazarus, and when he set out for Jerusalem, where he was to suffer, they, little thinking that they would soon cry, Crucify him, went out to meet him, with the palm branches, and hailing him as their Messiah, led him on into the holy city. Here was an instance of a popular excitement. The next instance of excited feeling is found in that melancholy self-confidence of St. Peter contained in the text. When our Savior foretold Peter's trial and fall, Peter at length spake the more vehemently, If I should die with thee, I will not deny thee in any wise. Yet in a little while both the people and the apostle abandoned their Messiah. The ardor of their devotion had run its course. Now it may perhaps appear, as if the circumstance I am pointing out, remarkable as it is, still is one on which it is of little use to dwell in addressing a mixed congregation, on the ground that most men feel too little about religion. And it may be thence argued that the aim of Christian teaching rather should be to rouse them from insensibility than to warn them against excess of religious feeling. I answer that to mistake mere transient emotion or mere good thoughts for obedience is a far commoner deceit than at first sight appears. How many a man is there who, when his conscience upbraids him for neglect of duty, comforts himself with the reflection that he has never treated the subject of religion with open scorn, that he has from time to time had serious thoughts, that on certain solemn occasions he has been affected and awed, that he has at times been moved to earnest prayer to God, that he has had accidentally some serious conversation with a friend. This, I say, is a case of frequent occurrence among men called Christian. Again, there is no further reason for insisting upon this subject. No one, it is plain, can be religious without having his heart in his religion. His affections must be actively engaged in it, and it is the aim of all Christian instruction to promote this. But if so, Doubtless there is great danger lest a perverse use should be made of the affections. In proportion as a religious duty is difficult, so is it open to abuse. For the very reason that I desire to make you earnest in religion, 
must I also warn you against a counterfeit earnestness which often misleads men from the plain path of obedience, and which most men are apt to fall into just on their first awakening to a serious consideration of their duty. It is not enough to bid you to serve Christ in faith, fear, love, and gratitude. Care must be taken that it is the faith, fear, love, and gratitude of a sound mind. That vehement tumult of zeal which St. Peter felt before his trial failed him under it. That open-mouthed admiration of the populace at our Saviour's miracle was suddenly changed to blasphemy. This may happen now as then, and it often happens in a way distressing to the Christian teacher. He finds it is far easier to interest men in the subject of religion, hard though this be, than to rule the spirit which he has excited. His hearers, when their attention is gained, soon begin to think he does not go far enough. Then they seek means which he will not supply, of encouraging and indulging their mere feelings to the neglect of humble practical efforts to serve God. After a time, like the multitude, they suddenly turn round to the world, abjuring Christ altogether, or denying him with Peter, or gradually sinking into a mere form of obedience, while they still think themselves true Christians, and secure of the favor of Almighty God. For these reasons, I think it is as important to warn men against impetuous feelings in religion as to urge them to give their heart to it. I proceed, therefore, to explain more fully what is the connection between strong emotions and sound Christian principle, and how far they are consistent with it. Now that perfect state of mind at which we must aim, and which the Holy Spirit imparts, is a deliberate preference of God's service to everything else, a determined resolution to give up all for Him, and a love for Him, not tumultuous and passionate, but such love as a child bears towards his parents, calm, full, reverent, contemplative, obedient. Here, however, it may be objected that this is not always possible, that we cannot help feeling emotion at times, that even to take the case of parents and children, a man is at certain times thrown out of that quiet affection which he bears towards his father and mother, and is agitated by various feelings. Again, that zeal, for instance, though a Christian virtue, is almost inseparable from ardor and passion. To this I reply, that I am not describing the state of mind to which any one of us has attained, when I say it is altogether calm and meditative, but that which is the perfect state, that which we should aim at. I know it is often impossible, for various reasons, to avoid being agitated and excited, but the question before us is whether we should think highly of violent emotion, whether we should encourage it. Doubtless it is no sin to feel at times passionately on the subject of religion. It is natural in some men, and, under certain circumstances, it is praiseworthy in others. But these are accidents. As a general rule, the more religious men become, the calmer they become. And at all times the religious principle, viewed by itself, is calm, sober, and deliberate. Let us review some of the accidental circumstances I speak of. 1. The natural tempers of men vary very much. Some men have ardent imaginations and strong feelings, and adopt as a matter of course a vehement mode of expressing them. No doubt it is impossible to make all men think and feel alike. Such men, of course, may possess deep-rooted principle. 
All I would maintain is that their ardor does not of itself make their faith deeper and more genuine, that they must not think themselves better than others on account of it, that they must be aware of considering it a proof of their real earnestness, instead of narrowly searching into their conduct for satisfactory fruits of faith. 2. Next, there are besides particular occasions on which excited feeling is natural, and even commendable, but not for its own sake, but on account of the peculiar circumstances under which it occurs. For instance, it is natural for a man to feel a special remorse at his sins when he first begins to think of religion. He ought to feel bitter sorrow and keen repentance. But all such emotion, evidently, is not the highest state of a Christian's mind. It is but the first stirring of grace in him. A sinner, indeed, can do no better, but in proportion as he learns more of the power of true religion, such agitation will wear away. What is this but saying that change of mind is only the inchoate state of a Christian? Who doubts that sinners are bound to repent and turn to God? Yet the angels have no repentance. And who denies their peacefulness of soul to be a higher excellence than ours? The woman who had been a sinner, when she came behind our Lord, wept much, and washed his feet with tears. It was well done in her. She did what she could, and was honored with our Saviour's praise. Yet it is clear this was not a permanent state of mind. It was but the first step in religion, and would doubtless wear away. It was but the accident of a season. Had her faith no deeper root than this emotion, it would soon have come to an end, as Peter's zeal. In like manner, whenever we fall into sin, and how often is this the case, the truer our faith is, the more we shall for the time be distressed, perhaps agitated. No doubt, yet it would be a strange procedure to make much of this disquietude, though it is a bad sign if we do not feel it, according to our mental temperament, yet if we do, what then? It argues no higher Christian excellence. I repeat it, it is but the virtue of a very imperfect state. Bad is the best offering we can offer to God after sinning. On the other hand, the more consistent our habitual obedience, the less we shall be subject to such feelings. 3. And further, the accidents of life will occasionally agitate us, affliction and pain, bad news, though here too the psalmist describes the higher excellence of the mind, that is, the calm confidence of the believer, who will not be afraid of any evil tidings, for his heart standeth fast, and believeth in the Lord. Times of persecution will agitate the mind, Circumstances of special interest in the fortunes of the church will cause anxiety and fear. We see the influence of some of these causes in various parts of St. Paul's epistles. Such emotion, however, is not the essence of true faith, though it accidentally accompanies it. In times of distress, religious men will speak more openly on the subject of religion and lay bare their feelings. At other times they will conceal them. They are neither better nor worse for doing so. Now all this may be illustrated from Scripture. We find the same prayers offered, and the same resolutions expressed by good men, sometimes in a calm way, sometimes with more ardor. How quietly and simply does Augur offer his prayer to God? Two things have I required of thee. Deny me them not before I die. Remove far from me vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. 
feed me with food convenient for me. St. Paul, on the other hand, with greater fervency, because he was in more distressing circumstances, but with not much more acceptableness on that account, in God's sight, says, I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased, and I know how to abound. And so he proceeds. Again, Joshua says, simply but firmly, As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. St. Paul says as firmly, but with more emotion, when his friends besought him to keep away from Jerusalem, What mean ye to weep and to break mine heart? For I am ready not to be bound only, but also to die at Jerusalem for the sake of the Lord Jesus. Observe how calm Job is in his resignation. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And on the other hand, how calmly that same apostle expresses his assurance of salvation at the close of his life, who, during the struggle, was accidentally agitated. I am now ready to be offered. I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. These remarks may suffice to show the relation which excited feelings bear to true religious principle. They are sometimes natural, sometimes suitable, but they are not religion itself. They come and go. They are not to be counted on or encouraged, for, as in St. Peter's case, they may supplant true faith and lead to self-deception. They will gradually lose their place within us as our obedience becomes confirmed, partly because those men are kept in perfect peace and sheltered from all agitated feelings, whose minds are stayed on God, partly because these feelings themselves are fixed into habits by the power of faith, and instead of coming and going and agitating the mind from their suddenness, they are permanently retained so far as there is any good in them, and give a deeper color and a more energetic expression to the Christian character. Now it will be observed that in these remarks I have taken for granted, as not needing proof, that the highest Christian temper is free from all vehement and tumultuous feeling. But if we wish some evidence of this, let us turn to our great pattern, Jesus Christ, and examine what was the character of that perfect holiness which he alone of all men ever displayed. And can we find anywhere such calmness and simplicity as marked his devotion and his obedience? When does he ever speak with fervor or vehemence, or if there be one or two words of his in his mysterious agony and death characterized by an energy which we do not comprehend, and which sinners must silently adore. Still, how conspicuous and undeniable is his composure in the general tenor of his words and conduct. Consider the prayer he gave us, and this is more to the purpose, for the very reason that he has given it as a model for our worship. How plain and unadorned is it! How few are the words of it! How grave and solemn the petitions! What an entire absence of tumult and feverish emotion! Surely our own feelings tell us it could not be otherwise. To suppose it otherwise were an irreverence towards him. At another time, when he is said to have rejoiced in spirit, his thanksgiving is marked with the same undisturbed tranquillity. I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. Again think of his prayer in the garden. He then was in distress of mind beyond our understanding. Something there was, we know not what, which weighed 
heavy upon him. He prayed he might be spared the extreme bitterness of his trial. Yet how subdued and how concise is his petition! Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless not what I will, but what thou wilt. And this is but one instance, though a chief one, of that deep tranquillity of mind which is conspicuous throughout the solemn history of the atonement. Read the thirteenth chapter of St. John, in which he is described as washing his disciples' feet, Peter's in particular. Reflect upon his serious words addressed at several times to Judas, who betrayed him, and his conduct when seized by his enemies, when brought before Pilate, and lastly, when suffering on the cross. When does he set us an example of passionate devotion, of enthusiastic wishes, or of intemperate words? Such is the lesson our Saviour's conduct teaches us. Now let us remind you how diligently we are taught the same by our own church. Christ gave us a prayer to guide us in praying to the Father, and upon this model our own liturgy is strictly formed. You will look in vain in the prayer book for long or vehement prayers, for it is only upon occasions that agitation of mind is right. But there is ever a call upon us for seriousness, gravity, simplicity, deliberate trust, deep-seated humility. Many persons, doubtless, think the church prayers for this very reason, cold and formal. They do not discern their high perfection, and they think they could easily write better prayers. When such opinions are advanced, it is quite sufficient to turn our thoughts to our Saviour's precept and example. It cannot be denied that those who thus speak ought to consider our Lord's prayer defective, and sometimes they are profane enough to think so, and to confess they think so. But I pass this by. Granting for argument's sake his precepts were intentionally defective, as delivered before the Holy Ghost ascended, yet what will they say to his example? Can even the fullest light to the gospel revealed after his resurrection bring us his followers to the remotest resemblance to our Lord's holiness? Yet how calm he was, who was perfect man in his own obedience. To conclude, let us take warning from St. Peter's fall. Let us not promise much. Let us not talk much of ourselves. Let us not be high-minded, nor encourage ourselves in impetuous, bold language and religion. Let us take warning, too, from that fickle multitude who cried, First, Hosanna, then crucify. A miracle startled them into a sudden adoration of their Saviour. Its effect upon them soon died away. And thus the especial mercies of God sometimes excite us for a season. We feel Christ speaking to us through our consciences and hearts, and we fancy He is assuring us we are his true servants, when he is but calling on us to receive him. Let us not be content with saying, Lord, Lord, without doing the thing which he says. The husbandman's son, who said, I go, sir, yet went not to the vineyard, gained nothing by his fair words. One secret act of self-denial one sacrifice of inclination to duty, is worth all the mere good thoughts, warm feelings, passionate prayers, in which idle people indulge themselves. It will give us more comfort on our deathbed to reflect on one deed of self-denying mercy, purity, or humility, than to recollect the shedding of many tears and the recurrence of frequent transports and much spiritual exaltation. These latter feelings come and go. They may or may not accompany hearty obedience, 
they are never tests of it, but good actions are the fruits of faith and assure us that we are Christ's. They comfort us as an evidence of the Spirit working in us. By them we shall be judged at the last day, and though they have no worth in themselves, by reason of that infection of sin which gives its character to everything we do, yet they will be accepted for his sake, who bore the agony in the garden and suffered as a sinner on the cross. End of Sermon 14 Sermon 15 of Parochial and Plain Sermons, Volume 1 by John Henry Newman. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Sermon 15 Religious Faith Rational He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised he was able also to perform. Romans 4, 20 and 21 there are serious men who are in the habit of describing Christian faith as a feeling or a principle such as ordinary persons cannot enter into, a something strange and peculiar in its very nature, different in kind from everything that affects and influences us in matters of this world, and not admitting any illustration from our conduct in them. They consider that, because it is a spiritual gift, and heavenly in its origin, it is therefore altogether superhuman, and that to compare it with any of our natural principles or feelings is to think unworthily of it. And thus they lead others who wish an excuse for their own irreligious lives to speak of Christian faith as extravagant and irrational, as if it were a mere fancy or feeling, which some persons had and others had not, and which accordingly could only and would necessarily be felt by those who were disposed that certain way. Now that the object on which faith fixes our thoughts that the doctrines of Scripture are most marvelous and exceeding in glory, unheard and unthought of elsewhere, is quite true. And it is also true that no mind of man will form itself into a habit of faith without the preventing and assisting influences of divine grace. But it is not at all true that faith itself, that is, trust, is a strange principle of action, and to say that it is irrational is even an absurdity. I mean such a faith as that of Abraham, mentioned in the text, which led him to believe God's word when opposed to his own experience, and it shall now be my endeavor to show this. To hear some men speak, I mean men who scoff at religion, it might be thought we never acted on faith or trust except in religious matters, whereas we are acting on trust every hour of our lives. When faith is said to be a religious principle, it is, I repeat, the things believed, not the act of believing them, which is peculiar to religion. Let us take some examples. It is obvious that we trust to our memory. We do not now witness what we saw yesterday, yet we have no doubt it took place in the way we remember. We recollect clearly the circumstances of morning and afternoon. Our confidence in our memory is so strong that a man might reason with us all day long without persuading us that we slept through the day, or that we returned from a long journey when our memory disposes otherwise. Thus we have faith in our memory. 
Yet what is irrational here? Again, even when we use reasoning, and are convinced of anything by reasoning, what is it but that we trust the general soundness of our reasoning powers? From knowing one thing, we think we can be sure about another, even though we do not see it. Who of us would doubt, on seeing strong shadows on the ground, that the sun was shining out, though our face happened to be turned the other way? Here is faith without sight. But there is nothing against reason here, unless reason can be against itself. And what I wish you particularly to observe is that we continually trust our memory and our reasoning powers in this way, though they often deceive us. This is worth observing, because it is sometimes said that we cannot be certain that our faith in religion is not a mistake. I say our memory and reason often deceive us, yet no one says it is therefore absurd and irrational to continue to trust them, and for this plain reason, because on the whole they are true and faithful witnesses, because it is only at times that they mislead us, so that the chance is that they are right in this case or that, which happens to be before us, and again, because in all practical matters we are obliged to dwell upon not what may be possibly, but what is likely to be. In matters of daily life we have no time for fastidious and perverse fancies about the minute chances of our being deceived. We are obliged to act at once, or we should cease to live. There's a chance, it cannot be denied, that our food today may be poisonous. We cannot be quite certain, but it looks the same and tastes the same, and we have good friends round us, so we do not abstain from it, for all this chance, though it is real. This necessity of acting promptly is our happiness in this world's matters. In the concerns of a future life, alas, we have time for carnal and restless thoughts about possibilities. And this is our trial, and it will be our condemnation, if with the experience of the folly of such idle fancyings about what may be in matters of this life, we yet indulge them as regards the future. If it be said that we sometimes do distrust our reasoning powers, for instance, when they lead us to some unexpected conclusion, or again our memory when another's memory contradicts it, this only shows that there are things which we should be weak or hasty in believing, which is quite true. Doubtless there is such a fault as credulity, or believing too readily, and too much, and this, in religion, we call superstition. But this neither shows that all trust is irrational, nor again that trust is necessarily irrational, which is founded on what is but likely to be, and may be denied without an actual absurdity. Indeed, when we come to examine the subject, it will be found that, strictly speaking, we know little more than we exist, and that there is an unseen power whom we are bound to obey. Beyond this, we must trust. And first our senses, memory, and reasoning powers, then other authorities, so that, in fact, almost all we do, every day of our lives, is on trust, that is, faith. But it may be said that belief in these informants, our senses, and the like, is not what is commonly meant by faith. That to trust our senses and reason is in fact nothing more than to trust ourselves. And though these do sometimes mislead us, yet they are so continually about us and so at command that we can use them to correct each other, so that on the whole 
we gain from these the truth of things quite well enough to act upon that on the other hand it is a very different thing from this to trust another person and that faith in the scripture sense of the word is trusting another and therefore is not proved to be rational by the foregoing illustrations let us then understand faith in this sense of reliance on the words of another as opposed to trust in oneself this is the common meaning of the word i grant as when we contrast it to sight and to reason and yet what i have already said has its use in reminding men who are eager for demonstration in matters of religion that there are difficulties in matters of sense and reasoning also but to proceed as i have proposed it is easy to show that even considering faith as trust in another it is no irrational or strange principle of conduct in the concerns of this life for when we consider the subject attentively how few things there are which we can ascertain for ourselves by our own senses and reason after all what do we know without trusting others we know that we are in a certain state of health in a certain place have been alive for a certain number of years have certain principles and likings have certain persons around us and perhaps have in our lives travelled to certain places at a distance but what do we know more are there not towns we will say within fifty or sixty miles of us which we have never seen and which nevertheless we fully believe to be as we have heard them described to extend our view we know that land stretches in every direction of us a certain number of miles and then there is sea on all sides that we are in an island but who has seen the land all around and has proved for himself that the fact is so what then convinces us of it the report of others this trust this faith in testimony which when religion is concerned then and only then the proud and sinful would fain call irrational and what i have instanced in one set of facts which we believe is equally true of numberless others of almost all of those which we think we know consider how men in the business of life nay all of us confide are obliged to confide in persons we never saw or know but slightly nay in their handwritings which for what we know may be forged if we are to speculate and fancy what may be we act upon our trust in them implicitly because common sense tells us that with proper caution and discretion faith in others is perfectly safe and rational scripture then only bids us act in respect to a future life as we are every day acting at present or again how certain we all are when we think on the subject that we must sooner or later die no one seriously thinks he can escape death and men dispose of their property and arrange their affairs confidently contemplating not indeed the exact time of their death still death is sooner or later to befall them of course they do it would be most irrational in them not to expect it yet observe what proof has any one of us that he shall die because other men die how does he know that has he seen them die he can know nothing of what took place before he was born nor of what happens in other countries how little indeed he knows about it all except that it is a received fact and except that it would in truth be idle to doubt what mankind as a whole witness though each individual has only his proportionate share in the universal testimony 
And further, we constantly believe things even against our own judgment, that is, when we think our informant likely to know more about the matter under consideration than ourselves, which is the precise case in the question of religious faith. And thus from reliance on others, we acquire knowledge of all kinds, and proceed to reason, judge, decide, act, form plans for the future. And in all this, I say, trust is at the bottom, and this the world calls prudence, and rightly, and not to trust and act upon trust imprudence, or, it may be, headstrong folly, or madness. But it is needless to proceed. The world could not go on without trust. The most distressing event w that can happen to a state is, we know, the spreading of a want of confidence between man and man. Distrust, want of faith, breaks the very bonds of human society. Now, then, shall we account it only rational for a man, when he is ignorant, to believe his fellow man, nay, to yield to another's judgment is better than his own, and yet think it against reason, when one, like Abraham, gives ear to the word of God, and sets the promise of God above his own short-sighted expectation? Abraham, it is true, rested in hope beyond hope, in the hope afforded by a divine promise beyond that hope suggested by nature. He had fancied he never should have a son, and God promised him a son. But might he not well address those self-wise persons who neglect to walk in the steps of his faith in the language of just reproof? If we receive the witness of men, he might well urge with the apostle, the witness of God is greater. Therefore he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised he was able also to perform. But it may be objected true, if we knew for certain God had spoken to us, as he did to Abraham, it were then madness indeed to us to disbelieve him. But it is not his voice we hear, but man's speaking in his name. The church tells us that God has revealed to man his will, and the ministers of the church point to a book which they say is holy and contains the words of God. How are we to know whether they speak the truth or not? To believe this, is it according to reason or against it? This objection brings us to a very large and weighty question, though I do not think it is, generally speaking, a very practical one. That is, what are our reasons for believing the Bible came from God? If anyone asks this in a scoffing way, he is not to be answered, for he is profane and exposes himself to the curse pronounced by St. Paul upon the haters of the Lord Jesus. But if a man inquires sincerely, wishing to find the truth, waiting on God humbly, yet perplexed at knowing or witnessing the deeds of scorners and daring blasphemers, and at hearing their vain reasonings, and not knowing what to think or say about them, let him consider the following remarks with which I conclude. Now, first, whatever such profane persons may say about their willingness to believe if they could find reason, however willing they may profess themselves to admit that we daily take things on trust, and that to act on faith is in itself quite a rational procedure. Though they may pretend that they do not quarrel with being required to believe, but say that they do think it hard that better evidence is not given them for believing what they are bid believe undoubtingly, that is, the divine authority of the Bible, 
In spite of all this, depend upon it. In a very great many cases, they do murmur at being required to believe. They do dislike being bound to act without seeing. They do prefer to trust themselves to trusting God, even though it could be plainly proved to them that God was in truth speaking to them. Did they see God? Did he show himself as he will appear at the last day? Still, they would be faithful to their own miserable and wretched selves, and would be practically disloyal to the authority of God. Their conduct shows this. Why otherwise do they so frequently scoff at religious men as if timid and narrow-minded, merely because they fear to sin? Why do they ridicule such conscientious persons as will not swear, or jest indecorously, or live dissolutely? Clearly, it is their very faith itself they ridicule, not their believing on false grounds, but their believing at all. Here they show what it is which rules within them. They do not like the tie of religion. They do not like dependence. To trust another, much more to trust him implicitly, is to acknowledge oneself to be his inferior, and this man's proud nature cannot bear to do. He is apt to think it unmanly, and to be ashamed of it. He promises himself liberty by breaking the chain, as he considers it, which binds him to his Maker and Redeemer. You will say, Why then do such men trust each other if they are so proud? I answer that they cannot help it, and again that while they trust, they are trusted in turn, which puts them on a sort of equality with others. Unless this mutual dependence takes place, it is true, they cannot bear to be bound to trust another, to depend on him. And this is the reason that such men are so given to cause tumults and rebellion in national affairs. They set up some image of freedom in their minds, a freedom from the shackles of dependence, which they think their natural right, and which they aim to gain for themselves, a liberty much like that which Satan aspired after, when he rebelled against God. So let these men profess what they will, about their not finding fault with faith on its own account. They do dislike it. And it is therefore very much to our purpose to accustom our minds to the fact on which I have been insisting that almost everything we do is grounded on mere trust in others. We are from our birth dependent creatures, utterly dependent, dependent immediately on man, and that visible dependence reminds us forcibly of our truer and fuller dependence upon God. Next, I observe that these unbelieving men who use hard words against Scripture condemn themselves out of their own mouth in this way. It is a mistake to suppose that our obedience to God's will is merely founded on our belief in the word of such persons as tell us Scripture came from God. We obey God primarily because we actually feel His presence in our consciences bidding us obey Him. And this, I say, confutes these objectors on their own ground, because the very reason they give for their unbelief is that they trust their own sight and reason because their own more than the words of God's ministers. Now let me ask, if they trust their senses and their reason, why do they not trust their conscience too? Is not conscience their own? Their conscience is as much a part of themselves as their reason is, and it is placed within them by Almighty God in order to balance the influence of sight and reason, and yet they will not attend to it for a plain reason. They love sin. They love to be their own masters, and therefore they will not attend 
to that secret whisper of their hearts which tells them that they are not their own masters and that their sin is hateful and ruinous nothing shows this more plainly than their conduct if ever you appeal to their conscience in favor of your view of the case supposing they are using profane language murmurings or scoffings at religion and supposing a man says to them you know in your heart you should not do so how will they reply they immediately get angry or they attempt to turn what is said into ridicule anything will they do except answer by reasoning no their boasted argumentation then fails them it flies like a coward before the slight stirring of conscience and their passions these are the only champions left for their defense they in effect say we do so because we like it perhaps they even avow this in so many words he feedeth on ashes a deceived heart hath turned him aside that he cannot deliver his soul nor say is there not a lie in my right hand and are such the persons whom any christian can in any degree trust surely faith in them would be of all conceivable confidences the most irrational the most misplaced can we allow ourselves to be perplexed and frightened at the words of those who carry upon them the tokens of their own inconsistency the mark of cain surely not and as that first rebel's mark was set on him lest any finding him should kill him in like manner their presence but reminds us thereby to view them with love though most sorrowfully and to pray earnestly and do our utmost if there is aught we can do that they may be spared the second death to look on them with awe as a land cursed by god the plain of siddim or the ruins of babel but which he for our redeemer's sake is able to renew and fertilize for ourselves let us but obey god's voice in our hearts and i will venture to say we shall have no doubts practically formidable about the truth of scripture find out the man who strictly obeys the law within him and yet is an unbeliever as regards the bible and then it will be time enough to consider all that variety of proof by which the truth of the bible is confirmed to us this is no practical inquiry for us our doubts if we have any will be found to arise after disobedience it is bad company or corrupt books which lead to unbelief it is sin which quenches the holy spirit and if we but obey god strictly in time through his blessing faith will become like sight we shall have no more difficulty in finding what will please god than in moving our limbs or in understanding the conversation of our familiar friends this is the blessedness of confirmed obedience let us aim at attaining it and in whatever proportion we now enjoy it praise and bless god for his unspeakable gift end of sermon fifteen